Hello and welcome to Yahoo Finance's coverage of Berkshire Hathaway's annual meeting live from the CenturyLink Center in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm Andy Serwer here with my co-host Jen Rogers. We're also joined by Miles Udlin, who will be heading into the meeting shortly. We are just about 30 minutes away from Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger taking the stage. Investors and Buffett fans were lined up early here, and we mean early. Wow. Uh, this is what it looked like, though, just around 6 o'clock this morning. That's about an hour before the doors even opened. And then, here's the moment. The doors open, and those <laughs> people make the mad dash to get the best seats. The running of the shareholders, Jen. <laughs> around 7 a.m., Warren Buffett and a gaggle of press took in the sites here in the convention center full of booths from Berkshire associated businesses like Dairy Queen, Brooks Running, and Coca-Cola. So Berkshire released its earnings last night and Miles has been digging into the results. Buffett himself tipped his hat a little bit about some of the big news revealing that uh, he's taken a larger stake mm -hmm. in Apple. What else have we learned? Yeah, we also have a very interesting quarter. Um, so a little bit of a quirk here. The net loss attributable to Berkshire shareholders, $1.1 billion. But the operating profit, which strips out the loss, which is really attributable to that securities portfolio. Wells Fargo is down a lot. Coke shares were down almost 6%. It uh, was $5.3 billion. So Buffett himself was bracing for this rule. He had told shareholders in previous quarters, this is going to make our earnings essentially incomprehensible on a year-to-year -year or quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis. He said that these adjustments, which they're now required to report each quarter, are generally meaningless. This is the language that he used in the 10Q with respect to how you figure out Berkshire's uh, overall value. So I think we'll talk about that a little bit in the meeting, just to sort of let shareholders know exactly what's going on. Here's why we're reporting a loss. And also going forward, I think the quarterly report might be even less you know, sort of incisive for Berkshire shareholders. Mm -hmm. Berkshire Hathaway is big, but not as big as the U.S. government and the tax code. Yeah, no joke. I like it incomprehensible to everybody but you. Everybody but him, I suppose. <laughs> right, that's true. Uh, we also have Yahoo Finance's Julia LaRoe. She's on the floor here in the convention center. Julia already got to walk around the floor today with Warren. What did you guys talk about? That's right, Jen. I did get a question in to the Oracle of Omaha as he made his way around to the different booths. And the question is, when are you going to make that move, make that acquisition with that $100 billion cash pile that you have? What has to happen? And he's said that he's waiting for that phone call. So I asked him, well, what do you want to hear on that phone call? And he said he just wants to hear about a good business. Now, I also asked him about the moat. What is the moat for Berkshire Hathaway? And he says it's the culture, it's the management style. And as you know, he has a very hands-off management style. So if you're looking to be acquired, give Warren Buffett a call. That's what he wants. <laughs> People always talking about what companies will Berkshire buy, you know, Amazon, giant <laughs> private companies, Koch Brothers. I mean, it's all out there. There are a lot of names, and there will definitely be a lot of questions about that, given all the cash that he is sitting with right now. Absolutely. All right, so uh, moving on right now, we've got investors making their way into the arena. Capacity right now for that crowd inside expected to be 17,500. As we said, the line started before dawn here in Omaha, and we were there. Correction. We sent Miles. Miles <laughs> Udlin was there meeting those very first investors in line. Take a look. All right, we are here with the first people in line, sort of. There's a few bullpens, uh, but these guys were here. Mike and Mike, they're in from Long Island. They were here at about 3 o'clock this morning. Guys, good to talk to you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So, um, Mike, you are 20 years old. This yep. is your fifth meeting. Uh, tell me a little bit about why you got here first, why you come to these meetings, and uh, what you hope to get out of them. Uh, really, it's just all about the investment knowledge of Buffett. I mean, it's worth its weight in gold every minute you could listen to it. And it's almost, he's a shining idol on a hill in terms of capitalism and what this country represents. And I think it's just a great event overall. And uh, Mike, Mike Dad, how, uh, how long have you been a shareholder? Uh, I've been a shareholder since 2009. Uh, fortunately enough, uh, I bought it in January 2009 and I haven't looked back ever since. All right, great. And uh, have you guys usually gotten here first? Is this the first time you've come in super early? We, we normally come here around the same time every year, normally get a spot right up front. So what time are you here today? We're here at 3 a.m. And uh, what have you been doing over the last three hours? It's about 6 6.11 right now. Walking around, keeping loose, chilling in my chair, reading the letter a little bit. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, meet a lot of great people. Right. And uh, Mike, if there's one kind of thing that you hope to maybe impart to other fathers out there, other sons that are thinking about coming or haven't come, what, uh, what would you say to them? I would say it's a great experience. You definitely should do it. It's basically Woodstock for capitalists. 
and his great uh, collegiality of the meeting. You meet great people online and so on, and just the investment wisdom. Uh, it's memories that'll last a lifetime. Great, thanks guys so much, and uh, enjoy the meeting today. Will do. I love that, a young Mike, keeping loose. You know what they say about this meeting, it's, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint, so you really, you gotta be flexible. The whole weekend. The whole weekend. Warren Buffett has said that he thinks attendance here at the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting could break the record, could break the record of 42,000, that was set a few years back. What's the trend with attendance been? Well, three years ago when they set that record, that was the 50th anniversary, Jen, of Berkshire Hathaway. So you'd expect a lot of people to come. Attendance was off the following year, 2016. That was the first year we live streamed. Was it our fault? And some people did blame us, said maybe people are staying home and watching us. But actually, attendance has built 16, 17, and now to 2018. And Warren Buffett himself said that he thinks that our live stream has actually increased attendance uh, because of the attention that we're bringing to it. I have to say, of all the years, that I have been here, the line seemed incredibly long this morning, and multi multiple entrances had lines that were wrapping around. Yeah, and Mike and Mike, that was just yeah, awesome. I love yeah, that. They so were you great. were out there. They what, were the first yeah, well, so if, you know, the front of the arena is on 10th Street. That's a north-south street, and I was hearing that for the first time ever, that line actually went all the way to the south and then turned east around the corner. So that was would be the longest line to kind of get in that main entrance. And then also walking around the convention hall yesterday. I mean, it, it was absolutely mobbed. The so, number of stands were just, there were lines to get into the exhibit. Right, like... You were saying oh, fruit, fruit of the loom, yeah, lining up loom. for fruit underwear. Fruit of the loom was my people. favorite. <laughs> fruit of the loom, the line it had to be 100 people long, and it went back two full booths. It went past the shoes, went all the way to the net jet, which itself had a long line because people want to go in, look at the private private jet, sees candy, as we know, always a mob always. scene. Brooks running is always one of the most crowded booths. Uh, but I mean, it took 20 minutes to do one lap of the floor yesterday. And just to be clear, this was a line to get in to Fruit of the Loom, not even to buy anything. It was like a hot club. People yeah, are well, lined I, I got to say. I got some great deals in there. That's all I'll say. So it's interesting, too. So how does the math work? You know, there's 40,000 people here, but only 17.5 can fit Wait. into the arena. The overflow is over here, shopping still in the convention center. Then there are mm -hmm. other rooms um, here and across the street at the Hilton where people can view this, um, you know, here yeah. watching on Yahoo Finance. And so, you know, there's another 20,000 people spread about. Mm -hmm. So where do all these people come from? I mean, I've met people from all over the world. We wanted to find out a way that we could see this information in one place. Julia LaRoche now has moved to just below our stage with more on where everyone comes from. Julia. That's right. You know, some people describe this as the Woodstock of capitalism. Others describe it as a pilgrimage, a journey that you make once in a lifetime, sometimes many times in a lifetime. And so we have folks coming from all over the world, and we want you to come tell us where you're coming from, but we have a lot of folks coming in from Europe. I see Rome, I see Spain, we have France, Germany, Norway, and then we have, again, a ton of people across the United States coming into Omaha. We have South America, we have Venezuela here, Colombia, and then in the Caribbean. I also see Bermuda on our map, and as you know, we have a lot of folks coming in from China. We had a big China event hosted by Yahoo Finance. So this is a global event here in Omaha, Nebraska. All right, thank you so much, Julia. Uh, who, I, I've met a bunch of people from China, of course. Uh, yep. at the door that I walked in through, the very first people were from China and got here at midnight. What about you guys? Where's the furthest you've had somebody from? Well, that's kind of the other side of the globe. Yeah, I, mean, I don't think I'm going to get further than China. And I've <laughs> also met a number of people from there. So there's the thousands the of people moon. from China. I mean, it's not just 20 or 30 people. Yeah. Yeah. It's thousands of people from China. I mean, there are people from India. There are people from Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. there, there are people from South America. That can be a long trip as well, of course. So mm -hmm. it really is a global phenomenon. Yeah, and then uh, a couple guys at the hotel this morning, they were in from Ireland when we were walking around in line. Uh, we saw a lot of people actually from the U.S. everywhere. Florida, Seattle, Philadelphia, New Jersey. Uh, someone was from Chicago. So. So, um, you know, exotic points, Long Island. We had Mike, Mike, and, Mike and Mike from Long, from Long Island. Island. We Mike traveled all this way from New York to talk to two guys from Long Island. Exactly. That's the way it so should funny. be. Isn't that how it always is? You, it you feels go, like go that so way, far right? and then you find somebody from just around the corner. There it is. Uh, so, you guys. We have so much more coming. We are just about you know, 20 minutes away from our exclusive live stream of the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. We're all waiting for Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger to take the stage. Andy, though, already got a chance to sit down with Warren Buffett. I did, and it's a great interview. I'd like to think, and you know, a lot of a lot of ground we covered. We, we think it's a great interview. Oh, it's good. kind of a tradition that you guys get to sit down now. Yeah, and you know, it's there's just a wide range of conversation. I mean, Warren Buffett is the kind of person that you literally can talk to him about anything under the sun, and he has just an insightful take on it. And I think that's 
you know, the main reason for the draw here is that people just, and they ask him questions about, you know, your kids and life and jobs and working and investing, of course. So you had about 30 minutes with him. Right. That you guys sat down and talked. You covered a really a wide range of topics with him. Uh, everything from the Trump tax cuts to China and right. even the Me Too movement. We're going to take a listen. You've praised uh, the president's tax cut, calling it a wind at uh, Amer the American economy's back, I guess. More no, I have, said, I, mm -hmm. I have said that it, it is a wind, a tax bill that was targeted to, in a big way to help corporations. So it helps Berkshire's million shareholders. It isn't what I would have done if I was going to have a tax cut. But so as an individual, I do not agree with the philosophy that led to it. But as a steward at Berkshire Hathaway, I have to tell you that it does our shareholders a lot of good. I see. I was Because I was going to ask you, I mean, there must be a cost to this. Is there? There's always a cost. Right. I mean, <laughs> and, and it sort of suggests that the savings from the government then, all that money was maybe misspent by the government. I mean, what is there a cost, a downside to the tax cut? Well, there's always, I mean, let's just say, that if, you, if you take taxes to zero for everyone yeah. in the country, I, I, you would be issuing a lot of bonds. Uh, uh, the, uh, but there's, you can't ever do just one thing in economics. If, I mean, you probably can't in physics either. There's a butterfly effect. But in economics, you always have to say, and then what? And uh, if you give a large break to one group, it's not free. <laughs> if I were going to cut the revenues of the United States, I would have, I would have helped a different group of people. Uh, uh, but as I say, it, it is very helpful to Berkshire. Uh, it's not that we were non-competitive before, but our shareholders are better off. Don Harding, one of our uh, readers, uh, viewers, uh, asked, so have you increased salaries and benefits uh, for Berkshire employees like some other companies have done in the wake of the announcement about Yeah, taxes? some of our portfolio companies have done that, but, but uh, we're not paying dividends, we're not repurchasing shares, we're investing, and we'll, we'll use the money for investment. Uh, I wonder, Warren, what you think of President Trump's tweets, particularly about the stock market. And one of our readers asks, uh, Yuan Yi Chin from San Mateo, how Warren Buffett would rate President Trump? Well, well I'm not going to rate the presidents, but I would say that communication is enormously important for a president. Going back to Roosevelt, in the 1930s, every family in the country was sort of huddled around his radio. I mean, you, if, if, if you had the the big networks, you could, you were talking to everybody. And now it's much more diffused, and obviously uh, President Trump feels that he does not like it filtered through the traditional news media, so he's, he's going to do it directly. I believe communication is enormously important for a CEO, and I like to talk to our shareholders directly. If I were frustrated with my ability to talk to my uh, the people I'm responsible for, I would try to figure out a way to do it directly, and obviously I, the president feels that way. So can we talk a little bit about the health care initiative? Have, have you told the story about how that came about? Did Jamie call you up on a conference call with Jeff? H how did it happen? I think probably, you know, I, I can't answer it uh, with 100% precision, but mm -hmm. I, uh, my impression is that it, it came about because there's a fellow quite young that works for us, uh, Todd Combs, is also on J.P. Morgan's board, and and Todd and I have talked a lot about health care, and, and I think Todd developed some ideas about how something like this might work, and I think he, he's the one that actually talked to Jamie. And is this really just for these three companies, or is it going to be a model for the rest of the health care system? What's the point? I, I hope if we can figure out a way to have better care at lower cost and stem the constant rise as a percentage of GDP, I hope the, every company in the United States <laughs> steals the idea from us. And, and just to also want to touch on cryptocurrencies, I, I know that you've had some uh, negative feelings about them, but now Wall Street institutions seem to be dipping their toes in, and I wonder, A, if you change your mind at all, and B, the biggest, one of the biggest mysteries in America, what did you tell Katy Perry? about <laughs> well, cryptocurrencies. That's between me and Katie. I guess so, because it said that you guys talked about cryptocurrencies, but none of us know what you guys said. Well, that's just we between did. you two? We did. Okay. But uh, I will answer your question about okay. about Good. it. But there's two kinds of, of items that people buy and think they're investing. One really is investing and the other isn't. If you buy something, a farm, an apartment house, or an interest in a business, and look to the asset itself 
to determine whether you've done something, what the farm produces, what, what the business earns and so on. Uh, you don't really care whether the stock market's open. You can do that on a private basis. In fact, you do it on a private basis if you buy a farm or apartment house generally. And it's a perfectly satisfactory investment. You look at the investment itself to deliver the return to you. Now, if you buy something uh, like uh, Bitcoin or, or some, some cryptocurrency, you don't really, you don't have anything that's producing anything. You're just hoping the next guy pays more. And the next, and you only feel you'll find the next guy to pay more if he thinks he's going to find somebody that, that's going to pay the more. Now, if you ban trading in farms, you could still buy farms and have a perfectly decent investment. If you ban trading in, in apartment houses or even in equities, if you ban trading in Berkshire Hathaway for the next five years, our investors would do fine, you know, over time. And, but if you ban trading in tulip bulbs, you know, or if you ban trading in, in some Bitcoin, which nobody knows exactly what it is, uh, people would say, well, why in the world would I buy it? Yeah. And you aren't investing when you do that. You're speculating. There's nothing wrong with it. If you want to gamble, somebody else will come along and pay you more money tomorrow. That's one kind of game. That is not investing. Interesting. Um, I want to ask you some questions for the Chinese audience. Um, first of all, can you say ni hao to them? <laughs> ni hao. All right. Uh, how much do you think the Chinese economy and markets will ultimately become like the United States? How much convergence do you think there will be? I, I really don't know the answer to mm -hmm. that. I, what I do know is they have found the secret sauce for themselves, just like we found the secret sauce a couple of centuries ago. And so they have had an economy in the last 60 years or thereabouts. They have unleashed the potential of their citizenry. And where for really centuries, they did not progress that much economically for overwhelming portion of their population. What they've done in the last 50 or 60 years is a total economic miracle. I never would have thought it could have happened. But the truth is, they're as smart as we are, they work as hard as we are, and, and, and they can have a growth in the economy from a lower base that will exceed ours percentage-wise for a long time. And I mean, they're, they're destined for a, a fine economic future just like we are. Shifting gears, Warren, I want to ask you about women in the workplace and the Me Too movement. What role can men play to advance women in their careers in business and in the economy? Well, you know, I had and have two sisters that are absolutely smart as I am and, and, and better personalities and <laughs> you could like them better. <laughs> then, you know, they were born around my time of 1930 and, and uh, they were told uh, marry early and marry well. You know, mm -hmm. that was the unseen message. I mean, nobody ever said it that way. But uh, uh, so I have seen half of the United States' talent basically put off to the side. And it's one of the things that makes me optimistic about America is when I look at what we accomplished using half our talent for a couple of centuries, and now I think of doubling the talent that uh, that effectively employed, or at least has the chance to be. Uh, uh, it makes me very optimistic about this country. And good managers are scarce. You know, talent is, is, is always rare, and you better use every bit of it that you can <laughs> find it, certainly the way I've felt personally all my life. Skip from Baltimore wants to know if you collect Social Security. I collect it. Uh, and my wife is now eligible, and she's supposed to be collecting, but she hasn't gotten her check yet. But, but we'll, uh, we'll see what <laughs> she should be getting here pretty soon. Tasia from Columbus, Ohio asks, plenty of time left, Warren, but got to ask you, what do you want to be remembered for? As a teacher, yeah. Uh, that would be very flattering if I, I would feel if that was on my tombstone, because I, I, I benefited from terrifically from teachers, not all teachers who were employed as teachers, but teachings of all kinds. But uh, uh, the people spending their time to pass along what they have learned. So a teacher, not a great investor. Yeah, well, uh, I don't do anything in investing that, <laughs> that, that that's complicated. I've just been at it a long time. I mean, just look at it. If I just put that $114 <laughs> in the S&P, I'd have 400000 now. <laughs> well, I think there's a little more to it than that. Uh, Scott from Papillion, Nebraska says, how do you tell the difference between reasonable and unreasonable fear? So in other words, the stock's down. Maybe it should be down. Or a stock's down, maybe it shouldn't be down. 
Well, you just keep looking at the facts. I mean, you're, you're looking at a business. That's the important thing. You, know, you don't look at a stock chart. I looked at stock charts for years. I used to have a lot of fun doing that. I was kind of groping around for all the philosophy. You look at the business. I mean, how do you decide? If you own a half interest with, with you, some buddy of yours in a McDonald's store, how do you decide you know, whether it's a successful investment? Well, if, if the snow's two feet out and there's no business today, do you, do you say, well, I made a terrible deal? No, you look at how it's performing as a business over time, how it's doing versus the competition. You know. All right, Warren Buffett, thank you very much for all of your time. Great talking to you. Okay, thanks for having me. It's amazing how long you can talk to him and, and still have more questions. There's more to come today. Yeah, exactly. And that's because he has this wisdom that people really seem to gravitate towards. And I'll tell you, there is a lot more to that interview. We're going to put the whole thing up after this weekend. You can watch that. But one of the most popular parts, because we did a piece on it, mm -hmm. was how you could have made essentially $400,000 in the stock market. And he tells the story of investing $114 in the market in 1942 when he was an 11 year old kid. And if you had just left it there and let it compound, not even put any more money in, it would be worth $400,000. What is that, 76 years later? Now you may not want to wait that long, but say you just wait 50 years and also say you're putting money in every month. It's just, it's just amazing how many people don't do that and they should. I'd wait. What stood yeah. out to you? Well, I mean, of course, he mentioned Bitcoin, and I'm sure he will get questions on that today. Probably not from the analysts or the journalists, but likely from shareholders. We know he takes a majority of those questions, especially in the afternoon, from shareholders. And I thought it was very interesting, especially in light of this morning's results from Berkshire Hathaway, where it seemed disappointing because of this accounting change. But the point is, you know, the operating profits are good. There's a real underlying business if you're buying Berkshire Hathaway. What you think of the business is your own decision. But with Bitcoin, I mean, he made the point pretty simply. You're hoping someone else pays more. And Dan Rob Roberts had broken out that post earlier. A lot of people had read that. I'm sure that a lot of people didn't like his response to that, but it's been a pretty common refrain. I mean, he hasn't said a lot of positive things about Bitcoin in the past, but I thought that was a very measured and simple way to lay it out, that you think this thing is worth this price and hoping that someone will buy it at a higher price, but there's no underlying business or cash flow uh, impacting the value of Bitcoin. Yeah, he's a very optimistic guy, but on Bitcoin, not so much. Uh, even this morning telling CNBC it's rat poison squared. See, that's more oh. inflammatory. He's a good quote. And you know, it also speaks to this whole point. You know, one of the most important metrics for him is book value. Yeah. And you know what the book value of Bitcoin yeah. is? No. Zip to de doo yeah. right? I mean, no book. Come on. No, right? no book. Uh, we are less than 15 minutes away from the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. We will get you to it as soon as it begins. Warren and Charlie will take their lunch break after that. And don't click away when they go away because we'll be back here, right here with the halftime show we've got a packed A-list list of investors. Uh, we've got investor and author and Buffett watcher Whitney Tilson, uh, also Berkshire Hathaway director Ron Olson. And coming up a little later we've got entrepreneur, actress and model Kathy Ireland, a fixture here at the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting, as well as actress and producer Glenn Close. Action packed. But right now Julia LaRoche has another guest from the floor. Julia. That, that's right, Jen. I'm here at Duracell. You might have seen this exhibit. It's one of the bigger exhibits, and I'm with Duracell's Shane Grady. Shane, thank you so much for joining us. And tell us what this exhibit is. Definitely, yeah. This is the uh, Duracell Power Forward program, which is actually a disaster response program, where we come in within 24 hours is our goal of any major disaster that causes a large power outage. And we come in to help people from a power standpoint. Can you show us more of the truck back here? Yeah, definitely. In this truck, this truck and all of our trucks carries 3,000 pounds of batteries or more. Yeah, we have AA, AAA, Cs, Ds, 9 volts. We also carry hearing aid batteries. You know, these batteries, of course, are for flashlights and radios, but it really goes well beyond that into home health aids like daily dialysis machines, ventilators, kids' toys, you know, anything to keep everyone sane and, and calm and try to give them a normal life. And since 2011, you've made 48 deployments. Tell us about some of the recent deployments that you made last year. We saw a lot of hurricanes last year. What did you experience? We definitely did. You know, we spent two weeks in uh, Hurricane Harvey with two of our trucks, uh, four, and then immediately went over to Hurricane Irma into Florida with four trucks, and then Irma, I'm sorry, and then Maria over in Puerto Rico was 40 days, which is quite a long deployment for us, and those people were going through so much. Yeah. Can you talk to us a bit more about the work that you all have done in Puerto Rico? We kept on hearing about the loss of power there. What did you experience during your time in Puerto Rico? You know, those people were going through so much, the entire island, to, to think that 3.4 million people were without power for so long. Um, they were so grateful of our, our attendance and uh, our, our efforts in coming in to help out. It was, it was huge. So we flew over two trucks, ended up giving out 100 tons of batteries. 
And why, why did you all recognize that you, there was a need to do this? Well, you know, during a disaster, there's so many people who give water, so many people donate food, and a lot of people give clothing. But during that whole span, um, the, you know, the power was still out. And it seemed like, you know, Duracell, we step up. We were already making short-term reliable power. And um, let's just come in and help out with the product we're already making. Well, great work. Jen, back to you all. Oh, okay. All right, so it's interesting, you know, the Duracell thing, because yeah. in China, Jen, you discovered that his likeness, Warren Buffett's likeness, is on Duracell battery packages, um, and it's used to sell them, of course. Yeah, I mean, he is a huge celebrity in China. We've seen him on Coke cans before, but I had no idea that he was actually used to sell batteries as well. And they don't even need his name. Right. They can just it's show just a picture. His image. And Charlie Munger, too, apparently he's on buses all over, probably advertising BYD, their, you know, the electric car company they've invested in. And another guest told us that Buffett's likeness, you know, you, it's not just Beijing and Shanghai. You can go to the far reaches of Western China and you'll see his picture. So in a way, his celebrity um, is even greater in China than it is here in the United States because his likeness is not used here in the United States, which is, I think is an interesting point. And it's pretty big here yes. as well, <laughs> maybe even bigger there. All right, one person we're keeping very busy today is uh, Julia LaRoche running around with another guest from the floor. Julia. All right, BYD is the world's largest manufacturer of electric vehicles, and it's also Warren Buffett's biggest China investment. We're joined by Stella Lee, the president of BYD Motors. Stella, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Nice meeting you here. And what has it been like having Berkshire and Buffett as the biggest investor? I think it's amazing. They love BYD. They love BYD management. And then uh, also give us a very strong support. Always tell us we need to look for long-term success. Don't look for the short term. So each time our business is up, down, but uh, they always stand out saying, we support you. Continue doing whatever you are doing. Yeah, don't, don't look for short-term play. So I think it's a really big honor to get them as an investor and especially as a, a greatest supporter to us. Now you've been heading up the expansion efforts in North America. How is that going and where are you seeing opportunities? Yeah, I think we're doing very well. We first, in 2013, we bought the facility. Then in 2014, we start with 30 employees. And now after four years, we have more than 900 people. And then we just uh, two months ago signed an agreement with a smart union, become really well connected with the uh, local community. So that's only the first baby step for our expansion here. So in the, I think we will continue really pushing forward, changing the bus industry to set up target, really help industry to be 100% zero emission in next five to 10 years. And then at the same time, we introduce our electric trucks here. It's including refuse trucks and also energy rich trucks used at the port and also electric forklift. So we continue brought the whole range of the fleets to US to really push in the industry and really try to for our uh, working hard to uh, for our missions changing the world to give the whole community a better cleaner like environment well, we know BYD is very well known in China, and you do have the buses, as you mentioned. That's what you're best known for, and you've been expanding in California. Where else in the U.S. can we find some of the BYD electric vehicle buses? Yeah, one thing I want to remind you, I already continued three years. BYD is the world largest consumer EV car company in the world. Just the difference, our majority market is in China, and so far the market is the biggest market is in China. So. We still want to focus on Chinese market to increase the sales volume and then maybe working some target to someday to achieve one million electric cars. And then, then our expansion is like a very selectively in some country, not to go to every other country. We, we, we didn't have a plan to come to U.S. yet. And how about the passenger car? I'm curious about the opportunity in the U.S. because, again, you're known for the buses. Are you going to bring, be bringing electric vehicle passenger cars, especially when we start seeing Ford, you know, getting rid of some of those cars in their fleet and focusing more on SUVs and trucks? Is this an opportunity for you all? 
Yes, maybe some days. And also this time, like in April, just uh, two weeks ago, uh, like uh, there's Beijing Auto Show, BYD, first time unveiling our concept car for EV. It's a track a lot of attention. I think it's a very best, uh, very sexy, stylish design. So it's, uh, this was the contribution came from our like a chief designer, like a Wolfgang Eggers uh, result. So he continued brought like a global uh, talent designer join BYD and we will continue to introduce very attractive uh, like a EV from the design and to the market. Plus BYD first time introduced what we call the D-Link, this kind of technology. So you're sitting in the car, then our like a uh, instrument central is more like a, is a big large phone, iPhone. You can even rotating this uh, this pad to like a play any uh, old app you have. So our cars become more intelligent now. So we're talking about uh, the, a lot of internet company invest for passenger car with a stylish design with all the high tech. But the BYD is also leading the curve as an auto manufacturer. We make a very sexy stylish design, plus make our car is more intelligent and uh, will feature all the like, uh, smart function you have in the phone into the car. So that's also uh, attract a lot of attention. All right, Stella Lee, president of BYD Motors, thank you so much, and back to you guys. Thanks so much, Julia. So we're getting close, yep. getting close, just about five minutes until the meeting really gets underway. And for those of you unfamiliar with how things work here at the meeting, right now, investors are in the arena and they're being treated to a short film that the company puts together every year that is full of celebrity cameos and a lot of funny moments. Yeah, we can't show you the whole thing, but we do have just a little bit to give you some flavor. And this is really the first time any part of the annual meeting video has been allowed to be seen outside the arena. And the reason why is because a lot of celebrities uh, and Hollywood movie stars are in this and they don't want to, you know, they're doing it just for a private screening, essentially. Right. And they don't want it to get out on the internet. So let me explain what's going on here. And Warren Buffett really wanted everyone here watching the stream to see this. It's Charlie Munger attempting to open up <laughs> a box of C's peanut brittle. And he's getting more and more anxious here and frustrated because Lord knows you want to get to that peanut brittle. And what's going to happen, and the reason why it's important for you to see this is because what's going to happen is when Charlie and Warren walk out onto the uh, stage of the arena, Warren's going to give him some peanut brittle and probably the whole arena will erupt in applause. So it's sort of an inside joke and we're, we're setting it up for you so you understand what the inside joke is here. If, if you follow that. Yeah, you all get to be part of this uh, with us. Uh, it is hard to open these. You need a knife <laughs> to open a box of C's peanut brittle, full stop. And Lord knows I've opened up a lot of those boxes. And hopefully we'll have a few when we get back to New York next week. Yeah, well, it's right over there. Right We're going to buy there. some, Miles. Yeah. A lot of C's candy. I don't know who's responsible. I still owe you a birthday present from <laughs> yesterday. I'll take, I'll take a box of peanut brittle. Right? Oh, yeah, it was Miles' you got birthday. Him a I, did. I did. I got him a little <laughs> golf diary from right. Warsheim's. I owe him some peanut brittle. Uh, so now now you're in on the joke, so when they come out, that's what we are going to be uh, expecting a little reveal of. There's a lot of eating at this event, if you don't they know. They eat that peanut brittle on they stage the, the whole time. They eat the peanut brittle, they're drinking soda. Uh, it's not the healthiest diet ever. So after, when they come out, they get questions. And the first question is a big deal, right? Yes, it's always asked by uh, Carol Loomis, who is a very senior journalist from Fortune Magazine. I worked with her for decades, an old friend of Warren Buffett's. She edits the shareholder letter, and she gets the honor of asking the first question. And the interesting thing is, Carol takes it upon herself to ask the most salient, difficult, hard, tough question. She really works it and thinks about it. So What's I want to ask be? you guys, Miles, what do you think Carol Loomis, and she won't tell us what it is. Right. Hmm. What do you think Carol Loomis' first question is going to so be? So I think what she'll do is I think she will dredge up an old quote from Warren Buffett about Apple, why he didn't like the company, why he would never buy it. I think she'll recite it to him and then ask, well, Warren, what happened? You now own over 200 million <laughs> shares of the company. You own 5% of the world's largest company. It's the biggest stock holding in Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio. And she'll say, 
What the hell? Are you a hypocrite? Right. Right. All right, I like the Apple idea. It's uh, definitely top of mind. I don't know. I feel like she's going to be a little bit less like what happened yesterday. I feel like GE, which a lot of people mm -hmm. were talking about in the line as well. So many people think that GE has been just beaten down. Like, look at the stock price, and Warren could be the savior to come in here for it. I think that could be an interesting way to go. All right, my pick is Wells Fargo. And you know, how much longer can you own this dead horse or this company that's just been besieged by regulators, shareholders, and you know, he stood by the company and withstood a lot of criticism already. And I think that that is going to be Carol Lewis's Good first one. question. And you know what, if you go back, I think the most formative moment in Berkshire's history, certainly in Warren Buffett's public history, was his episode with Solomon Brothers back right. in the early 90s. And I think what happened at Wells Fargo is more direct to consumers. People understand why that was bad much more than what happened at Solomon. Much more consumer facing. And it's so interesting that you say that, Miles, because he said, I'm never doing that again. Right. And here you, here you kind of are. I mean, in a way it's inevitable if you take big steps stocks uh, like that, that mm -hmm. you're going to, you know, at some point, you know, have a problem. Yeah. Uh, we have less than a minute to go. Uh, the movie is ending up there. Andy, uh, this is a reflection of America in some point here. It really is. I mean, if you look around at all these companies, it is an amazing cross section, industrial, consumer, um, you know, things that you wear, things that you eat, yep. transportation. It, it is a slice of America. It's a cross section that reflects our economy. But it's Warren Buffett's take on the best of America. Now, you may not agree with it. You may say, Coca-Cola, that's sugar water. But, you know, it's a treat. It's iconic. It sells really well. And so, you know, he doesn't buy companies that don't perform well. Well, he tries not to in any event. <laughs> exactly. And so it's really interesting to consider this whole convention center here um, Warren Buffett's take on the best of America. And also the people, actually. Yep. It's a really interesting, diverse group. Almost like it's a cross-section of the world. We had Julia LaRoche at the map there. Yep. And uh, it's a lot of different people as well. It's not a cookie-cutter set, Yeah, I mean, you, you see might think. bankers walking next to farmers, walking next to ranchers, walking next to people from China, old people, young people. I'm seeing more and more kids. You mentioned yeah. that, Jen, yeah. that people are bringing their children, not typically young children, but teenagers who maybe are sort of interested in Apple and investing, and they kind of see that and, you know, have heard about this event, and it's, it's kind of fun. And that goes to Warren Buffett, not as an investor, but as a teacher, and the whole wisdom of what we love to get from the letters, and frankly, with the Q&A here today, really revealing his thoughts on not just money, but so much more. Uh, you really are in for a real treat if you sit around and listen to this. And you know, Warren Buffett has said that if he can be remembered for anything, it would be as a teacher. And he loves bringing groups of students to Omaha and talking to them a little bit, but mostly answering questions and hearing what's on their minds. And that's a very important part of what's going uh, on Right here. now we are uh, looking at uh, pictures from inside the arena, but that was just a, a dark shot there. Uh, we have the uh, Berkshire Hathaway uh, name up. That means that we are getting very close to Charlie it's Munger like and Warren Buffett <laughs> it entering. It is like a rocket launch. There's I can't wait for the countdown, three, right? two, well, one they, they to They'll take happen. their time. I mean, Charlie Munger, you're not going to hurry Charlie out right. there. Charlie will go out there and take his sweet time <laughs> and, you know, he's yeah. going to be ready when he's ready. And of course, they've got to get the peanut brittle and the cherry Well, we know how there. long that takes to open. There right. they are. We're going to turn it over to the annual meeting, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. See you back soon. Good morning. I'm, uh, I'm Warren, he's Charlie. Charlie does uh, most things better than I do, but... Uh... <laughs> 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 now, this one's a little tough. <laughs> Charlie, maybe you can chew on that a while. Okay. <laughs> At the formal um, meeting that uh, will begin at 345, we will elect uh, 14 directors. Charlie and I are 
two of them, and I would like to uh, introduce the uh, other 12. Uh, I'll do it in alphabetical order. If they will stand as I announce their name, withhold your applause. May be hard to do, but give it your best. And when we get all through, then you can let loose. But uh, we'll do this alphabetically, beginning with Greg Abel, if you'll stand and stay standing, Howard Buffett, Steve Burke, Sue Decker, Bill Gates, Sandy Gottesman, Charlotte Guyman, Ajit Jain, Tom Murphy, Ron Olson, Walter Scott, and Merrill Whitmer. Um, this morning, we posted uh, both our earnings and our 10Q, and if we can put up slide one, uh, you can take a look at uh, what was reported. And as I warned you in the annual report, a new accounting rule was introduced uh, at the beginning of this year, and it, it provides that our equity securities, uh, whether we sell them or not, are marked to market every day. So we can have a gain or loss of a couple billion dollars in our equity securities portfolio. And that day, according to the accounting principles now in effect, which are a change, um, uh, will be recorded as making a couple billion dollars that day or losing a couple billion. And I told you that would produce some very unusual effects from quarter to quarter. And it further explains why I like to release our earnings early Saturday morning, and as well as the 10Q, to give people a chance to read through uh, the explanation. Because if you just were handed this with a TV monitor, you know, at 3.30 in the afternoon or whatever it might be, uh, you would report the net earnings figure, under, understandably, uh, very quickly, and and it really is not representative of uh, what, what's going on in the business at all. So, if you look at the figure of operating earnings, which is what we look at, we actually uh, earned a record amount for any quarter we've ever had, and that includes no realized gains or losses on on securities or on. Uh, the few remaining derivatives we have. Um, uh, you might leave that slide up there just uh, a little longer. Maybe there's a... Uh, the uh, uh, insurance underwriting, uh, GEICO had uh, a quite a good-sized turnaround in, uh, in profitability and, uh, and a good gain, although not as big a gain as last year, which was a record in terms of policies in force. Uh, and really throughout most of our businesses, and the details are on the 10Q, which is up on, the, uh, on our website now. And as you can see, and, uh, the railroad was up significantly, and, and uh, uh, we had most of our businesses tended to be up. Now, we were aided in that in a material way by the reduction in the federal income tax rate uh, from 35 percent to 21 percent. Our businesses were up significantly on a pre-tax basis, but, but the gain was further uh, enhanced by the, uh, by the change in the income tax rate. Uh, uh, so that, uh, that pretty well sums up the first quarter. We'll probably get some, may well get some questions on it when we get into the question and answer uh, uh, section. Um, the, uh, the questions will be, Getting, we've got the press over here, and, and, and we have the analysts on my left, and of course we have uh, our partners out in front of me, and we will rotate among you. And the questions we get as we uh, go for the next six hours or so uh, will understandably relate 
to a lot of current events. You know, you will, you know, we may get asked, and we don't know the questions, but we may get asked, you know, about Fed policy or whether we're seeing any inflation or whether business is speeding up or down or, or uh, the threats we may face competitively in our businesses as we go along. And you, anything goes on the questions, except we won't tell you what we're buying or selling. Uh, but uh, it really uh, can be a question sometimes of confusing the, the forest with the trees. And I would like to just spend just a couple of minutes uh, giving you a little perspective uh, on how you might think about, about uh, investments as opposed to the uh, uh, tendency to focus on what's happening today or even this minute as you go through. And to help me in doing that, I'd like to go back through a little personal history. And, uh, and we will start. I have here, <clears throat> I have here a New York Times of March 12th, 1942. Um, I'm a little behind on my reading. Um, the, um, <clears throat> and if you go back to that time, <clears throat> It, uh, it was about, what, just about three months uh, since we got involved in a war which uh, we were losing at that point. Uh, the newspaper headlines were filled with bad news from the Pacific, and I've taken just a couple of the headlines from the days preceding March 11th, which I'll explain is kind of a momentous day for me. And so you can see these headlines. Uh, we've got slide two up there, I believe. Uh, and uh, we were in trouble, big trouble, in the Pacific. Uh, it was only going to be a couple months later that the Philippines fell, but here we were getting bad news. We might go to slide three for March 9th. Uh, uh, I hope you can read the headlines anyway. The price of the paper is three cents, incidentally. Um, the, uh, and uh, uh, let's see, we've got March 10th up there, a slide. I'm, I, when I get to where there's advanced technology of slides, it's, uh, I want to make sure I'm showing you the same thing that I'm seeing in front of me. Uh, so anyway, on March 10th, uh, when again, the news was bad. Full clearing path to Australia, and it was like it, uh, uh, the stock market had been reflecting this, and I'd been watching a stock uh, called City Service Preferred Stock which had sold at $84 the previous year. It had sold at $55 the year before, early in, the, in January, two months earlier. And now it was down to $40 on March 10th. So that night, despite these headlines, I said to my dad, I said, I think I'd like to pull the trigger. And uh, I'd like you to, to uh, buy me three, three shares of City Service Preferred the next day. And that was all I had. I mean, that was my capital accumulated uh, uh, over the previous five years or thereabouts. And so my dad, the next morning, um, bought three shares. Well, let's take a look at what happened the next day. Let's go to the next slide, please. And uh, it was not a good day. Uh, uh, the stock market, the Dow Jones Industrials broke 100 on the downside. Now, they were down 2.28%, as you see, but that was the equivalent of about a 500-point drop now. So I'm in school wondering what is going on, of course. Uh, incidentally, you'll see on the left side of the chart, 
the New York Times put the Dow Jones Industrial Average below all the averages they calculated. They, they had their own averages, which have since disappeared, but the Dow Jones has continued. So the next day, uh, uh, we can go to the next slide, and you will see what happened. The stock that was at 39, my dad bought my stock right away in the morning, because I'd asked him to, my three shares. And uh, so I paid the high for the day, that 38 and a quarter. Uh, was my tick, which is the high for day. And by the end of the day, it was down to 37, uh, which was really kind of characteristic of my timing in stocks that was going to appear in future years. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, it was on the, what was then called the New York Curb Exchange, then became the American Stock Exchange. Uh, but things, even though the war until the Battle of Midway looked very bad. And uh, if you'll turn to the next slide, please, you'll see that uh, the stock did rather well. I, you can see where I bought it, 38 and a quarter. And then the stock went on actually to eventually be called by the city service company for over $200 a share. But this is not a happy story, because if you go to the next page, you will see that I, <laughs> well, as they always say, it seemed like a good idea at the time. You know, <laughs> uh, so I sold, I made $5 on it. It was, it was again, typical of <laughs> the behavior. But uh, when you watch it go down to 27, uh, you know, it looked pretty good to get that profit. Well, what's the point of all this? Well, we can leave behind the city service story. And uh, I would like you to, again, imagine yourself back on March 11th of 1942. And as I say, things were looking bad in the European theater as well as what was going on in, in the Pacific. But everybody in this country knew uh, America was going to win the war. I mean, it, it, uh, it was, you know, we'd gotten blindsided, but, but we were, we were going to win the war. And, and we knew that the American system had been working well since 1776. So if you'll turn to the next slide, I'd like you to imagine that at that time, uh, you had invested $10,000. And you put that money in an index fund. We didn't have index funds then, but, but you, in effect, bought the S&P 500. Now, I would like you to think a while, and don't, do not change the slide here for a minute. I'd like you to think about how much that $10,000 would now be worth if you just had one basic premise, just like in buying a farm, you buy it to hold throughout your lifetime and depend. And you look to the output of the farm to determine whether you made a wise investment. You look to the output of the apartment house to decide whether you made a wise investment if you buy an apartment, small apartment house to hold for your life. And let's say instead you decided to put the $10,000 in and hold a piece of American business uh, and never look at another stock quote, never listen to another person give you advice or anything on the sort. I want you to think how much money you might have now. And now that you've got a number in your head, let's go to the next slide, and we'll get the answer. You'd have $51 million, and you wouldn't have had to do anything. You wouldn't have to understand accounting. You wouldn't have to look at your quotations every day like I did that first day. <laughs> I'd already lost $3.75 by the time I came home from school. Uh, all you had to do was figure that America was going to do well over time, that we would overcome the current difficulties, and that if America did well, American business would do well. You didn't have to pick out winning stocks. You didn't have to pick out a winning time or anything of the sort. You basically just had to make one investment decision in your life. And that wasn't the only time to do it. I mean, I could go back and pick other times that uh, would work out the even greater gains. But uh, as you listen to the 
questions and answers we give today, just remember that the, over, the overriding question is how is American business going to do over your investing lifetime? Uh, I would like to make one other comment because it's, it's a little bit interesting. Let's, let's say you've taken that $10,000 and you'd listen to the profits of doom and gloom around you and, and you'll get that constantly throughout your life. And instead you'd use the $10,000 to buy gold. Now for your $10,000, you would have been able to buy about 300 ounces of gold. And while the businesses were reinvesting uh, in more plants and new inventions came along, you would go down every year and look in your safe deposit box and you'd have your 300 ounces of gold and you could look at it and you could fondle it and you could, I mean, whatever you wanted to do with it. But it didn't produce anything. It was never going to produce anything. And what would you have today? You would have 300 ounces of gold, just like you had in March of 1942, and it would be worth approximately $400,000. So if you decided to go with a non-productive asset, gold, instead of a productive asset, which actually was earning more money and reinvesting and paying dividends and maybe purchasing stock, whatever it might be, you would now have over 100 times uh, the value of what you would have had with a non-productive asset. In other words, for every dollar you have made in American business, you'd have less than a penny buy of gain by buying in the store of value, which people tell you to run to every time you get scared by the headlines or something of the sort. It's, it's just remarkable uh, to me that we have operated in this country with the greatest tailwind at our back that you can imagine. It's an investor's haven. I mean, you can't really fail at it unless you buy the wrong stock or just get excited at the wrong time. But if you, if you own the cross-section of America and you put it your money in consistently over the years, uh, there's just there's no comparison against owning something that's going to produce nothing. And there, frankly, there's no comparison with trying to jump in and out of stocks and, and pay investment advisors. If you'd followed my advice, incidentally, or this retrospective advice, which is always so easy to give, uh, if you'd follow that, of course, you're, there's one problem, buddy. Your, your friendly stockbroker would have starved to death. I mean, you know, and you could have gone to the funeral to atone for their fate. But the truth is, you would have been better off doing this than, than a very, very, very high percentage of investment professionals have done or people have done that are active. It, it's, it's very hard to move around successfully and beat really what can be done uh, with a very relaxed philosophy. And you do not have to be, you do not have to be, you do not have to know as much about accounting or stock market terminology or whatever else it may be, or what the Fed is going to do next time and whether it's going to raise, raise three times or four times or two times. None of that counts at all really in a lifetime of investing. What, what counts is, is having a, a philosophy that you've, that you stick with, that you understand why you're in it, and then you forget about doing things that you don't know how to do. So with all those happy words, we will move on and start the questioning, and we'll start with Carol. Um, good morning. Um, in choosing a first question to ask each year, I look for a question that is definitely virtue-related and is timely. And this question seemed to fill a bill. The question came from William Anderson of Salem, Oregon, and he said, Mr. Buffett, you have previously said that there are two parts to your job, overseeing the managers and capital allocation. Mr. Abel and Mr. Jane now oversee the managers, which leaves you with capital allocation. However, you share capital allocation with Ted Weschler and Todd Combs. Question, does all that mean you are semi-retired or if not, please explain. <laughs> I've been semi-retired semi for decades. <laughs> uh, the answer is that uh, 
I was probably, well, it's hard to break down the percentage of the time that I was involved in what now, uh, the jobs that are now done by uh, uh, Ajit and, and Greg, and in the case of investing, uh, the sub part of the job that is done by Ted and Todd. Ted and Todd each manage 12 or 13 billion dollars. So in total, that's 25 billion. And we have in equities 170 some billion probably now, and 20 billion in longer term bonds, and another 100 billion in cash in short term. So uh, they're managing 20, 25, and doing a very good job. And I'd still have the responsibility, basically, uh, for the other 300 billion. Uh, so, uh, uh, <laughs> I think Charlie will tell you, in fact, I'd like him to comment, uh, nothing's really changed that much. We've got, clearly, we've got two people in, in Ajit and Greg that are smarter, more energetic, uh, just bring more to the job every day. Uh, but they don't bring too much because the culture is that our managers are running their businesses. But there's a lot. There's, there's a good bit to oversee. So they do a superb job. And uh, Ted and Todd not only do a great job with the 12 or 13 billion each, they started with a couple billion each. Uh, not that it's all been the growth of the two billion, uh, but they also uh, do have done a number of things for Berkshire that uh, they do it cheerfully, but more important, or skillfully. So there's just there's one thing after another that I will have them uh, looking into or working on, and and sometimes I steal their ideas. And uh, but I think actually uh, semi-retired is probably catches me at my most active uh, point. I think if your questioner's got a good point. Okay. Charlie? Well, I've watched Warren for a long time, and he sits around reading most of the time and thinking, and every once in a while he talks on the phone or talks to somebody. I can't see any great difference. A lot of people... <laughs> part of the Berkshire secret is that when there's nothing to do, Warren is very good at doing nothing. <laughs> I'm still looking forward to being a mattress tester. <laughs> okay, Jonathan Brandt. Hi, Warren. Hi, Charlie. Uh, given the growth in airplane build rates, it seems surprising that Precision Cast Parts isn't doing better on the top or bottom line. I understand the issue with the bumpy transition from old to new programs, but I've also heard from industry sources that Precision's market position is not as strong as it used to be amid intensifying competition and some technological disruption. What does Precision need to do to solidify and strengthen its preeminent position with its aerospace customers so that it can deliver the growth you expected when Berkshire acquired it? More yeah. generally, two years after the acquisition, what is your outlook for that business? Give me the last part again, the outlook. More generally, two years after the acquisition, what is your updated outlook for that business longer term? Well, longer term, I think, I, uh, and in the reasonably shorter term. It, it, it's, it's a very, very good business. I mean, you were, uh, you mentioned aircraft, but we get into other industries, but certainly aircraft's the most important. Uh, you have manufacturers that are very dependent uh, on both the quality of the parts and the promptness of delivery. You do not want to have a, an aircraft worth 75 or 100 or maybe $200 million in, be waiting for a part or something of the sort. So it's reliability is un, both in terms of quality and and delivery times and all of that sort of thing uh, is enormously important. And we get contracts that extend out many years. And sometimes we, I mean, we will get them well before the plane even starts in production. So uh, there's a there's very long lead times, and we have found in the last year about it earlier, but I know of some specific cases in the last year where other suppliers have failed uh, in their deliveries, and then the manufacturers come to us and say, we would like you to 
uh, help us out, and we say, well, we'll be glad to help you out, but we'd like about a five-year contract uh, if we're going to do it, because we're just not going to, to uh, make up for these other guys' short, shortfalls uh, uh, periodically. And, uh, but that sort of thing has a very long lead time. Uh, the, the business is a, is a very good business. One thing you will see their earnings charged with is about $400 million, a little over $400 million a year of uh, intangible, non-deductible, in that case, uh, uh, amortization of uh, goodwill, which is really is not an economic cost in my view. We have, we have a significant amount of that through Berkshire, but by far the largest amount uh, is related to the precision uh, acquisition. So uh, whatever you see, you can add about 400 um, million. That, in my view, is not an economic expense, but but the accountants uh, would argue otherwise. Uh, uh, but it's our money, so we'll take my view. The uh, <laughs> uh, Mark Donegan, who runs that operation, is incredible. And he has been not only, he's a fabulous manager, I wouldn't have bought it without, without him in charge. Uh, he also has been very helpful to us uh, in other areas. Uh, uh, and he loves to do it, so you can't beat him. Uh, both as a manager in his own operation, but with his with his devotion to really doing everything that will help Berkshire, it was it was it, it it's a it's a very good acquisition with with very long tails to the products that are being developed. Uh, Charlie. Well, I, th I think we'd buy another one just like it tomorrow if we had the chance. Yeah, that's the answer. <laughs> Man, a few words, but he gets the point. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we will go to the shareholder in uh, Station One. I believe that's probably up here to my right. Hello. Uh, this is Xiao from Wuxi, China, Southwood Capital. I've been in the Moi team for 12 years. Wish you and Charlie good health, so we could see you both around the meeting for 12 more years. Thank you. A uh, quick question. Uh, we know both you and China delegations. U.S. and China delegations are in China for intense discussion on so-called trade war. Let's go one step beyond the trade war. Do you think there's a win-win situation for both countries, or the world is just too small for both to win, and we have to revisit your 1942 chart again? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to just mention one thing. Uh, in August, I'm going to be 88, and that will be the eighth month of the year, and it's in a year that ends with an eight, and as you and I both know, eight is a very lucky number in China, so if you find anything over there for me, <laughs> this, this is the time, this is the time we should be acquiring something, all those eights. Uh, we'll do, we'll do. <laughs> the, the United States and China are going to be the two superpowers of the, of the world, economically and in other ways, uh, for a long, long, long time. Uh, we have a lot of common interests, and like any two big economic entities, there are times uh, when there'll be tensions uh, but it is a win-win situation when, when the world trades, basically, and, and China and the U.S. are the two big factors in that. But there's plenty of other citizens of the world that are involved in how this comes out. And uh, there's no question, and the nice thing about it in this country, I think, is that both Democrats and Republicans um, basically 
uh, unbalanced, believe in the benefits of free trade. And uh, we will we will have disagreements with each other. We'll have disagreements with other countries on trade, but it's just too big and too obvious for uh, that the benefits are huge, and the world's dependent on uh, in, in a major way for its progress. Uh, the two intelligent uh, countries uh, will do something extremely foolish. We both may do things that are mildly foolish from time to time, and, and, and there is some give and take, obviously, involved. But uh, U.S. exports in 1970 and U.S. imports in 1970 were both about 5% of GDP. So here we were selling 5% of our GDP and, and buying 5% of our GDP, basically. Now, people think we, we don't export a lot of things. Our exports are 11 or a fraction percent of GDP. They're more than doubled as a share of this rising GDP. Uh, but the imports are about 14 and a half percent. So there's a gap of 3 percent or thereabouts. And I, I would not like that gap to get too wide. But when you think about it, it's really not the worst thing in the world to have somebody send you a lot of goods that you want and hand them little pieces of paper. I mean, because the, the balancing item is if you have a, if you have a, uh, uh, a surplus of, or a deficit in your trade, you're going to have a surplus in investment. And, and so the world is getting more claim checks on the United States. And they, they, they to some extent, they buy our government securities. They can buy businesses. And uh, over time, you don't want the gap to get to be too wide because uh, uh, the amount of claim checks you were giving out to the rest of the world could get a little unpleasant under some circumstances. But we've done remarkably well with trade. China's done remarkably well with trade. Uh, the countries of the world have done remarkably well with, with the trade. So it, it is a win-win situation. And the, the only problem gets to be when one side or the other may want to win a little bit too much. And then you have a certain amount of tension. But we will not, we will not sacrifice the world, I mean, will not sacrifice world prosperity based on, on uh, differences that arise in, the, in, 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 in trade. Charlie? Yeah, well, I think that both countries have been advancing. And of course, China is advancing faster economically because it started from a lower base and they've had a little more virtue than practically anybody else in the world in having a high savings rate. And uh, of course, a, a country that was mired in poverty for a long, long time and that assimilates the advanced technology of the world and is, has a big savings rate is going to advance faster than some very mature company like Britain or the United States. And that's what's happened. But I think we're getting along fine, and I'm very optimistic that both nations will be smart enough to realize that the last thing they should do is have any ill will for the other. Okay, Becky Quick. Uh, this question comes from Kirk Thompson. Uh, he says, Warren, in this year's annual letter to shareholders, you referenced both cheap debt and a willingness by other companies to leverage themselves as competitive examples as to why it's hard to get more acquisition deals done. It seems like the trust in pre and, and prestige of doing a deal with Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger allow Berkshire to get a hometown discount and beat out other firms that might pay a little more to a prospective seller. Have you given thought to having other Berkshire managers have more public exposure so future generations of successful business owners continue to bring deal opportunities to Berkshire like they have in prior decades. Yeah, that, that sort of reminds me of, who was it, Tony O'Reilly remarked one time about the uh, responsibility of an 
CEO that, that the very first job of the CEO was to search through his organization and find that person who had the initiative and the brains, the determination, all of the qualities to be his logical successor and then fire the guy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. the, uh, there's no question. Uh, I think the reputation of Berkshire as being a very good home for companies, uh, particularly private companies, uh, a good home for companies, uh, uh, I don't think that reputation is dependent on me or Charlie. It may take a little, uh, you know, there'll be a little testing period for whoever uh, takes over in that respect. But, you know, basically, we've got the money to do the deals. We'll have the money to do the deals subsequently. People can see how our subsidiaries operate in the future. And, and the truth is that uh, I think some of the other executives are, going, are getting better known. But there will be a, you know, I'll tell you this, if things get bad enough, you don't have to worry. They'll be calling us no matter what. Uh, so I, I do not worry about the, the so-called deal flow, which is a term I hate. But uh, I don't think there's – I think that's dependent on Berkshire and not dependent on me. And, uh, you know, as I mentioned, my phone isn't ringing off the hook with good deals. So that – Apparently, this big winning personality or something is not delivering for you. <laughs> so it may be, it may be the, next, the next person will, will uh, be even more, get even more calls. Uh, I, Berkshire, the reputation belongs to Berkshire now. And, that, and uh, we are, for somebody that cares out of, out of business that they and their parents and maybe their grandparents lovingly build over decades, if they care about where that business ends up being after, for one reason or another, they don't want to keep it or can't keep it in the family. Uh, we absolutely uh, are the first call, and we will continue to be the first call, whether Charlie or I answer the phone or somebody else does. Uh, Charlie? Well, a lot of the subsidiaries have for a long time already been making all kinds of acquisitions with people they know and we don't. So it's already happening. And in fact, it's happening more there than it is at headquarters. So Don't tell them, Charlie. You're, you're getting your wish. <laughs> and uh, it is weird that about 99 percent of the public companies that change hands in terms of control change hands in a sort of auction provided, presided over by an investment banker. And the people that buy are usually just leverage it to the gills, and then if it starts doing a little better, they re-leverage it. And that money is coming out of the charitable endowments and pension plans who are making these highly leveraged investments in all these companies changing hands at very high prices. Sooner or later, this is not going to work perfectly. Yeah. And it's going to have an unpleasant episode, and I think we'll be around and in good shape at that time. There was one fellow who came to me many years ago, and uh, uh, he had a wonderful business. And he had been worried because he had seen uh, a friend of his die, and the, the problems that arose later when the managers, to some extent, tried to take advantage of the, the widow, and, uh, and it, it became a disaster. So he said he thought about it a lot the previous year, and he decided he didn't want to sell the business to a competitor who would be a logical buyer because they would fire all of his people and the CFO that would remain, and, and you know, all up and down the line, they'd all be the acquirer's people. He didn't want to do that to his people. And then he thought, and he didn't want to sell it to a, a private equity firm because he felt they'd leverage it up. He never liked to leverage that much, and then they'd just resell it later on to somebody, so it would be totally out of control of what he wanted to do. And he wanted to keep running it himself. So he said, he said, Warren, he said, 
He said, it isn't that you're such a great guy. He says, it's, you're the only one left. So, <laughs> Berkshire will continue to be the only one left in many cases. Gary Ransom. Good morning. Warren, in your annual letter, you wrote about the potential for a $400 billion natural catastrophe event, something out in the tail of the loss distribution. I can think of another risk that could have a similar order of magnitude, and that would be cyber risk. I'm sure all your managers have taken steps against that potential, but in, out in the tail of the cyber risk distribution, it could hit a lot of industries, a lot of your companies. So how do you think about and prepare for the big one in cyber? Yeah. Well, I, I include, incidentally, in my that part I wrote in the annual report where I said there roughly nobody knows the answer on this. I mean, I could stick down two, and I could, somebody else much smarter in insurance would stick down a different figure. But I think it's about a 2% risk of a, what I call a $400 billion uh, super cap of all time. And, and uh, um, but cyber is in that, is in that equation. I mean, it's not just earthquakes and, and that sort of thing. And frankly, I don't think uh, we or anybody else really knows what they're doing uh, when writing cyber. I mean, we, it, it is just very, very, very early in the game. And we don't know what the interpretations of the policies necessarily will be. We don't know the degree to which they'll be what, they'll be correlated uh, incidents, which we don't really think are correlated now or haven't had the imagination to come up with. Uh, we know that that every year when I go and hear these people from the CIA or wherever it may be, they tell, them, they tell me that the offense is out of the defense and will continue that way. And, and I can dream of a lot of cyber incidents, which I'm not going to spell out here, because uh, the people that have twisted minds maybe, uh, they probably got more, way more ideas than I've got, but I, I don't believe in feeding them any. But it's, it's a business where we don't, we have a pretty good idea of the probabilities of a quake in California or the probabilities of, of a, a three or a four hurricane hitting Florida or whatever it may be. Uh, we don't know what we're doing uh, in cyber and we try to keep, uh, we don't want to be a pioneer on this. We, we, we do some business in that arena in Berkshire Hathaway especially, uh, but uh, if you're doing something for competitive reasons, uh, which, uh, which I'm okay with, but when I'm doing something where I, uh, that people tell me is a uh, competitive necessity, we are going to try not to have, uh, we don't want to be number one or number two or number three in exposures on it. Uh, and I don't, and I'm sure we are not uh, in cyber, but I don't, I think anybody that t tells, tells you now that they think they know in some actuarial way uh, either what general experience is likely to be in the future or what the worst case would be, uh, I think is kidding themselves, and that's why, uh, that's one of the reasons I say that a $400 billion event has a, I think has roughly a 2% probability per year of, hand, of happening. Cyber is un uncharted territory, and it, it's going to get worse, not better. And then the question is, is whether if we have a whole bunch of $25 billion commercial limits out there, whether there's some aggregation that that we didn't foresee or that the courts interpret those policies differently than, you know, they are generally going to give the benefit of the doubt to the insured. So you're right in pointing that out as a, a very material uh, risk, which didn't exist 10 or 15 years ago, and that and will be much more intense as the years go along. And all I can tell you, Gary, is that that's part of my 400 billion and my 2%, but, but if you've got a different guess, it's just as likely that yours is right than, than mine on that. Charlie? 
Yeah, well, something that's very much like cyber risk is you got computers programmed to do your security trading, and your computer goes a little wild from some error. And that's already happened at least once, where somebody just was fine one morning, and by the afternoon they were broke because some computer went crazy. We don't have any computers we allowed. We allow to go big, automatically trading securities. I think generally, Berkshire is less likely than most other places to be careless in some really stupid way. I do think if there's a mega cat from cyber, and let's say it hits 400 billion, I do not think we'll have more than a 3%. No, no, I, we'll, we'll get our share. And, well, but it, you know, it will destroy, like what will destroy a lot of comp companies that we will actually, if we had a $12 billion loss, I would think, except for the new accounting rule, but I would think from what I call operating earnings, <laughs> we, would, we, we would probably still have a, a reasonable profit that year. I mean, we are in a different position than any insurance company I know of in the world in our ability to handle the really, really uh, super, super cat. Okay, shareholder from station two. I point out that the, the main shareholder to my right here has almost all his net worth in one security. That's likely to be more carefully managed than some public place with people just passing through. Yeah, you don't want a guy that's 64 and is going to retire at 65. I mean, yeah. A lot of decisions you really don't want him or her to be making. <laughs> yeah. Station two. Wally Obermeyer, Obermeyer Wood Investment Council, Aspen, Colorado. Warren and Charlie, you two have demonstrated great talent in private sector capital allocation and shown the world the power of excellence in this area. Do you think there is a similar opportunity for outstanding capital allocation in the public sector at both the state and federal levels? And if so, what approach and or changes would you suggest for society to achieve these benefits? That's too tough. Why don't we go on to a new question? <laughs> I, I'm I afraid I, I have nothing to add. <laughs> I don't mean to be unfair to somebody asking a question, but it, you know, it is, it is unfortunately an entirely different game. And uh, the electorate, the motivations are different, the terms of, uh, the reward system is, is different. I mean, everything is different. And uh, if we knew how to solve that, uh, we wouldn't, uh, we, 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 are, we can't add anything to what you had, <laughs> your, your view. I'm sorry on that. Okay. Andrew? Hi, Warren. This question comes from Paul Speaker of Chicago, Illinois. I believe he may be here today. Uh, he writes, one of your more famous and perhaps most insightful quotes goes as follows. Should you find yourself in a chronically leaking boat, energy devoted to changing vessels is likely to be more productive than energy devoted to patching leaks. In light of the unauthorized accounting scandal at Wells Fargo, of its admission that it charged customers for duplicate auto insurance, of its admissions that it wrongly fined mortgage holders in relation to missing deadlines caused by delays that were its own fault, of its admission that it charged some customers improper fees to lock in mortgage interest rates, of the sanction placed upon it by the Federal Reserve prohibiting it from growing its balance sheet, and of the more than recent $1 billion penalty leveled by federal regulators for the aforementioned misbehavior. If Wells Fargo Company is a chronically leaking boat, at what magnitude of leakage would Berkshire consider changing vessels? Yeah. Well, Wells Fargo. Wells Fargo is a company that proved the efficacy of, of uh, incentives, and it's just that they had the wrong incentives, and that was that was bad. But then they committed a much greater error, and I don't know exactly how or who did it or when, 
but if ignoring the fact that they had a faulty incentive system, which was incenting people to do things that were kind of crazy, like opening non-existent accounts, et cetera. And, uh, you know, that is the cardinal sin at Berkshire. We know people are doing something wrong right as we sit here at Berkshire. You can't have 377,000 employees and expect that everyone is behaving like Ben Franklin or something out there. Uh, they, we, I don't know whether there are 10 things being done wrong as we speak or 20 or 50. The important thing is we don't want to incent any of that if we can avoid it. And if we find that when we find it's going on, we have to do something about it. And that is absolutely the, uh, the key to it. And Wells Fargo didn't do it, but Solomon didn't do it. And the truth is we've made a couple of our greatest investments where people have made similar errors. We bought our American Express stock. It was the best investment I ever made in my partnership years. We bought our American Express stock in 1964 because somebody was incented to do the wrong thing in something called the American Express Field Warehousing Company. We bought a very substantial amount of Geico we bought, but became a half, the, half of Geico for $40 million because somebody was incented to meet Wall Street estimates of earnings and growth, and they didn't focus on having the proper reserves. And that caused a lot of pain at American Express in 1964. It caused a lot of pain at Geico in 1976. It caused a layoff of a significant portion of the wor workforce, all kinds of things. But they cleaned it up. They cleaned it up, and look where American Express has moved since that time. Look at where Geico has moved since that time. So the, the, the fact that you are going to have problems at some very large institution is not unique. In fact, almost every bank has, uh, all the big banks have had troubles of one sort or another. And uh, I see no reason why uh, uh, Wells Fargo, as a company from both an investment standpoint and a moral standpoint going forward, is in any way inferior to the other big banks with which it competes. Um, it, uh, they made a big mistake. It costs, I mean, we've still got, I mean, we've, we have a large unrealized gain in it, but that doesn't, that doesn't have anything to do with our decision making. But the, uh, uh, I like it as an investment. I like Tim Sloan as a manager, you know, and it, it, it he is correcting mistakes made by other people. I tried to correct mistakes at Solomon, and I had terrific help from Derek Maughan as well as uh, uh, as, as well as a number of the people at Munker Tolls. And I mean that 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 is going to happen. You try to minimize it. Charlie says that an ounce of prevention isn't worth a pound of cure. It's worth about a ton of cure. And we ought to jump on everything. He is. He's pushed me all my life to make sure that I attack unpleasant problems that surface. And that's sometimes not easy to do when everything else is going fine. And at, at Wells, they clearly, and I don't know exactly what, but they, they did what people at every organization have, have sometimes done, but it got accentuated to an extreme point. But I, I see no reason to think that Wells Fargo going forward is uh, other than a, a very, very large, well-run uh, bank that, that had an episode in its history it wished it didn't have. But it, Geico came out stronger. American Express came out stronger. But, uh, uh, the question is what you do when you find the problems. Charlie? Well, I, I agree with that. I think Wells Fargo it's going to be better going forward than it would have been if, it, if these leaks had never been discovered. Or happened. Yeah, so I think it, it uh, but I think I, Harvey Weinstein has done a lot for improving behavior too. <laughs> it, it's, the, 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 it was, clearly uh, an error 
and they're acutely aware of it and acutely embarrassed, and they don't want to have it happen again. No, I, 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 if I had to say which bank is more likely to behave the best in the future, yeah, it, it might be Wells Fargo, of all of them. This New York Times that I have here from March 12, 1942, if you go toward the back of it, in the classified section, you have one big section that says help wanted male, and another one that says help wanted female. You know, was the New York Times doing the right thing in those days? Yeah, you know, I think the New York Times is a terrific paper, but that people make mistakes and, and you know, the idea of classifying between taking ads and saying, well, we'll take them and divide them up between men and women, what jobs we think are appropriate, you know, or the, the, employee, the advertiser thinks appropriate. That, it, we do a lot of dumb things in this world, and uh, Geico, as I say, and the, in the early 1970s, they, they just ignored, uh, and you can do it, the setting of proper reserves, which mean they charged the wrong price to new customers because they thought their losses were less than they were. And I'm sure some of that may have been a desire to please Wall Street or just because they didn't want to face the, how things were going. But it came out incredibly stronger. You know, and now it in, it's got 13 percent of the households in the United States insured, and, 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 the, and it's it, it came out with an attention to reserves and, and that sort of thing that, that was heightened by the difficulties that they found themselves in when they almost went bankrupt uh, 40, 40 It was a two. lot more stupid than Wells Fargo. It was really stupid what they did way back, right? Yeah, they had the yeah. world by the tail, and then they, yeah. then they uh, quit looking at, at the reserve development. But it was uh, American Express was just picking up a few dollars by having the field warehousing company in 1963. And, you know, they were worried whether it was going to sink the company. And uh, when some guy named Tino DeAngelis in, I think it was Bayonne, New Jersey. In fact, I went to the annual meeting in 1964 of American Express after the scandal developed. And somebody asked if the auditor would step forward. And the auditor from one of the big firms, which I won't mention, came up to the microphone, and somebody said, how much did we pay you last year? And the auditor gave this answer. And then the questioner said, well, how much extra would you have charged us to go over to Bayonne, which was 10 miles away, and check whether there's any oil in the tanks? <laughs> so it, you know, here was something in a tiny little operation, some guy was calling in from a bar in Bayonne and telling them the phony stuff was going on and they didn't want to hear it. They shut their ears to it. And then what emerged was one of the great company after this kind of what they felt was a near-death experience. So it's, it, we're going to make mistakes. I will guarantee you that we will get some unpleasant news at Berkshire. I don't know what it'll be. You know. <laughs> Most important thing is we do something about it. And there have been times when I've, I've procrastinated, and Charlie has been the one that jabs me into action. And so he's performed a lot of services you don't know about. <laughs> okay. Greg? Greg Warren. Good morning, Warren. Uh, I have a little bit of a follow-up on Becky's question. At the 2014 annual meeting, as well as this morning, you noted that the power of Berkshire brand and its reputation as well as the strength of Berkshire's balance sheet, would allow the company's next managers to replicate many of the advantages that have come with your being the face of the organization, one of which has been an ability to extract high rents from firms in exchange for a capital infusion and the Buffett seal of approval during times of financial distress. I buy the argument about the strength of the balance sheet and believe that deals will continue to be done, with sellers still lining up to become part of the Berkshire family, especially if the company's next managers are allowed to keep a ton of cash on hand. But I'm not entirely convinced that they'll be able to garner the same 8, 9, 10% coupons, as well as other add-ons, that you've been able to extract from firms like Goldman Sachs and Bank of America in times of distress. I'd expect those rents to be at least a few percentage points lower once you're no longer running the show. That is until those managers build up a reputation to warrant higher returns. Am I right to think about it that way? Um, I'm not sure. The, um 
when we, and to, you mentioned Goldman Sachs, and we also dealt with General Electric uh, in September, or early October of 2008. Uh, we probably could have actually extracted better terms. Uh, you know, it, uh, I think it might have been counterproductive in the end, but I was, uh, we would have done better, incidentally, financially, if, if, we'd, if we'd really waited till the, till the panic developed further, because I, I didn't know how far it would develop, but uh, we could have made a lot better purchases three or four or five months later than we did at that time, and we also did not want to do something that looked to be uh, so high as to in, in make the transaction disadvantageous uh, to Goldman or to GE. Uh, uh, they were going to take the terms we offered, but but we actually didn't we didn't we didn't push it to the limit because there really wasn't anybody else around. I think. And we're working on something right now that won't, probably won't happen. It's not huge. But uh, actually, in this case, both Todd and Ted have brought deals to me. One of them brought something to me. And you know, he was thinking in the same terms that I got and was thinking about. And he's the one that returned the call that he had received about a transaction. And, uh, I do not think the party on the other side is going to care about the fact that they had him on the phone rather than me on the phone. I, you know, there may, there could be just a little bit at certain times in history, but, but, uh, you know, we will continue to have our standards of what we think money is worth at any given time, and and uh, and Ted and Todd think just as well about that as as I do, and. There will be times, very occasionally, when uh, our phone will ring a lot. Um, and I don't think they'll hang up because I don't answer it <laughs> if they need the money. Charlie? Well, the times he's referring to, a lot of them, were like the worst in 50 years. So that's a really rare kind of an occurrence. And we didn't make all that many deals, so I, I think he's right that it'll, it'll be harder for us to make similar deals in the future. Yeah, the problem is the is the sums involved now uh, more than the uh, the problem of deciding what the proper term should be. And sometimes we can sometimes we can get what we think is appropriate and sometimes we most of the time today we we can't uh, but you may see a transaction or two that not in terms of buying business but in terms of securities that strike you as perfectly decent ways to invest Berkshire's money and they may well have come through uh, Todd or Ted instead of directly to me uh, I like to think I'll be missed a little bit but I you won't notice it <laughs> okay station three I'm John Lichter from Boulder, Colorado. Mr. Buffett, are you still involved in pricing decisions at Seas, Candies, and the Buffalo News? And with, with what other Berkshire subsidiaries do you take more than a hands-off approach? Yeah, you're correct that it, at one time, I, and for some, uh, quite a while, uh, both Charlie and I uh, took part in the pricing decisions at Seas Candy, uh, and certainly for some years, particularly when the question of the survival of the Buffalo News was, uh, was really in question, uh, I, I definitely took part in those decisions. Uh, in both cases, we had good managers, but. We still wanted to, we thought those decisions were important, but it's been a long, long time, very long time, uh, since we participated in anything like that. But, uh, I can't 
I can't tell you what the per pound price is for C's candy, which uh, is because people, and you're invited to join this group, send me free candy from time to time. And, uh, and I can't, I really, I can't tell you the prices uh, at the Buffalo News. I mean, I, all I know is it's very, very, very hard to, to uh, move up prices on advertising, uh, generally. Uh, so no, we, the only, the only thing is Ajit and I talk frequently, and if there's some very big risk, if somebody wants a $5 billion cover on a chemical plant some way, excess of loss of over $3 billion or something, we have a certain amount of fun with him uh, deciding on the price in his head, and I decide in my, in my head, and then we, and then we uh, compare notes. Uh, that's, uh, it's the kind of risk that you really can't look up in a book and see actuarially uh, what it's uh, fairly, the parameters are fairly likely to be. Uh, I enjoy uh, thinking through the pricing of that, and I particularly enjoy comparing it with a G. So the, these are just oddball situations, but we do, we do that sort of thing, and we've done it uh, for three decades, and it's part of the, it's 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 part of the fun of my job. It, uh, we, the candy prices. Uh, if you got to complain about those, you have to go to Charlie. But, uh. Well, the answer is Warren is still doing it in talking to Ajit, and and uh, but that's because Ajit likes it that way. Yep. We have a very peculiar place, where the, where. Warren's contact with the various people elsewhere in the organization largely depends on what they want, not what he wants. The CEO That's of one very of our, unusual, and it? it's worked beautifully. The CEO of one of our most successful subsidiaries, I may have talked to, unless I saw him here and just said hello, I probably talked to him three times in the last 10 years. And, uh, uh, and he does remarkably well. <laughs> he might have done even better if I hadn't talked to him those three times. <laughs> and on the other hand, Ajit and I talk very, very frequently. And, and he's, got, he's, he's got the kind of business. Hey, I do know, I know, some, I know more about the insurance business. I know about a good many of the other businesses. And it's, it's, it's interesting. And, and we are evaluating things that you don't look up in a book, you know. I mean, it, uh, uh, actuarial talent is not what's important in the things that Ajit talks to me about. It's plenty important throughout our insurance operation, but it, in these particular cases, uh, you know, we're making judgments, and and his judgment is better than mine. But I like to, I just like to hear about them. They're, they're interesting propositions. Okay, Carol. This question comes from a Berkshire shareholder named Jack Sozowski. He's a well-known accounting expert who for many years has written the Accounting Observer. Mr. Buffett, in this year's shareholder letter, you have harsh words for the new accounting rule that requires companies to use market value accounting for their investment holdings. For analytical purposes, you said, Berkshire's bottom line will be useless. I'd like to argue with you about that. Shouldn't a company's earnings report say everything that happened to and within a company during an accounting period? Shouldn't the income statement be like an objectively written newspaper informing shareholders of what happened under the management for that period, showing what management did to increase shareholder value and how outside forces may have affected the firm? If, if securities increased in value, Surely the company and the shareholders are better off. And surely they're worse off if, share, if securities decreased in value. Those changes are most certainly real. In my opinion, ignoring changes in the way that some companies ignore restructuring costs is censoring the shareholders' newspaper. So my question is, how would you answer what I say? 
know my answer to the question and ask what my answer would be to what he said. Uh, the, uh, I would ask Jack if we've got $170 billion of partly owned companies, which we intend to own for decades, and which we expect to become worth more money over time, and where we reflect the market value in our balance sheet, does it make sense to every quarter mark those up and down through the income account when at the same time we own businesses that have become worth far more mo money in most cases and become, you know, since we bought, you name the company, uh, uh, just take Geico, an extreme case. We bought half the company for $50 million, uh, roughly. Uh, do we want to be marking that up every quarter uh, to the value and having it run through the income account? That becomes an appraisal process. There's nothing wrong with doing that in terms of evaluation, but in terms of, in terms of a value, and, and you can call it gain in net asset value or loss in net asset value. That's what a closed-end investment fund or an open-end investment fund would do. But to run that through an income account, if I looked at our 60 or 70 businesses or whatever number there might be, and every quarter we marked those to market, we would have obviously uh, a great many, uh, in certain cases where over time we'd have them at 10 times what we paid, but how quarter by quarter we should mark those up and run it through the income account where 99% of, of investors probably look at net income as being meaningful in terms of what has been produced from operations during the year, I think would be, well, I can say it would be enormously deceptive. I mean, in the first quarter of this year, uh, you saw the figures earlier where we had the best, uh, what I would call operating earnings in our history, and our securities went, were down uh, six billion or whatever it was. Uh, the, to keep running that through the income account every day, you would say that we might have made on Friday, we probably made two and a half billion dollars. Well, if you're, if you have investors and commentators and analysts and everybody else working off those net income numbers and trying to project earnings for quarters and earnings for future years to the penny, uh, I think you're doing a great disservice by running those through the income account. I think it's fine to have marketable securities on the on the uh, on the balance sheet, uh, uh, the information available to their market value. But we have businesses there. If we were, we never would do it. But if we were to sell half, we'll say of the BNSF railroad, we would we would receive more than we carry it carry for. We would turn it. We could turn it into a marketable security, and it would look like we made a ton of money overnight. Or if we were to praise it, you know, praise it every three months and write it up and down, it, a it would, could lead to all kinds of manipulation. But b it would just lead to the average, to any investor, uh, being totally confused. I don't want to receive data in that manner, and therefore I don't want to send it out in that manner. So, Charlie. Well, to me, it's obvious that. The change in valuation should be noted, and it is and always has been. It goes right into the net worth figures. So the questioner doesn't understand his own profession. <laughs> I'm not supposed to talk that way, but it slips out once in a while. <laughs> Sometimes he even gives it a push. <laughs> okay, Jonathan. Uh, McLean's core operating margins have dropped about 50% from where they've generally been since acquisition. Could you elaborate on the competitive pressures in the grocery and convenience store distribution business that have caused the deterioration in profits? And do you expect the margin structure of that business to eventually get back to where it was, or is this the new normal? Well, I don't know the answer to the, uh, the second part about the future, but there's no question that the margins have been squeezed. Uh, they were very, very narrow. As you know, they were about one cent on the dollar uh, pre-tax, and they have been, they've been squeezed from that. Payment terms get squeezed, and uh, uh, 
in some cases we have fairly long-term contracts on that, so it'll go on for five years at one, and then uh, it's a very, very tight margin business. And the situation's even worse than you portray because within McLean, we have a liquor distribution business in a few states, and that business has actually increased its earnings moderately, and we've added to that business. So within McLean's figures are about 70 million or so pre-tax uh, from the liquor part that have nothing to do with the, uh, the massive part you're talking about in terms of uh, food distribution. Uh, so it's even, the decline is even greater in what you're referring to than you, you've noticed. And that's just become very, very much more competitive and we have to decide. You'll look at our competitors and they're not making much money either. And that's capitalism. Uh, I think, uh, you know, there comes a point where the customer says, you know, I'll only pay X and you have to walk away. And, and there's a great temptation when you're employing, particularly employing thousands of people and, and you build distribution facilities and all of that sort of thing, take care of them to meet uh, what you'd like to term as irrational competition. But that, that is capitalism. And uh, you're right. We took, the earnings went up quite a bit from the time we bought it. Uh, and we're still earning more than then. And, and we've earned a lot of money over time. But as they say, a fair amount of that is actually coming from liquor distribution activities in about four states that we, that we purchased very well run. And uh, we will do our best to get the margins up, but I would not, I could not tell you, give you a, a really, uh, a, your, your guess is almost as good as mine or better than mine maybe as to what margins will be in that distribution business five years from now. It's a, it's a very essential service. We do 40 some billion dollars and we move more of the product of all kinds of companies that names are known to you than anybody else. But uh, when you get, when you get uh, Kraft Heinz for that matter, or Philip Morris or whomever it may be on one side of the deal and you get Walmart and some other 7-Eleven on the other side of the deal, sometimes they don't leave you very much room in between. Charlie? I think you've described it very well. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Station four. Um, good morning, Charlie and Warren. Uh, I know that seems a little bit out of order, but um, I'm a huge fan of yours, Charlie, mostly for your uh, 25 cognitive biases. I'm uh, from Seattle, Washington. I run a one-person digital marketing firm that specializes in Facebook ads and email marketing. I use these a lot. I, your breakdown of Coca-Cola was really, really solid, and I, I use that as reference when looking to how to understand the mechanics of my clients' products and how to promote them. So I'm fairly certain that your cognitive biases work for internet-related companies. Now that you're partnering with Amazon on healthcare, I'm curious, have you started to understand how to apply these biases to internet-related companies? Or is there another set of tools you use to decide if you understand a business, because you guys talk a lot about not investing in businesses that you don't understand. Well, healthcare is a, we don't plan to start healthcare companies or necessarily insurers or anything. We, we simply have to, three organizations uh, with leaders that I admire and trust and we, mutually goes around all three, and we hope to do something which Charlie correctly would probably say is almost impossible to uh, change in some way a, a system which is, was taking 5% of GDP uh, in 1960 and now taking close to 18 percent and we have a 
hugely non-competitive medical cost in American business relating to any, any country in the world. The, the countries that, there were some countries that were around our 5% when we were at 5%, but we managed to get to 18 uh, without them going beyond 11 or so. Uh, literally in 1960, we were spending $170 per capita uh, on medical costs in the United States, and now we're spending over 10,000. And you know, every dollar only has 100 cents, so there is a cost problem. It is a tapeworm in terms of American business and, and uh, in its competitiveness. Uh, we don't. We have. Fewer doctors per capita. We have fewer hospital beds per capita, fewer nurses per capita than some of the other countries that are well below us. And you've got a system that is delivering $3.3 trillion. That's almost as much as the federal government raises. It's delivering $3.3 trillion or some number like that uh, to millions and millions and millions of people who are involved in the system. And every dollar has a constituency. It's just like politics. And uh, uh, whether uh, we can find the chief executive, which we're working on now and which I would expect we would, we would be able to announce before too long, uh, that, but that's a key part of it. And whether that, that person will have the imagination and support of people that will enable us to make any kinds of significant improvements in a system which everybody agrees is sort of out of control on cost, but what, but but they all think it's the other guy's fault. Generally, uh, we'll find out. It won't be it won't be easy, but it's, it is not a. The motivations are not primarily profit making. They're, they're, we want to deliver. We want our employees to get better medical service. Uh, at a lower cost. We're not going to, we're certainly not going to come up with something where we think the service that they receive is, is inferior to what they're getting now, but we do think that there may be ways to make a real, some, some significant changes uh, that could have an effect, and we know that the resistance will be unbelievable, and, and uh, if we fail, we've at least tried. and, and uh, uh, but the, the idea is not that I will be able to contribute anything to, you know, in some breakthrough moment by reading a few medical journals or something, <laughs> changing something that is embedded in the medical system. But the idea is maybe the three organizations which employ over a million people and, and which, after we announced it, we had a flood of calls from people who wanted to join in, but there isn't anything to join into now. Uh, but they will, they will if we have come up with any ideas that are useful, uh, whether we can uh, bring the resources, bring the person, and the CEO is terribly important, and then bring the person, support that person, and somehow figure out a better way for people to continue to receive better medical care in the United States without that 8%, 18% going to 20 or 22%, you know, in the lifetime of, you know, our children or something of the sort, because there are only 100 cents in the dollar, and we will see what happens. It's, uh, you know, it, if you were a G, uh, actuarially figuring, you would not, you would not bet on, bet on us, but, but uh, I think there is some chance we will do something. There's, there's a chance nobody can quantify it that we can do something significant. And we are positioned better than most people to try. And we've certainly got the right partners. So we will give it a shot and see what happens. Charlie? There is some precedent for success in this public service activity. If you go back many decades, John D. Rockefeller I, using his own money, made an enormous improvement in American medical care, perfectly enormous. In fact, there's never been 
any similar improvement done by any one man since that marvels it. So Warren, having imitated Rockefeller in one way, is just trying another, and maybe it'll work. Rockefeller, incidentally, lived a very long time, so I actually am trying to imitate him in three ways there. <laughs> we'll see what happens, but we are, we're making a lot of progress, and I, I think we'll probably have a CEO within a couple of months, but if we don't have one, it, we're not going to pick somebody just because we want to meet any deadline or anything like that. We've got these wonderful partners. We don't have a partnership agreement among us. Somebody started drawing up one in the legal department, and the CEO just put a stop to it. I mean, they, you do have places that have a lot of resources, and, and while we all have our share of bureaucracy, we can cut through it uh, if we've got something that we really think makes sense. And, and, and we will get the support, we'll get, we'll get a lot of resistance too, but we will get the support of a lot of American business if we come up with something that makes sense. But, but if it was easy, it would have already been done. There's no question about that. It's not easy. No. <laughs> <laughs> but it should be tried. Okay. Becky? Um, this question comes from David Rolfe, who is with Wedgwood Partners and has been, uh, the company has been shareholders in Berkshire since 1989. The stock is currently the largest holding in their stocks, 18 stocks. He asks uh, this question. Over the past two years, you have listed the individual fund of funds performance from protege partners. When will you start showing the annual performance on 25 billion that Ted and Todd manage? Can you state if either Ted or Todd has beaten the S&P 500 index over the last five years? Yeah. Both. Uh, a, we'll probably never report their individual performance, uh, but you can be sure that I have an enormous interest in uh, as does Charlie, and how much we think they contribute to Berkshire, and they have, they've been, they've been terrific. Uh, they, they not only have the intellect and the record, but they are, they are exceptional human beings, and they, uh, Todd has done a tremendous amount of work, for example, on the, on the medical project, and uh, uh, Ted is, uh, I've given him several things, and he's done them better than I can do them. So I, the record since inception, and I'm measuring it, Ted came later than uh, than Todd a year or so later, uh, but the, the record since inception is almost identical, uh, both for the two managers from their different inception, and, and matching the S&P, and, and they've received some incentive compensation, which they only get if they beat the S&P, uh, and as I say, they're just slightly ahead. That really hasn't, it's been better than I've done, so naturally I can't criticize it. <laughs> they, 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 they were, the, they were two, two very, very, very good choices. Charlie? You did, you did report it in a previous year, you just didn't do it this year. And, but now you have your report. No. No. Well, I would, uh, the, the, the problem that all of us has is, is size. It, it's actually, it's harder to run even 12 or 13 billion dollars, frankly, than it is to run, uh, a billion, and, and if, you, if you're running a million dollars or something of the sort, it's, it's a whole different game. You'd agree with that, wouldn't you, Charlie? Of course. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just like any good lawyer, you, you never ask them a question unless you think you know the answer they're going to give. <laughs> okay, Gary. My question's on Geico. Last year, you promised growth and delivered. But along the way, the combined ratio was moving up, and it was the first time it was over 100 in about 15 years. Granted, some of that was catastrophes, but even excluding catastrophes, there was something going on in the loss trends that caused you to slow down that growth, at least at the, as we got to the latter part of the year. And I wondered if you could 
tell us what was going on. And and I did look this morning too, so it looked like the first quarter settled down a little bit. But I'd still like to know about the course. Yeah, sure. Uh, it uh, the only thing I did different with the question. I'm sorry. When you say it causes us to slow down, we didn't want to slow down the growth. I mean, you're. They're looking at a guy here that has never wanted to slow down the growth of Geico. The growth did slow down, but it wasn't because uh, we wanted it to. Uh, our prices uh, that led to the underwriting loss, the actual, we'd have been slightly in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the black without the catastrophes, but, you know, if we hadn't have paid our light bills, we might have been in the black, too. I mean, this except for stuff doesn't mean much in insurance, as far as I'm concerned. The, if you look at the first quarter, uh, our margins were around uh, 7%, which is actually a little more than we aimed for. And I've received the unaudited, I mean, the preliminary figures for April, and they're similar. So the underwriting gain is her margins are perfectly satisfactory now, and we'd love to get all the growth we can, and we will gain market share this year, and we gain market share. Tony, when Tony took over the place, it was in 1993, it was two and a fraction, two and a very small fraction percent, and it'll be 13% of the house, you know, 13% of the households in the country now, and we will keep gaining share. We will keep riding on profitably uh, most of the time, and every now and then uh, our rates will be in that slightly inadequate, modestly inaccurate, and, and uh, inadequate, I should say, and or we'll have maybe some big losses on, 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 uh, on hurricanes or something of the sort, uh, or we'll have a Sandy in New York. Or the, um, but Geico is a jewel, and it's, it's uh, you know, it, it's really our, we've got some others we feel awfully close to similarly about, but, but it's, a, it's an incredible company. It has a, a culture all of its own. It, it, it's saving its customers probably four or five billion dollars a year against which they would other, uh, against what they would otherwise be paying based on the average in auto insurance. And it, it will be profitable on underwriting a very high percentage of the year. It contributed another $2 billion to float last year. It is a terrific company. And like I say, the first four months are dramatically better. Now, there's some seasonal in auto insurance. So the first quarter is usually the best of the four quarters, but it's not a dramatic seasonal side. I think when you read the 10Q, and you can take my word for April, I think uh, I think Geico is on a good profit track as well as a good growth track. And the more it grows, the better I like it. Charlie? Well, I think you've said it perfectly. Huh. It was never very bad, and it's better now. <laughs> Okay, station five. Good morning, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. My name is Ethan Raposa, and I am from Omaha, Nebraska. My question is, how will Donald Trump's ter tariffs affect the manufacturing business of Berkshire Hathaway? Well, today, uh, steel costs. Uh, so we've seen a, we've seen steel costs increase somewhat, but as I said earlier, I don't think the United States or China. There'll be some jockeying back and forth, and there'll be something that leaves some people unhappy. And but I don't think. Uh, I don't think either country uh, will dig themselves into something that precipitates and continues any kind of real trade war in this country. We, we've had that in the past a few times, and I think we've, 
we've learned a general lesson on it. But there will, uh, there will be some, some things about our trade policies that irritate others, and there'll be some from others that irritate us, and there'll be some back and forth. But in the end, I don't think we'll come out with a, with a, a, a terrible answer on it. Uh, Charlie, on will let you. Well, steel has it reached the conditions in steel were almost unbelievably adverse to the American steel industry. You know, even Donald Trump can be right on some of this stuff. The the the, the thing about trade. I've always said that the president, whether it's president, any president, uh, needs to be an educator in chief, which Roosevelt was in the Depression. That's why he had those fireside chats, and it was very important that he communicated to the people uh, what needed to be done and how, and uh, and what was happening around them. And uh, uh, trade is particularly difficult because. The benefits of trade are basically not visible. You know, you don't know what you would be paying for the closure way ordering today if, if we'd had a rule they all had to be manufactured in the United States or what you'd be paying for your television set or whatever it may be. You, no one thinks about the benefits day by day as they walk around buying things and carrying on their own business. The negatives, and there are negatives, uh, are very are very apparent and very painful. And if you're laid off, like happened in our shoe business in Maine, and you know you have been a very, very, very good worker, and you are proud of what you did, and maybe your parents did it before you, and all of a sudden you find out that American shoes, shoes manufactured in America, are not competitive with shoes made outside the United States, you know, you can talk all you want about Adam Smith or David Ricardo or something and explain the benefits of free trade and comparative advantage and all that sort of thing, and that doesn't make any difference. And if you're 55 or 60 years old to talk about retraining or something like that, you know, so what? Uh, so I, it is tough in politics where you have a hidden benefit and a very, a very visible cost to a certain percentage of, a cons of your constituency. And you need to do two things under those circumstances if you have that situation. You know what's good for the country. So you have to be very good at explaining how it does really hurt in a real way somebody that works in a textile mill like we had in New Bedford where you only spoke Portuguese, half our workers only spoke Portuguese. and. And suddenly they have no job, and they've been doing their job well for years. You've got to do two things. You can, you have to, you have to understand that, that that's the price individuals pay for what's good for for the collective good. And secondly, you got to take care of the people that are that were retraining as a joke because of their age or whatever it may be. And you've, you've got to take care of the people that become the roadkill in something that is co collectively good for us as a country. And uh, uh, that takes that takes society acting through its representatives to to develop the policies that will get us the right collective result and not kill too many people economically in the process. And, and you know we've done that in various arenas over the years. The people in their productive years do help take care of the people that are too old. Uh, and too young. I mean, every time a baby is born in the United States, you know, we take on an obligation of, of educating them for 12 years. It'll cost $150,000 now, you know. It, 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 we, we, we have a system that has a bond between the people in their productive years and the ones in the young and old, and it gets better over time. Far from perfect now, but it, it has gotten better over time, and I believe that the trade properly explained and with policies that take care of the people that are roadkill is good for our country and, and, and can be explained. But I think it's a tough, it's been a tough 
tough sell to a guy that made shoes in Dexter, Maine, or, or worked on a loom in New Bedford, Mass, or works in the steel mill in Youngstown, Ohio. So. Andrew? Okay, Warren, this question comes from a Berkshire shareholder, says they've been a shareholder for 10 years. I should say this may be one of the most pointed questions I've ever received for you. But you so. elected to give it, though, anyway. <laughs> but, but I did. <laughs> the shareholder writes, I have watched the movie every year at this meeting when you testify in front of Congress on behalf of Solomon as the symbol of what it means to have a moral compass. Investors are increasingly looking to invest in companies that are socially and morally responsible. So I was disturbed when you were asked on CNBC about the role that business could play in sensible policies around the sales of guns. You said you didn't think business should have a role at all and you wouldn't impose your values on others. I was even more surprised when you said you'd be okay with Berkshire owning shares in gun manufacturers. At this meeting years ago, you said you wouldn't buy a tobacco company because of the social issues. The idea that Berkshire would associate with any company as long as it isn't illegal seems at odds with everything I think you stand for. Please tell us you misspoke. Well, let's, let's explore that a little. Uh, should, it, should it be just my view or should it be the view of the owners of the company? So if I decide to poll the owners of the company, on a variety of political issues, and, and one of them being whether, you know, Berkshire Hathaway should support the NRA. Yeah. I know if a majority of the shareholders voted to do it, or if a majority of the board of directors voted to do it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept that. I don't, I don't think that the, my political views, I don't think I put them in a blind trust at all when I take the job, and I, in the election of, 2016, I raised a lot of money. In my case, I raised it for Hillary, and I spoke out in various ways that were quite frank. But I don't think that I speak. When I do that, I don't think I'm speaking for Berkshire. I'm speaking as a private citizen, and I don't think I have any business speaking for Berkshire. We have never, at the parent company level, we have never made a political contribution. You know, uh, I mean, go, and I don't. I don't go to our suppliers. I don't do anything of that sort where I raise money either for the school I went to or for a political candidate I went to or anything else. Uh, and I don't think that we should have a question uh, on the Geico policyholder form. Are you an NRA member? You know, and if you are, you just aren't good enough for us or something like that. I think I, I, I do not. I, I do not believe in imposing my political opinions on the activities of our businesses. And if you get to what companies are pure and which ones aren't pure, I think it is very difficult to make that call. Okay. I think with that response, I'm almost afraid to call on Charlie, but go ahead, Charlie. <laughs> Well, obviously, you do draw a limit, Warren, yeah, on all did. kinds of things yeah. which are beneath us even though they're legal. But we don't necessarily draw it perfectly because we've got some sort of supreme knowledge. We just do the best we can. And certainly we're not going to ban all guns surrounded no. by wild turkeys in Omaha. Okay, Greg. <laughs> Warren, this question is also based on something you said more recently, so I can't guarantee it's going to be any easier. Um, <laughs> you recently noted that you prefer sherry purchases over dividends as a means for returning capital to shareholders should Berkshire's cash balances continue to rise and hit the $150 billion threshold you noted as being difficult to defend to shareholders at last year's annual meeting. While I understand the rationale for not establishing a regular dividend, a one-time special dividend could be a useful option refer for returning a larger chunk of Berkshire's excess capital to shareholders without the implied promise of, to keep paying a regular dividend forever. 
The drawback with the special dividend, though, is that it would lead to an immediate decline in book value and book value per share, whereas a larger share repurchase effort while depressing book value would reduce Berkshire's share count, limiting the impact on book value per share. If we do happen to get a few years out and Berkshire does hit that $150 billion threshold because valuations continue to be too high, both for acquisitions and for the repurchase of company stock, would you consider a one-time special dividend as a means for returning capital to shareholders? Well, if we thought we couldn't use capital effectively, we would, figure, we would try to figure out the most effective way of returning capital uh, to shareholders. And you could, uh, I, I would have probably, uh, I think it'd be unlikely we'd do it by a special dividend. I think it'd be more likely we'd do it by a repurchase if the repurchase didn't result in us paying a price above intrinsic value per share. We're never going to do anything that we think is harmful to continuing shareholders. So if we think the stock is uh, intrinsically worth X, and we would have to pay some multiple, some modest multiple even above that to repurchase shares, we wouldn't do it because we would be hurting continuing shareholders that, uh, to, uh, uh, to the benefit of the people who are getting out. But we will try and do whatever makes the most sense, but not with the idea that we have to, we have to do something every day because we simply can't find a, a something that day. We, we had a vote, as you know, uh, I don't know, a few, a few years back on whether people wanted the dividend. And uh, uh, the B shares, uh, so I'm not talking my shares or Charlie's or anything, but the B shares voted 47 to 1 uh, against it. So I. I think uh, through self-selection of who become shareholders, uh, I, don't, I don't think shareholders world or countrywide on all stocks would vote 47 to 1 at all. But we get self-selection in terms of who joins us. And I think they expect us to do whatever we think makes the sense for all shareholders. And uh, um, obviously, if we really thought we never could use the money effectively in the business, uh, we should get it out one way or another. And uh, uh, you've got a bunch of directors who own significant, uh, very significant amounts of stock themselves. And uh, you can expect them to think like owners. That's the reason they're on the board. And you can expect the management to think like owners. And uh, owners will, will return money uh, to all of the owners if they think it, it makes more sense uh, than continuing uh, to look for things to do. But we, we invested in the first quarter, maybe you have to look it up on the, well, certainly through April, uh, probably close to 15 billion or something like that net. So, and, and uh, we won't always be in a world of very low interest rates, nor high, or high private market prices. Uh, so we will do what makes the most sense. But I, I can't see us ever making a special, or almost, it's very unlikely we would just pay out a big special dividend. I think that if we put that to the vote of the shareholders, and Charlie and I did not vote, I think we would get a big negative vote, and I'd be willing to to uh, be willing to make a bet on that one. Uh, Charlie? Well, as long as the existing system continues to work as well as it has, why would we change it? We've got a whole lot of people that are accustomed to it, who've done well unto it. And, and if conditions change, why well, we're capable of changing our minds if the facts change. Yeah, and we've done that several times. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Although I must say it's a little hard. <laughs> uh, it always brings me back to earth. Okay, station six. Hi, good morning, Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger. My name is Steffi Yu from Horizon Insights, a China-focused research firm based in Shanghai. Um, so I have a lot of mutual fund clients in China who are very young, relatively younger, and they manage a smaller portion of funds. So my question is, 
if you only have one billion dollars in your portfolio today, um, how would you change your investments? Would you consider more investment opportunities in uh, emerging markets such as China? Thank you. Yeah, I would. I would say if, if I were working with a billion, I would probably find within a thirty trillion dollar market in the United States where I understood uh, things better just generally than I do around the world. I'd probably find find opportunities there that would be better, incidentally, by some margin than what we can find for hundreds of billions. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't. Uh, there's no way I blew a lot of emerging markets. There was a time 15 years ago or so uh, when just because it was kind of interesting and it took me back to my youth. I, uh, on a weekend, I went through a, a directory of Korean stocks and I, I bought and these were small stocks. Uh, well, they were small by standards of, of either Korean or American business. They were big, big companies. But I found 15 or 20, and they were statistically cheap, and bought some of each one myself. And, and there, are, there are opportunities with smaller amounts of money to do things that we just can't do. And, uh, uh, but I, my first inclination always would be to comb through uh, things in the United States, and and uh, but I'd comb through in other countries. I probably wouldn't get into very very small markets because uh, there can be a lot of difficulties even in market execution and taxation. A lot of things you can find if you can't find it. In, you know, in America and China and Britain and a few other places. <laughs> you're probably not going to find it someplace else. So you may think you found it, but there may be, there may be a different game that you know. Uh, our problem is size, not geography. Charlie? Well, I, I already have more stocks in China than you do in, as a percentage. So I'm with the young lady. <laughs> OK, well. You can. You want to name names? Do these stocks have names? Or? <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> Carol, um, this question uh, and I, I should uh, just add one thing. You will find plenty of opportunities in China. Would, Charlie would say you've got a better hunting ground than even a person with similar capital in the United States. Would you agree? With yes, that? I do. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and in a sense, there, it, it's logical that should be the case because. It, it's a younger market, as well, but still a large market. So that that uh, markets probably work toward efficiency as they age. Japan had this very strange situation with warrants being priced out of line and all of that uh, 30 years ago, and it, people notice after a while it disappears. But there can be some very strange things happen in, in markets as they develop. I think you'd agree with that, Charlie, wouldn't you? Absolutely. Yeah. Jonathan? Hello. Whoa. You skipped me. Did I skip? <laughs> I skipped Carol? Yep. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> um, this question, and I would concede it is not a small one, comes from Gideon Pollock of Montreal. He says, the world knows generally how the looks of Berkshire Hathaway have changed since you began to run the company in 1965. Berkshire was then a tiny northeastern textile company, and now it is the number four company on the Fortune 500. What about the next 50 years? Could you give us your view of what Berkshire looks like in 2068? I think it'll look a long way away. <laughs> the, uh, no, the answer is I don't know, and I didn't know 50 years ago what it would look like now. I mean, uh, it, uh, it will be based on certain principles, but where that leads, and you know, we will find out and we'll have people that are thinking about different things than I am, and we'll have a world that's different, and, but, uh, uh, 
we will be, I very much hope and believe, and we will be, that we'll be as shareholder-oriented as any large company in the world. Uh, we will look at our shareholders as partners, and, and we will be trying to do with our money exactly what we do, we do with our own, not seeking to get an edge on them. And who else? Who knows what, what else will be happening then? But, uh, Charlie? Well, I want to talk to the younger shareholders in the group. Those of you who, after we are gone, sell your Berkshire stock and do something else with it, helped by your many friends, I think are going to do worse. <laughs> So I would advise you to keep the faith. Well, By the way, some of that has already happened in many families. I'll give his answer next time now, then I'd see him get all the applause. <laughs> Jonathan. Uh, Duracell's $82 million of pre-tax profits in 2017 were still well below what it earned as a subsidiary of P&G. Can you clarify or quantify to what extent transition costs or purchase price accounting impacts at the segment level were still temporarily a burden last year? Or is it possible that the gap earnings contribution simply reflects a commoditization of the category given the entry of Amazon into the battery market? I I did see that Duracell's earnings were up in the first quarter. Is that a sign of a more meaningful contribution in 2018 and beyond as you finish right-sizing the manufacturing footprint and acquisition-related charges fall away? Yeah. Duracell should be earning more money than it is now and will be. And as you mentioned, it's, it's well on its way there, but, it, but it's, not earning, it's not earning an, an appropriate amount now based on the history of the company. I, I was around when I was on the board of Gillette when Gillette bought Duracell, and I've, I've seen what it uh, does when it isn't managed to its full extent, and I, and I saw what Jim Kiltz did with it at Gillette when, when, when he ran it, and uh, there were a lot more transition problems uh, uh, in the purchase. For one thing, there's a lot of rules connected with our swap of our stock in P&G for Duracell. There are a lot of things that you cannot do that made sense to do in that period of transition from PGA, P&G's management to ours. But Duracell, uh, the brand is strong, very strong. The product, the product line, uh, is very strong, so, uh, and we are making more money, and we'll, we should, and I believe we will, uh, earn really what the property is capable of earning. We should be, we should be, we should be earning that relatively soon. But you're absolutely right that that it is from a profit standpoint is underperforming. We're making a lot of changes, and some of those are involved in jurisdictions, uh, countries where it is really expensive to change in terms of, of uh, employment uh, payments that have to be made if, if a plant is changed or something of the sort. But uh, I like the Duracell deal absolutely as well as, as, well as when we made it. Charlie? I like it better than you do. <laughs> now, Duracell, Duracell is a very, very, it's our kind of business. Yeah, it think. is. OK, Station 7. Uh, good morning. Um, I have a question related to uh, the bond market, the US Treasury bond market. Uh, my name is Ole Larsen. I live in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. And uh, I never worked in the financial industry. I started out buying uh, penny mining stocks on the Vancouver Stock Exchange. And then a decade later, I got married. And my wife convinced me to buy Berkshire shares. Uh, that was probably a good decision. So 
So my, my question is, um, um, I read that I read the newspapers about um, the Federal Reserve and uh, the inflation numbers, and um, there must be an increased supply of Treasury bonds that must go to to auction. And my question is, how would how, what do you expect that to um, impact uh, yield or interest rate? Yeah, well, the answer is, I don't know, and the good news is nobody else knows, uh, including members of the Federal Reserve and everyone. It, 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 there are a lot of variables in the, in the picture, and the one thing we know is we think that long-term bonds are a terrible investment, and uh, we, at, at current rates or anything close to current rates, uh, so, basically, all of our money that is waiting to be placed is is in is in treasury bills that I think have an average maturity of four months or something like that at most. Uh, the rates on those have gone up lately, so that in 2018, my guess is we'll have at least $500 million more of pre-tax income than we would have had in the bills uh, last year. Uh, but they still, it's not because we want to hold them, we're waiting to do something else, but long-term bonds, uh, they're basically, at these rates, it's almost ridiculous when you think about it, because here the Federal Reserve Board is telling you we want 2% a year inflation, and the very long bond is not much more than 3%. And of course, if you're an individual and you pay tax on it, uh, you're going to have some income taxes to pay, and let's say it brings your after-tax return down to 2.5%. So the Federal Reserve is telling you that they're going to do whatever's in their power to make sure that you don't get more than a half a percent a year uh, of inflation adjusted income, and uh, that seems to me a very, I wouldn't go back to penny stocks, and so, but I think I would stick with, I would stick with productive businesses or productive, certain other productive assets uh, uh, by far. But what the bond market does in the next year, you know, you've got trillions of dollars uh, in the hands of people that are trying to guess which maturity would be the best to own and all that sort of thing. And we do not bring anything to that game that would allow us to think that we've got an edge. Charlie? Well, it really wasn't fair for our monetary authorities to reduce the savings rates paid mostly to our old people with savings accounts as much as they did. But they probably had to do it to fight the Great Recession appropriately. But it, it clearly wasn't fair, and the conditions were weird. In my whole lifetime, it's only happened once that interest rates went down so low and stayed low for a long time. And it was quite unfair to a lot of people, and it benefited the people in this room enormously because it drove asset prices up, including the price of Berkshire Hathaway stock. So we're all a bunch of undeserving people, and, and I hope that we continue to be so. <laughs> At the time this newspaper came out in 1942, the, it was the government was pe appealing to the patriotism of everybody. As kids, we went to school and we bought saving stamps to put in. Well, they first called them U.S. war bonds, then they called them U.S. defense bonds, and then they called them U.S. savings bonds. <laughs> but they were called war bonds then. And you put up eight, $18.75 and you got back $25 in 10 years. And that's when I learned that that $4 for three uh, in 10 years was 2.9% compounded. They had to put in small print that. And, and even an 11-year-old could understand that 2.9% compounded uh, for 10 years was not a good investment. But we all, we all bought them. It was, it, was, you know, it was part of the war effort, basically. Uh, 
and the government knew, I mean, you knew that significant inflation was coming from what was taking place in finance in World War II, we actually were on a massive Keynesian type behavior, not because we elected to follow Keynes, but because war forced us to have this huge deficit in our finances, which took our debt up to 120% of GDP. And it was the great Keynesian experiment of all time, and we backed into it, and it sent us on a wave of prosperity like we've never seen. So you get some accidental benefits sometimes. But the United States government then was urging every citizen to put their money into a fixed dollar investment at 2.9% compounded for 10 years. And, and uh, I think Treasury bonds have been unattractive ever since, <laughs> with the exception of the early 80s. That was something at, th at that time. I mean, you, you really had a chance to, to buy, you had a chance to invest your money by buying zero coupon treasury bonds and in effect guarantee yourself that for 30 years you would get a, a compounded return, you know, something like 14% for 30 years of your lifetime. So that every now and then something really strange happens in markets and, and the trick is to not only be prepared, but to take action when it happens. Charlie, did you ever buy any war bonds? Or? No, no, mm -hmm. I never bought war bonds. No. It used to be like, take me. I didn't have any money when I was in the war. <laughs> That's a good reason not to buy. <laughs> okay, Becky. Um, this question comes from Angus Hanton, who he and his wife are based in London, and he says they've been shareholders in Berkshire Hathaway for over 30 years. Um, he says, we have all read about the zero-based budgeting that has been so effective with Kraft Heinz and other investments that you've done with 3G partners. Can we expect these cost reduction techniques to be used by your managers in other parts of the Berkshire Hathaway enterprise? Well, in general, we do not expect the managers generally to get into a position where there would be a lot of change in terms of zero-based budgeting. And in other words, why in the world aren't you thinking that way all of the time? Uh, the, 3G people have gone into certain situations where there were probably primarily in personnel, but in other expenses as well, a lot of expenses that were not delivering a dollar of value per dollar expended. And so they made changes very fast that uh, to a situation that, that probably shouldn't have existed in the first place, whereas we hope that our managers Take a Geico. Geico's gone from, I think, 8,000 to 39,000 people uh, since we bought control. And, but they're all very productive. I mean, you would not, you would not find a way for, for a 3G operation to take thousands of people out of there. On the other hand, I can think of some organizations uh, where you could take a whole lot of people out uh, where it isn't being done because the businesses are very profitable to start with. That's what happened with the tobacco companies, actually. They were so profitable that they, they got all kinds of people around that, didn't, that weren't really needed, but they, uh, the money just flowed in. So I, our managers have different techniques of keeping track of, or, 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 or of, uh, uh, trying to maximize customer satisfaction at the same time that they don't incur other than necessary costs. And, and I think probably some of our managers may well use something that's either zero-based budgeting or something akin to it. They do not submit budgets that never have to me. I mean, they've never been required to. We've never had a budget at Ber Berkshire. We don't, we don't consolidate our figures monthly. I mean, I get individual reports on every company, but there's no reason that, to have some extra time spent, for example, by having a consolidated figures at the end of April and a consolidated figures at the end of May. We know where we stand. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure we're the only company that probably in the, in the whole Fortune 500 that doesn't do it, but we, we don't do unnecessary things around 
merger. And a lot of stuff that's done at big companies is unnecessary, and that's why a 3G finds opportunities from time to time. Charlie? Well, if you've got 30 people at headquarters and half of those are internal auditors, that is not the normal way of running a big company in America. And I, what's interesting about it is, obviously we lose some advantages from big size, but we also lose certain disadvantages from having a big bureaucracy with endless meeting after meeting after meeting around headquarters. And net, I think we've been way ahead with our low overhead diversified method. And it also makes our company attracted to very able, honorable people who have, who have companies. So generally speaking, the existing system has worked wonderfully for us. I don't think we have the, the, uh, the, employment that could be cut effectively that a lot of other places have. And, and I think our methods have worked so well, we'd be very unlikely to change them. I think at, sub, at headquarters, you could say we have kind of sub-zero based budgeting. At, uh, and and we, we hope that the example of headquarters is to a great extent emulated by our... By but our it isn't society. just the cost reduction. I think the decisions get made better if you eliminate the bureaucracy. Oh, yeah. I think a bureaucracy is sort of like a cancer, and it functions sort of like a cancer. <laughs> and so we're very anti-bureaucracy, and I, I think it's done us a lot, a lot of good. In that case, we're quite different from, say, Anheuser-Busch at its peak. Okay, Gary. My question is on small commercial, and specifically direct small commercial. You seem to have some uh, websites that enable buyers to purchase small commercial insurance directly. Buy Burke is one of them. Um, it's a very competitive, fragmented market, but what is your strategy for that market? And then can you ultimately Geico-ize the small commercial market? Well, we'll find out. I mean, it's a very good question because that's exactly the question we ask ourselves. And we have this incredible company at Geico, which has gone direct uh, in the personal auto field and is, you know, first started in 1936. Uh, and there's no question in my mind that that over a lot of years, and maybe not so many years, something like small commercial, anything that takes cost out of the system, you know, makes it easier for the customer, is going to work over time if you've got a system that was based on something that, that had more layers of agency costs and that sort of thing. So we are experimenting, and we'll continue to experiment on, on something like like small commercial workers comp, whatever it may be, we'll, we'll try and figure out ways to take cost out of the system, offer the customer a, a, an equivalent product or better at lesser price, and we'll find out what can be done and what can't be done. And we're not the only ones doing it, as you know. Uh, um, but we are not going to... We've, we've got some managers that are going to be quite, I'm sure, enterprising on that, and we back them, and we expect some to fail, and some, and if a few succeed, uh, we'll have some very good businesses, and the world is going in that direction, so, so uh, you can expect us to try and go with it. Charlie? Well, if it were easy, I think it would have happened more fast than yeah, it, has. it will happen uh, as we go along. I mean, it, it it wasn't easy in auto. I mean, when you think about it. No, it wasn't. No, I mean, it was a system with all kinds of extra costs to go back to the turn of the, the 19th century into the 20th. I mean, it was built on fire insurance and strong general agencies, and that slopped over into auto when the auto came along. and. 1903 from Ford or whenever, and uh, 
Uh, so it grew within a system that really wasn't really wasn't very efficient compared to what was available, but it took it took State Farm initially to go to a, a direct or a captive agency system, and then it took USAA and then later GEICO and then later Progressive to go to direct systems that are even more uh, efficient and consumer friendly. And the same thing is going to happen to some degree in all kinds of industries and certainly small commercial. Uh, somebody it it will could succeed. happen, but it will be slow. It, it takes an amazingly long time. I mean, it, uh, it but you know, the battle doesn't always go to, to the strong and the race to the swift, but that's the way to bet, you know, as they say. So, <laughs> okay, station eight. Yeah. Austin Merriam from Jacksonville, Florida. Mr. Buffett, with the recent news of the partnership between you, Mr. Bezos, and Mr. Diamond to challenge the healthcare industry and the self-admitted difficulties you are running across, this would lead me to believe the industry has higher barriers to entry than may have originally been hypothesized, a larger moat, if you will. Would that justify a higher earnings multiple for established players in the industry, such as PBMs, for example? Well, just though the system may have a moat against intruders, it doesn't mean that everybody operating within the system uh, has individual modes for one thing. Uh, uh, now, I, uh, we are, if, if this new triumvirate uh, succeeds at all, we are attacking an industry mode. Uh, and I'm defining industry very broadly, healthcare, not just, you know, healthcare insurers or this or that. We're trying to figure out a better way of, of doing it and making sure that, that, uh, we're not sacrificing care, and, 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 and the goal is to improve care. And like I say, that is a, it's a lot bigger than a, a single company's moat. It's bigger than a component of the industry's moat. The moat held by the whole system, since it interacts in so many ways, is actually, that's the moat that, that essentially has to be attacked, and that's a huge moat. Uh, and, and like I say, we'll do our best. Uh, but uh, uh, I hope if we fail, I hope somebody else succeeds. Charlie? Well, I suspect that eventually, when the Democrats control both houses of Congress and the White House, we will get single-payer medicine. And I don't think it's going to be very friendly to many of the current PBMs. and I won't miss them. <laughs> yeah. Andrew? This question comes from uh, Key Lee and actually is directly about the issue of moats. Uh, he notes that uh, Elon Musk this week on his Tesla earnings call said the following, quote, I think moats are lame. They are like nice in a sort of quaint vestigial way and if your only defense against invading armies is a moat, you will not last long. What matters is the pace of innovation. That is the fundamental determinant of competitiveness, unquote. So Warren, it seems the world has changed. Business is getting more competitive, pace of innovation, technology is impacting everything. Is Elon right? Let me well, answer that one, Warren. Elon says a conventional moat is quaint. And that's true of a puddle of water. And he says that the best moat would be to have a big competitive position. And that is also right. You know, it's, a, it's ridiculous. <laughs> Warren does not intend to build an actual moat. <laughs> Even though they're quaint. Yeah. <laughs> There's certainly a great, mem a great number of businesses. This has always been true, but it does seem like it. Uh, the pace has accelerated and so on in recent years. There's been uh, more 
moats that have been become susceptible to invasion uh, than, than seemed to be the case earlier. But, but there's always been the attempt to do it. And there, here and there, there are probably uh, uh, places where the moat is as strong as ever. But certainly, uh, you can work at certainly should be working at improving your own moat and defending your own moat all of the time. And, and uh, uh, Elon may turn things upside down in, in some areas. Uh, I don't think he'd want to take us on in candy. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and we've got some other businesses that when it's always easy to get. Uh, uh, you, can, uh, you can look at something like uh, Granables out there in the other room, and, and uh, it, it won't be technology that takes takes away the business and and, and Granables. It, it may be something else that catches the young kid's fantasy or something. But uh, there are, there are some pretty good moats around. Being the low cost producer, for example, is a terribly important moat. And something like Geico. Uh, uh, technology has really not brought down the cost that much, and that, uh, I think I think our position as there are a couple of companies that have costs as low as ours, but among big com big companies, we are a low cost producer, and that is not bad when you're selling an essential item. Okay, Greg, Warren. Berkshire Energy has benefited greatly from operating under the Berkshire umbrella. By not having to pay out 60 to 70 percent of earnings annually as a dividend, the company was able to amass $9 billion in capital the past five years and closer to $12 billion in the past 10. Money that could be allocated to acquisitions and capital spending, especially on renewables. While tax credits for solar energy don't run out until next year, we've already seen a dramatic reduction in Berkshire Energy's capital commitment to solar projects. And even though spending on wind generation capacity is projected to be elevated this year and next, it does wind down in 2020 as the wind production tax credits are phased out. Absent a major commitment to additional capital projects, it looks like Berkshire Energy's expenditures in 2021 will be its lowest since 2012, leaving the firm with more cash on hand than it has had in some time. Do you think it is likely at that point that Berkshire Energy starts funneling some of that cash up to the parent company? Or will it be earmarked for debt reduction or just be left on the balance sheet as dry powder for acquisitions? Yeah, the, um, you're right about when tax credits phase out and all of that, although, they, as you know, they've, they've extended that legislation in the past, and, and uh, who knows exactly what the government's position will be on, on incentivizing various forms of alternative energy. But uh, my guess is, I mean, if you take the if you take the logical expenditures that may be required in all aspect, aspects of the public, of electric generation and the utility business generally, I think there'll be a lot of money spent. And the question is whether we can spend it uh, and get a reasonable return on it. And uh, we'll, there again, we'll do what's logical. There are three, three shareholders, basically, of Berkshire. Hathaway Energy. Berkshire Hathaway itself owns 90 percent of it, and Greg Abel and his family, perhaps, and Walter Scott and, again, family members, uh, own the other 10 percent. And, and we all have an interest in employing as much capital as we can at good rates, and, and we'll know when, when it can be done and when it can't be done, and we'll do there's no tax consequences to Berkshire at all. So, uh, uh, but the three partners will will figure out which mo makes the most sense. But when you think of what might be done to improve the grid in the U.S. and and the fact that we do have the capital, I wouldn't be surprised if we find good uses for for capital in Berkshire Hathaway Energy, uh, uh, and for for a long time in the future, Charlie. Yeah, well, I think there'll be huge opportunities in Berkshire Energy as far ahead as you can see to uh, deploy capital very intelligently. So I think the chances of a big dividend 
is approximately zero. Yeah. And we've not only got the money to an extent that virtually no utility company does, uh, and we, we've also got the talent, too. I mean, we've got a very, very talented organization there. So it's a very, it's a big field, and we've got shareholders that are capitalists, and we've got managers that are terrific, and, and you would think we'd find something intelligent to do over time in the field. So far, we have. I mean, we've owned it now for close to 20 years, and we've deployed a lot of capital, and, and so far, so good. I mean, it's... Uh, you look at you look at the improvements that can be made in our utility system in the United States. You're talking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, if not trillions. So, at, uh, you know, where else but Berkshire? You look for that kind of money. <laughs> okay, Station Nine. I'm Richard Surser from Tucson, Arizona. At Berkshire. What counts most are increases in our normalized per share earning power. And that was in our la your last letter. What is our normalized per share earning power, as you estimate it? Well, I would say that what you saw in the first quarter under these tax rates would probably be a, a reasonable guess uh, you know, obviously depends on the economy in any given year. I would say that would is a, a reasonable estimate, but we have firepower we haven't used, and we'll have more firepower as we go along. So we do expect that normalized earning power to increase over the, over time. And if if it doesn't, you know, one way or another, we're failing you because we're retaining those earnings. So. Uh, I don't see anything abnormal in our earnings, figured now at a 21 percent federal rate. But as I look at the five and a quarter billion in the first quarter, seasonally insurance is better in the first quarter, but seasonally most of our businesses, the first quarter is not the strongest quarter for us. I, I don't see anything abnormal in it. And then I think you can expect, you should expect, we expect substantial capital gains over time, in addition to what comes from the operating businesses. So how much you figure in for that, uh, I would say that the, the retained earnings beyond dividends of our 770 billion of equities, in other words, how much they are keeping from us, but that our share of the earnings, which can be used by them, whether it's Apple or American Express or Coca-Cola or, or Wells Fargo or whatever, I, our share you know, is, is in many billions of dollars annually. And one way or another, we think that those dollars will benefit us as much as if they'd been paid out. Now, in certain cases, they won't, but in certain cases, they'll, they'll excel the amount uh, in terms of market value created. So there's many billions of dollars we are not showing in our earnings that is being retained by the, our investees. And one way or another, I think we'll get value received out of those. So you can take 20 or 21 billion under present tax rates, present economic conditions, and, uh, and then we should get something from that, and we should get more when we get, we get 100 billion of cash invested, and we should get more as we retain earnings. So we hope it adds up to a bigger number as we go along. Charlie? <laughs> Well, I don't think our shareholders are going to see another increase in net worth of $65 billion in a single year. They may have to wait a while for another. But I don't think that I think eventually there another will come and then another. Just be patient. <laughs> yeah, if we don't regard the present situation as, um, you know, as disadvantageous, except we'd like to get more money out. But we, we like the businesses we have. We like the businesses that we own part of. We are not reflecting in the way we look at earnings. The dividends we get from those 
partially owned companies uh, falls far short of what they're going to contribute, in our view, to Berkshire's overall earnings over time. We wouldn't own those stocks otherwise. And they, so, uh, and you also like the Apple and airline stocks you've recently purchased better than the cash you parted with. Absolutely, yeah. And that's quite a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we won't pursue that further. Carol? <laughs> uh, this question is from Daniel Kane of Atlanta. Your annual letter this year pointed out that Berkshire has become a leader in real estate brokerage in the United States. Congratulations. That is a significant feat in less than 20 years. But let me mention a sticky point. If fees charged by stock market active managers are a drag on investor performance, I would argue that real estate commissions are no different and perhaps more detrimental, especially when one considers the lifetime effects of large, foregone, foregone upfront cash flows and the power of compounding interest. I would be pleased to hear your rejoinder on the points I've raised. Well, the, the purchase of a home is the largest financial transaction for a significant percentage of the population that they make. And, and uh, uh, people, a lot of people need a lot of attention. And you can show a lot of houses before you sell one. I would say this, if you look at our close to 50,000 agents now, uh, I think they make a good living, uh, or decent living, uh, but uh, I would say that, uh, that people who manage money uh, make a whole lot more money with perhaps less contribution to the welfare of the person that they're that they are dealing with. Uh, so I don't think that there are unusual profits involved in being a real estate agent. I don't think there are unusual profits involved in, uh, in, uh, in the ownership. We like it because it's a fundamentally a good business. But here we are doing 3% of all the real estate transactions in the United States, and we're making maybe $200 million a year, uh, which uh, well, we won't get into what the comparative efforts are in Wall Street to earn $200 million, but uh, it, I think I have to tell them about Roy Tolles a little bit on this. Roy Tolles, for example, Charlie's partner, many, many, many years ago, decided he uh, was going to want to buy a house in San Marino, and he's going to have a number of kids. So he sent his wonderful wife, Martha, out, and for six months he had her look at houses in San Marino, and this was many years ago, and, and if they were priced at 150000 she would offer, he had her offer 75000 and of course the real estate agents were going crazy. Because they were going to get something listed at 150 sold at, at 75, and then finally, when she found one that they both really liked, he had her offer something like 120, and the real estate agent was so happy to get a bid that was in the general area <laughs> of the offering price that he would work very hard on the seller to take that bid because he knew what <laughs> he did not want six more months of Roy bidding at the. Uh, lower prices. So you don't sell them on the first trip. Instantly, I had Roy buy a house from me sight unseen, because this was a guy that, <laughs> that knew human nature. You don't get rich. Real estate agency, you know, the people earn their money, and they earn it in a, in a, perfectly, in a perfectly respectable and honorable manner in terms of what they get paid. And, and uh, as in every single industry there is, there, you know, there, there can be excesses or mistakes or that sort of thing. But we will continue to buy more real brokers. In fact, we'll probably have another couple to announce before long. And uh, we will feel that uh, if we get to where we're doing 10% of 
the real estate brokerage business in the country and we're making six or seven hundred million dollars a year pre-tax, we will not think that's a crazy amount of money to make for enabling 10 percent of five million people to change their homes every year in the United States. Charlie? Well, the uh, commissions in real estate may get unreasonable if you're talking about $20 million houses. It seems a little ridiculous to pay a 5% commission on a $20 million transaction. But do any of us really care if the kind of people who pay $20 million for a house have a slightly higher commission? <laughs> the ordinary commission is, not, is, is pretty well earned. Yeah, we have a number of brokerage firms, so they, the highest has that, their average transaction in one section of the country would be close to $600,000 a unit, but the, in terms of the sales price of the house. But the, in most of our real estate operations, uh, the average price is, is more like 250000 or something in, in, the, in that area. And, uh, and you can show a lot of houses to make one $250,000 sale, and of course you split the listing company and the and the selling company are usually two different two different companies. So it's it's, it's uh, it does not strike me as excessive. And incidentally, it doesn't strike the people in the industry that that way easier. It has not as been particularly susceptible to online type substitution or something of the of the sort. The real estate agent earns their commission in most cases, but Charlie's had more experience with $20 million houses, so he, he will comment on that area. <laughs> okay, we'll have one more question before we break. Jonathan? Given the changes in consumer tastes in the food business and Kraft Heinz is already high margin structure, do you think the brands they own today plus new product intro introductions can together maintain or increase the current level of profits over the next 10 years without the benefit of acquisitions? Is there anything in their per portfolio besides ketchup that is enjoying growing demand? Well, in effect, you're asking me whether Kraft Heinz is a good buy. and We don't, we, we don't want to give it information on, on on uh, marketable securities like in that manner, but uh, yeah, there there are there are a number of items besides ketchup that enjoy growing demand, um, and some vary quite a bit by geography. There's enormous differences in the penetration of various products in the in the portfolio. Uh, consumer packaged goods are still a terrific business in turn return on invested assets and you know but the population worldwide grows fairly smally and, and at a fairly, a fairly minor rate and uh, people are going to eat about the same amount and there is some more willingness to experiment you know or go for uh, organic products of the sort it's a very good business and and uh, there are new products coming out constantly. Uh, it's not one where you're going to get terrific organic growth, but it never has been. And, and uh, you know, I like the business, and we own 26 and so percent of it. Uh, uh, but there are there are a number of items within Kraft Heinz that, that uh, enjoy pretty fairly healthy growth. That, uh, and I think you'd find out that most food companies, and I think you'd find very good returns on invested, on tangible net assets at those businesses. And with that talk about food, we will now break for lunch, and we will come back in about an hour, and uh, look forward to seeing, join, rejoining you. Hello and welcome back to Yahoo Finance's coverage of Berkshire Hathaway's annual meeting live from the Century Link Center in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm Andy Serwer here with my co-host Jen Rogers. And we're going to be with you for the next hour. We have all kinds of great guests from uh, Berkshire director Ron Olson to actress Glenn Close. It is going to be a fun hour here as everyone gets a little lunch break upstairs. Yeah. Those guys have been working hard. 
It is a long Q&A, and it's just halfway done. Yeah, what were the highlights for you? Well, you know, I think it was interesting when Buffett and Munger talked about uh, the relationship with China and the trade deficit. And, of course, it's a political hot potato right now, Jen. And Buffett said it's not such a bad thing that we get goods from China and we send them back paper. It's only when someone wants to win more than the other. And then, of course, Munger got in the act a little bit, too, and had a comment. So take a listen to that. It breached. The conditions in steel were almost unbelievably adverse to the American steel industry. You know, even Donald Trump can be right on some of this stuff. Uh, Charlie always getting in a lot of zingers. If this is your first time watching, that's kind of like how they set it up sometimes. Right. Like uh, Warren answers the question and then, and then Charlie the, just the gets the in there. All right, so Jim, what, what about you? Um, I was really interested about uh, the Wells Fargo uh, question that came about an hour in uh, on Wells Fargo. Uh, Charlie also getting a little bit of a zinger there. But before that, uh, Warren Buffett really making uh, impassioned backing of Wells Fargo, which of course is kind of beleaguered uh, given all the issues that they've been having. Having, but he says he really likes Tim Sloan. Right. He's sticking with this stock. Uh, Charlie Munger, though, saying uh, that basically after you've had something bad happen, you're a pretty good bet because you're going you're to write that ship and you're not going to do the same thing again. And he said that uh, he thinks that Harvey Weinstein has improved behavior. Okay. okay. So the, his analogy a was that maybe. if you've had like a scandal, then you're not going to have another scandal. I guess that follows. Uh. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about um, something we discussed earlier this morning, Jen, and that is what was going to be the first question of the day. Carol Loomis, the veteran journalist, always asked that question, and it became a little parlor game for us to try to figure out what she was going to ask. She likes to do the toughest question and the first question that's the most salient. And I think we were all wrong. We were both wrong. And, and we and need Miles. to point out that Miles was also wrong so as well. But what did here, you do? You uh, said I had said that uh, maybe she was going to go and ask something on General Electric, on GE, because right. so many people have been speculating. Yeah. Uh, would uh, Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway get into it? What was your guess? I said uh, Wells Fargo. You know, why do you still own it? And then Miles said Apple. Apple. You said you never own it, and now you're such a huge shareholder. But let's find out what Carol Loomis really asked. The question came from William Anderson of Salem, Oregon, and he said, Mr. Buffett, you have previously said that there are two parts to your job, overseeing the managers and capital allocation. Mr. Abel uh, and Mr. Jane now oversee the managers, which leaves you with capital allocation. However, you share capital allocation with Ted Weschler and Todd Combs. Question, does all that mean you are semi-retired or if not, please explain. <laughs> I've been semi-retired semi for decades. <laughs> uh, the answer is that uh, I was probably, well, it's hard to break down the percentage of the time that I was involved in what now uh, the jobs that are now done by uh, uh, Ajit and, and Greg, and in the case of investing, uh, the sub part of the job that is done by Ted and Todd. Ted and Todd each manage 12 or 13 billion dollars. So in total, that's 25 billion. And we have in equities 170 some billion probably now, and 20 billion in longer term bonds, and another 100 billion in cash in short term. So uh, they're managing 20, 25 and doing a very good job. And I still have the responsibility, basically, uh, for the other $300 billion. Uh, so. so he's still busy. Uh, a little bit of a tongue-in-cheek way to get at the succession issue, certainly. Exactly. And I love the fact that, you know, I basically do nothing. You know, <laughs> I mean, I don't think that's quite the case. He's an extremely busy guy. Yeah. No anyway. Joke. Interesting. We were all wrong. All right. Joining us now is someone who knows a lot about Berkshire Hathaway from a lot of different angles, as you'll soon hear. Jeff Towson, professor at Peking University in China. Jeff, great to see you. Great to be here. Thanks. So can you talk to us a little bit about why you're here and how you're involved with Berkshire Hathaway? 
Well, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm directly involved, but Peking University, where I'm a professor in Beijing, for the last couple of years, we've, we've taken about 20 students per year from the MBA program, undergraduate master finance, and we bring them out to Omaha, and uh, it's part of a Q&A with many schools, but for the last couple of years, what's happened is after Q&A, Warren has sat down with the Chinese students. Oh, and right there, you can see, Jeff, right? Yep, that's Right, this was uh, from February, so a couple months ago. And he spent a couple hours each time just talking and having lunch with the students from China. And I mean, the students are ecstatic. They're on the edge of their seat. They, they bring questions prepared. They write up the whole thing in English and Chinese. It goes out on social media, and it's, it's turned into a really nice thing for the last couple of years. Uh, I think for a while, uh, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have been hugely popular, idolized in China. That relationship seems to be going uh, both ways now, though. We had uh, Charlie Munger talking about China. Talk to us about Berkshire Hathaway's, uh, the possibilities for that, them in China. Like, how big can it get? Right. I mean, both times Warren has made comments about certainly the Berkshire companies that are in China, mm -hmm. Coca-Cola, Dairy Queen. I mean, there's a Dairy Queen two blocks from my house. They use Warren's picture in the marketing. We keep hearing this. So right. Duracell and Coke and Dairy Queen. Now, I don't know any other country where the Dairy Queen does this. And, you know, every cherry Coke can in China, or most of them, it seems, have his face on there. So you go any little store little village and you'll see his face everywhere. So, you know, the Berkshire companies are doing well and it helps that he is so well known, revered, admired. Um, you know, outside of that, I, I mean, I have heard him say comments in the past that he was looking at various companies in China, real estate, insurance, the areas you'd expect. Uh, and that had a lot to do with just the scale of Berkshire. There's not that many markets they can go to at this point to make the size of acquisitions they want. So it's U.S. and China, maybe one or two others. Do you think it would be difficult, Jeff, for him to buy a really big company in China just because of the regulatory environment that we're in right now? Well, right now is sort of an interesting situation, particularly this year. And, and they alluded to this, you know, talked a little bit about it. You know, my take is pretty much the same, that, you know, China and the U.S., when it comes to business, is basically marriage without the possibility of divorce. There may be some arguments from time to time, but neither party is going anywhere. And, you know, big acquisitions, I think CEOs in China would line up to have Berkshire as a partner. And that's pretty much what happened with BYD mm -hmm. in the past. Now, didn't you sense, you told us that you sensed maybe that something might be brewing or that certainly there's interest by a comment that Munger made? Charlie Munger did mention China a bit. And, you know, Charlie Munger is an investor in Himalaya Capital run by Li Lu. Li Lu is very, very famous in China. When we, when we talk to students about, you know, investors, Li Lu is who they want to talk about. And I know his, his folks are in China all the time. They actually teach, Himalaya Capital teaches a course at Peking University down the hall from me. So yeah, there's a lot of interaction between Pasadena and China. Um, and I think Mr. Munger's involved in that to some degree, but I, I don't know specifics. What are you looking forward to this afternoon? Is there anything else that you haven't heard that you want to hear? I'm hoping Charlie will cut loose a little bit more. He yeah. was a little bit, I like when he's not so friendly. And, you know, he had a couple. He dabbled of, in it, but he didn't go full guns. Not and I'm, I'm waiting for one real shot. But, full yeah, Charlie. He was, he was actually a little bit more talkative than usual, though. He, he was speaking more. I, I didn't hear the, I have no comment, I have no yeah. comment. But then right. within the talking, it was, it was strangely polite. You know, it's... Um, a couple of times he said, he said, I don't want to answer that question or, you know, to, right. to, to warn. But there right, was, we got, maybe the gloves will come off. It was a little bit. There are a couple zingers, but I mean, I want, I want like 100 percent, like both barrels, at least one time. And Jeff, you've also been affiliated with Columbia University, which has ties to Buffett over the years. Can you talk about that? Well, I was a, I went to business school there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's a long history of Ben Graham, Warren Buffett, a lot of the value investors, Mario Gabelli, uh, they were, you know, he's here as well. And there's a contingent from Columbia Business School here, which is pretty much every year. Uh, you know, a lot of what I'm doing in China, I teach about legendary investors, Warren Buffett, Ben Graham, Seth Klarman, uh, Phil Fisher. And I'm pretty much copying Columbus Business School. I mean, I'm taking the curriculum they have developed over 60 years and sort of readapting it to China. And it, 
the classes are very, very popular. I don't think it's me. I think I think the subject merit matter is very, very popular. But he's pretty popular. Yeah, right? I mean, you're really not uh, picking yourself up here. You're like one of the most popular people on LinkedIn in China, right? The only social network there is. I think I'm number one, but I don't I don't know what that means. You know, it doesn't mean they yeah. like what you're saying. It just means someone's clicking at some point. That may not. It's pretty good. Be all it's cracked up to be. All right, Jeffrey Townsend, Peking University, thanks Thank so you. much. Uh, now we want to give you a quick peek at an event we held here in Omaha yesterday with a group of Chinese investors. Um, I'm really honored to be here today. Actually, uh, we did of uh, international collaborations with a lot of Chinese academic institutions, private sectors over the past probably 15 years. And thanks to our leadership, actually our visionary leadership from our Chancellor Gold. And uh, we have been working on this, spend a lot of efforts and resources to develop this area. So during the past 15 years, we have a relationship with Chinese Academy of Sciences, Tianjin Cancer Hospital, Shanghai Tengji uh, University, and others, a lot of them. And then we have, during the past 15 years, with the uh, assistant from Chinese Scholarship Council, they have trained about more than 250 PhD students here, and many uh, visiting scholars from China. A lot of them are physicians. So personally, I have been engaged in training of more than 85 physicians from China. Uh, uh, most of them has been returned to China to their home institutions, and then they uh, learned what they have learned here and applied all this into uh, to China to patients. Um, all these 85 physicians, they came from more than 30 different hospitals. Those 30 different hospitals are um, distributed across the country from 18 different provinces in China, and then. Let's do a simple math. So in China, the hospital is usually pretty big. Mm -hmm. Each hospital about 2,000 beds. And then 30 different hospitals, we're talking about 60,000 beds, hospital beds. And then so our trainees, they are taking care of hundreds of thousands of patients from those hospitals. They have 60,000 beds. In comparison, the hospital in University of Nebraska Medical Center um, which is the largest hospital in Nebraska, they only have 600 beds. So that's Big about 1,000-fold, I mean, 100-fold differences. So University of Nebraska Medical Center and the Buffett Cancer Center really make a significant impact on the patient care in China. Uh, during the same process, they also recruit a lot of patients, actually, based on the patients coming to Buffett Cancer so Center. So being treated here in the US. I'm wondering, like, how is the, the Buffett brand, because you have that name as yes. well, thanks yes. to this large donation, does that help draw not just students, but also patients here? Yes. Thanks uh, for Buffett family's uh, huge donation, and then thanks to our leadership. So we really uh, brand our names to China. Uh, Ten years ago, may not have many people know Omaha, where Nebraska is. And then, however, right now, if you go to uh, China, a lot of cities, you know Nebraska. A lot of patients coming to us for treatment, for diagnosis. We have seen increased number of patients who come to Buffett Cancer Center. One is uh, based on Buffett's name, and then the second one, they have very strong national-wide renowned uh, lymphoma uh, leukemia programs. Obviously, trade. Uh, with China is a right. huge issue. Do you have any thoughts on that in terms of tariffs, et cetera? Yes, I do. Now, I think we have to be honest, and I'm not, what, I'll, I'll just level with this audience that we do have some concerns working with China, because I, I was a Air Force for almost, member for almost 30 years, and we know that there is cyber activity going on, so I think the president was right to raise a concern to President Xi, saying we need to be we are having some of our technical secrets taken through cyber, and then we have some trade issues. I think countries deal honestly with each other in that regard. So I think that I don't fault the president for making this an issue, but tariffs itself, what I have learned that there's always secondary and tertiary effects that you don't, can't really plan for. So I'll give you an example. Well, if we put tariffs on China's raw steel, and China makes about 50% of the world's raw steel, but not on manufactured steel. Well, our manufactured steel companies now are paying much higher for their costs, and we've become non-competitive in the world in our manufactured steel. And actually, Chinese manufactured steel is now cheaper. So 
I don't think that was the intent of our president, but I think anytime you deal with tariffs, there are winners and losers in your own country, even if there's not retaliation. So it may help out the raw steel producers, but it hurts the manufactured steel producers. So I'm not a fan of tariffs. I think it hurts people in an unexpected way, and then it leads to retaliation moves. So we know that we now have some retaliation on our soybeans and, and meat products. So I, I think there's better ways to deal with this than tariffs. I think it's right to, that we make this an issue and have a discussion with our counterparts. But tariffs itself, I believe, ends up being counterproductive. It hurts our own consumers in both countries, frankly. Right. Are there ways then to accomplish these goals? I mean, yeah. prior presidents have, have tried. I mean, people talk and, and you know, but mm -hmm. there hasn't been much headway. On the other hand, trade between China and the United States on an absolute basis, never mind surpluses or deficits, continues to expand, right? right. So how do you address it? There may be other ways in the, like working through the financial sectors and going that route. Uh, but I would say this, we need to partner with China when it, when it comes to North Korea. And so I think it's challenging to say, we wanna work with President Xi and, and trying to denuclearize North Korea that I think is a threat not only to the Korea Peninsula, but also a threat to China, Japan, the whole region and America. I think we have a common ground to work on this. And I think we should maybe put our emphasis there. And I think well, we're trying to do this and then we're trying to do tariffs. I think because we're gonna, we need China's help to deal with North Korea in the in really limiting North Korea's access to ex, in, well imports and exports right. and financial support, it's hard to do that while we're also punishing China at the same time. So I think that I would have put my emphasis on trying to partner with China to deal with North Korea. That's my view. <laughs> and interesting, you know, the congressman was talking about trade with China, but he has to keep his eye also on trade relations with Canada and Mexico and NAFTA right. because mm -hmm. there are implications for the district, I'm sure, and then also with Europe as well. And we're also trying to negotiate all that stuff at the same time, right? right. So we just renegotiated an agreement with Korea, and I think it was a, the president did a good job with that. We ended up getting a better agreement, and I think, it was, and I think both countries are happy. We're now working on NAFTA with Canada and Mexico. I'm told that we're close to having that finalized, that they're ready to send the ministers uh, to do the final portion. And that's good. I'll tell you, NAFTA is extraordinarily important for Nebraska. A, a stat that astounds me, some of our counties in central and western Nebraska, the average farmer gets $50,000 in income from NAFTA alone. Hmm. That Just imagine if NAFTA went away, $50,000 in income for the average farmer, that's a lot of money. So I think and I think $3 billion alone comes to Omaha from NAFTA, for example. Wow. So NAFTA is a huge part of our, uh, because we're a huge export state. Right. And so we benefit from NAFTA because of our beef, pork, corn, soybean production, and ethanol. Ethanol's become a big export. Interesting hearing Congressman Bacon talking about trade. Everyone's talking about trade. It is top of mind right now. Certainly. We heard it in the arena. All right, coming up later in our halftime show, we'll talk with Jim Weber, the CEO of Brooks Running. Right now, we're going to send it up to Miles Udlin. He's in the press box with Berkshire director Ron Olson. All right, Jen and Andy, thanks so much. Ron, thanks for joining us. Um, first, I want to ask you, uh, you're coming up on your 21st year on the board of directors. Uh, that'll happen in August. What are the changes that you've seen both in the meeting and in the company over that time? Well, I think the one word description would be bigger. <laughs> Company is bigger, the meetings are bigger. I think this year we've got 42, 43,000 people here for this uh, meeting. I think the only meeting in uh, the country that makes money for in connection with its annual meeting. Uh, you know, the businesses have uh, continued to grow, those we had 20 years ago. Uh, and those that we've acquired since. So as Warren has clearly reported year after year, we, we continue the process step by step and we don't have uh, any magic. It's, it's a slow, steady, uh, constant focus on becoming more so. All right, and a, uh, a question that I think has come up a lot in the media and a question that I think a lot of shareholders have is succession at the company, who will replace Warren. Um, a couple of moves have happened over the last few years. Uh, Todd and Ted have come on as investment managers, and then we've had Ajit and Greg join as vice chairman of the board. Um, you've talked in the past about succession, the board's view on succession. How have those moves changed what the board is thinking or perhaps what Warren and Charlie are thinking or what you're thinking about the next steps for Berkshire out 10, 20 years? 
Well, uh, succession for the board is a regular topic. Uh, and we know what we would do if a bus hit Warren tomorrow. Uh, but I think to some extent the media has overplayed this whole uh, the vice chairmanship given to Gray Gable and to Ajit Jain. Um, this is not a bake-off for Warren's successor. Uh, to the contrary, I think people have missed one very important point. I see it uh, as very much uh, an ex extension of the Charlie and Warren show. Um, as you've taken note of with your first question, the greater size of Berkshire, it has become increasingly more difficult for one person, uh, like, namely Warren, to oversee not just the use of our capital, but the ongoing businesses. And while I think he's done a terrific job all these years, uh, it's obvious to him, as well as the rest of the board members, that uh, getting some help in that regard will extend this unique asset that we all share and want to extend as long as we can uh, by giving him a little more support and giving two very able people the opportunity to get to know a broader segment of the businesses than they had been operating themselves. And I think uh, I'm already seeing that. I mean, Warren would be the first to admit that, you know, there are things that he procrastinated on, didn't get done, that should have been done. He recognized that. Well, I've seen Greg and Ajit get things done and will continue to get things done. So uh, while obviously these are two very, very talented people, and if something happened tomorrow, they'd be in our plans. But uh, this is not uh, about, you know, the next CEO and a runoff between them. I, I, I really think more emphasis should be put on how this is going to help Warren and Charlie remain in the saddle. Oh. And I, you know, from my perspective, they both deserve to stay in the saddle for a long time. Neither one has deteriorated upstairs one iota. If anything, they've only become more able, more experienced, better judgment. Um, and, you know, given Warren's unique ability to communicate, to teach, to see the next big investment opportunity and take advantage of it, the patience they use in waiting for that opportunity, we want to extend that as long as we can extend it. Yeah. Well, as Warren said earlier today, it'll help him remain semi-retired, perhaps. Um, yeah, Ron Olson, I want to thank you so much uh, for joining us. We'll go back to the floor with Jen and Andy. All right. Thanks, Miles. That was Miles Udland with Berkshire Director Ron Olson. Let's go down to Yahoo Finance's Julia LaRoche on the floor with noted value investor Whitney Tilson. Julia. That's right. I'm here with Whitney Tilson, the founder of Case Capital, and he's now running Case Learning. Hi, Whitney. Welcome. Thank you. Now, you said that the biggest takeaway for you didn't necessarily happen in the arena. What was that? Sure. Well, the Berkshire, uh, concurrent with its annual meeting, always releases Q1 earnings, and uh, they were blowout earnings, and yet the new accounting rules require Berkshire has an almost $200 billion stock portfolio, and it just bounces around. It doesn't mean anything, but uh, some of their stocks were down this quarter. So Berkshire has to report their quarterly earnings, deducting losses of their bouncing around stock portfolio. So the headlines are Berkshire has a rare loss, you know, loses a billion dollars in the first quarter. And in reality, it was a blowout quarter. They reported $6.6 .6 billion of pre-tax earnings, driven by 130 percent gain in insurance, a 25 percent gain in manufacturing, a 12 percent gain in railroads. So you add it all up. Berkshire's pre-tax operating earnings grew 30 percent pre-tax. And then with the change in the tax law, Berkshire was a full taxpayer, so as one of the biggest corporate beneficiaries. Their tax rate dropped from 30 percent to 20 percent. So that means after 
after-tax earnings rose 49 percent for one of the largest companies in the world. That's just extraordinary. And I think people are going to look at the headlines and think it wasn't a good quarter. It was exact opposite. Now, you've been coming here for 21 consecutive yes. years now. So now you're not in the money management business now, but you're helping teach folks the next generation. Yes. What do you get out of coming here? Yeah, well, initially I came here because I was learning value investing. I was running my own little fund, and so I was coming here for investing lessons. And what I realized, though, over 21 years is, is I think I've gotten more uh, out of these meetings and going to other, like Charlie Munger's old Westco meeting, et cetera. I've learned more from these old guys outside of investing that's made a bigger difference in my life. Uh, um, it, you know, they've just been great role models. Um, and the things they teach about developing good habits and being super high integrity, never going close to any ethical lines. And Charlie's always riffing on avoiding calamities. He always says, all I want to know is where I'm going to die, so I never go there. And those are things that I've internalized over the years that have helped me think about my life differently, live my life differently. And even now that I'm not managing money professionally anymore, I still keep coming because who doesn't want to be a better human being and learn from wise old guys about that? So, in fact, uh, I'm writing a book about it coming out in August about, uh, you know, called Beyond Value Investing, Life Lessons from Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, little parentheses, and me, right? So, so this is my, I've written three investing books. Now I'm going to write a non-investing book about all, all the things I've learned from them uh, in life, worldly wisdom. Now, you've asked eight questions over the years. That's a lot of questions. So, it feels like more. Have you been counting? Uh, I would have guessed uh, over 21 years. It's probably <laughs> been a dozen or more, but probably more than anyone else is my guess. So I have to ask you, what question would you ask Warren and Charlie today? You know, um, I've, all, I've been curious. I, I, I like the fact that um, they're buying Apple and that, you know, even at their age, they're sort of expanding their investing horizons and being willing to buy, you know, a tech stock, right? Um, um, I, I've looked hard at a lot of the big tech stocks, and personally, I'm a little bit more of a fan of Google. I like Apple. Uh, I think Google's equally cheap, equally strong balance sheet, but it's just a better business model. They don't actually have to make things, uh, and I think they can grow more easily over the next 10 years. So I think it's, it's a little bit better business model with a bit higher growth rate, equally cheap as Apple. So when I saw, you know, Berkshire already has a $28 billion holding in Apple, and then they just bought another $12 billion, which is already up a couple billion just since they bought it. So it's been a great buy. On the other hand, as a shareholder, I, I actually would have liked to see them add $12 billion of Google to the $28 billion of Apple. So I don't, they don't like talking about their stocks. I don't think it would be worth asking the question here at the meeting, because I think they'll sort of punt on it, because maybe they w do want to buy Google someday, maybe at a better price, right? So they won't really talk about it. But if I were sitting one-on-one -on -one off the record uh, with Mr. Buffett, uh, I'd want to hear his thinking on that because I come out differently than where they came out, I think. All right, that's Whitney Tilson of Case Learning. Back to you guys. Julia LaRoche, great interview there. Really interesting to hear Whitney's thoughts. Now we are moving on from supermodel to super mogul. Kathy Ireland joins us. Her lifestyle company, Kathy Ireland Worldwide, is a multi-billion dollar lifestyle brand and Warren Buffett has been critical in her success. Great to see you again. Well, thank you. Thank you, both of you. It's wonderful to be here. And thank you for bringing this Berkshire Hathaway shareholders meeting to everyone. It's I mean, wonderful. around the globe, it right. is fantastic. Uh, Kathy, what brings you back year after year? Uh, we love it. It's an extraordinary education. We come here with the Blumpkin family of Nebraska Furniture Mart and uh, Irv Blumpkin, best friends with uh, Mr. Warren Buffett. And it's an education. So what I learn from listening to Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger, I get to bring to our team. And uh, for WISE, we implement what we learn because there's some wonderful advice. Can you talk about your business? Where does it stand today? What are the opportunities? Our business is growing. It's the 25th year of our brand. We started in 93 with a pair of socks. And we're here with that Nebraska Furniture Mart. We have our partners in Case Goods, Michael Amini, Kathy Ireland Home, Larson Jewels, which is part of Berkshire Hathaway, Pacific Coast Lighting, Nurison. And then beyond uh, fashion, diamonds, we have a millennial team at Kathy Ireland Worldwide. Our original team, we've been together 29 years, and uh, the younger generation yep. 
They're um, instrumental in working on, our company will always be private, but they're responsible for a company called Level Brands on the New York Stock Exchange, LEVB. And everything from entertainment, experiential, uh, Kathy Ireland Health and Wellness, we're working with a company called Isodial, um, be true. Yeah, Kathy I want to jump into wellness. this because it's so, cannabinoid, right? It, it is. It, it's hemp. Yeah, what is that about, it's Kathy? CBD. Uh -huh. uh, we use no THC. Oh, okay. And okay. so if you think about, we give our children grapes and grape mm. juice, but not the wine. And oh, you see. get the, the mm. good benefits of it, the healing benefits of it. And the vision of our company, it's teach, inspire, empower, make our world better. We serve the Millennium Development Goals. We have 10 of them that we work with, and every company with whom we work signs up for one of them in a meaningful way, whether it's fighting human trafficking, supporting our vets, combating diseases. Uh, as you said, you started with a pair of socks, and one Did. thing that you credit uh, Buffett for, or you say Mr. Buffett, I like that a lot. So Mr. Buffett went, Mr. Buffett. that uh, he got you kind of out of just thinking about fashion, yes. broader, but still a, for a large part of it is a, is a retail uh, right. business. How do you operate in the retail world right now when Amazon is just mm. seems to be disrupting so much? I, it's so critical how we work with our retail partners with the click versus brick. And mm. there are new and innovative ways in which we can do this. We partner with our retail partners very strategically. We have proprietary programs where we share revenue if somebody purchases online for certain products within a certain radius. We come up with incentives. We're very engaged with our retail partners and we built our brand grassroots. Something that Mr. Buffett says is that the independent channel will always remain competitive against the big box. And I believe this to be true. I, yes, internet has changed everything, but there's something special about that independent retailer. And we've just got to work ever stronger, ever more vigilantly and efficiently. And there's wonderful creative ways to really make it, it an experience and draw the customers in. Kathy, shifting gears a little bit, I want to ask you about the Me Too movement, yes. both from your former career as a model and now as a female executive. Do you see this as a real reckoning for America in a time where we need to change behavior? You know, I was speaking with a young lady, 15-year-old girl here on the floor today, uh, Cecilia, who shared with me that she wants to be a model. And something that I shared with her is, be alert, and um, and, and yes, I, I do see this, this movement growing, and I think it's wonderful that we're having these conversations because unfortunately, there will always be predators out there, and it's so important for young people to understand their value and to put boundaries in place to protect them because they will be challenged, and to, first of all, try everything not to put yourself in a compromising situation, but get out of there if you are in one. And something I'm so grateful for in my life is to have parents who always encourage me that I could do anything for a living and to walk away from a situation that would dare to compromise. Kathy Ireland uh, running the gamut from uh, Me Too to Amazon to Mr. Buffett. It's great to see you here. Well, thank you. Thank you and so again, much. Thank you for bringing this to the world. We so appreciate Thanks, it. Thank Kathy. you. Uh, let's head back to the arena right now and Miles Udlin, who is with Robert Miles, a noted Buffett authority and author. Thanks, Jen. Um, Bob, thanks so much for joining us. I want to first ask, you've been coming to this meeting for a long time. We heard Ron Olson talk about how it's mostly just gotten bigger. Uh, what's your view on how you've seen it change over the years? Well, it indeed has gotten bigger, like Ron said, but it's, I'm also seeing for the first, well, the last few years, a very a large Asian contingency uh, discovering Warren Buffett it's being translated uh, simultaneously in Mandarin, so obviously that's translating into more attendance. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to talk a little bit about your work and your study of Warren Buffett. Uh, you teach a class about the what you call the genius of Warren Buffett. As a manager, now a lot of people I think view Warren Buffett as, a, as an investor. Do you think that those two skills are a lot different? Do you think they're related? And how would you define his managerial prowess uh, against his skills as an investor? Actually, he's wildly heralded as the greatest investor ever to live, but he's also should be 
known for being the greatest manager. His most proudest accomplishment, he told me, was that in 47 years of being CEO of Berkshire Hathaway, he has not lost one subsidiary CEO to a competitor, and that's his most proudest accomplishment. And when I asked him how he would measure his successor, he said if he or she too could say, I never lost a sitting CEO of a subsidiary business to a competitor. Mm -hmm. Now, how would you, maybe one or two principles that you have found in your work that Buffett tends to follow that maybe created the situation where he didn't lose a CEO for almost five decades? Well, th this is a group of managers who don't want to be micromanaged. So he leaves them alone. They're able to call him as often or less as they wish, but uh, they, they are to send a monthly financial statement, and that's the only requirement that he has of them and any major capital expense that they are going to experience, he wants to know about. And every other year, he wants them to name their successor. Uh, if something happened to them, they have somebody to put in place to take over their role as CEO of the subsidiary business. Um, now, I want to, you know, your book first came out, The Warren Buffett CEO, in 2002, I believe. Uh, been 16 years since then. How, or has Buffett's uh, view on manager, uh, managing, rather, not changed over that time? Or has he made uh, evolutions in the last decade and a half? Yeah, his says his investment principles are principles because they do not change. And what I have found in the CEOs that have been added since I wrote the book they're the same cloth and fabric as all the ones that I profiled in the book. He tells them to forget that they've sold the business to Warren and to keep running the business as if this was the only asset they and their families owned. And uh, he will forget he bought it and he hopes they forget they, they sold it. Yeah, now speaking of CEOs, we have to talk about Warren Buffett, the CEO, and succession at Berkshire Hathaway. I think a lot of shareholders are thinking about it. A lot of people are discussing it, uh, either here at the meeting or on the side leading up to it. So what's your view on succession? Um, maybe who do you think will be the next CEO of Berkshire Hathaway? And what are the changes that they've made in terms of bringing in Ted and Todd and adding members to the board in the last few years signal to you about where the leadership of Berkshire Hathaway might be headed? Well, he said early on that he really admired the GE model, where Jack Welch was put in place and given a 20-year uh, runway of which to run GE. So he would like that model to be followed at uh, Berkshire Hathaway. So it really depends when he retires, which he says will be about five years after his death. And then he's going to communicate to the board through regular seances. But the, uh, it's already in place. His job will be split into three parts. There'll be a, a non-executive chairman of the board, most likely his son, Howard Buffett, who's on the board. There'll be a CEO in charge of asset allocation, already in place with uh, Ted and Todd. And now there'll be a CEO in charge of operations, most likely to be Ajit and Greg all depending on when he retires, which we as shareholders hope is a long, long time away. Yeah, sure. And now, uh, very quickly, I want to get your thoughts on Apple, a company that Berkshire Hathaway didn't own just two years ago, and now it's one of their largest holdings. I think it's their largest holding, in fact. Uh, added to it just yesterday, or news came out, they added to it yesterday. You were skeptical about a year ago of why they bought it. They've roughly doubled their stake since then. Um, how have you kind of changed or evolved or thought more about their position in Apple? Well, I actually went around the world this summer, and I visited eight countries, and what I observed in the countries that I visited is there's an addiction shared by all countries, no matter their social economic level, and that addiction is the smartphone. So I began to see what Ted and Todd may have saw initially, making their billion-dollar investment before Warren followed them into Apple, that this is a moat that is not going away and is an addiction shared by the world. Yeah, and I think moat was one of the operative words of the morning. Uh, Bob Miles, thanks so much for stopping by. Jen and Andy, back to you. All right, thanks a lot, Miles. You know, there are a number of Buffettologists out there, Buffett experts, and Bob Miles 
is probably the foremost of them. Uh, it was uh, very interesting to hear his thoughts. I love it. I do think moat is one of the themes. And, and uh, Charlie said he's not going to build an actual moat. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. <laughs> anyway, Jen, a popular booth here on the floor is Brooks Running, and Julia LaRoche is with CEO Jim Weber. Julia. I'm with Brooks Running CEO Jim Weber. Jim, welcome. Thank you. It's good to be here. Oh, sorry. I've messed that up. Can we do that again? Sorry. No I should have. No worries. Sorry. Okay. I'm with Brooks Running CEO Jim Weber. Jim, welcome. Thanks, Julia. It's good to be here. All right, so tell us the benefit of being a Berkshire Hathaway owned company. You know, here's the business side of it. The truth is, it's a great competitive advantage for us because we're trying to build a brand and a good business over the long haul. We're really focused on runners and all who run all around the world. And having Berkshire as a platform to build a brand from, it doesn't get any better because, you know, we want to make our numbers every quarter, every year. We work hard at that. But the real focus is, is our brand getting stronger year after year, and, and the support from Berkshire to build our brand is total. So it's a real advantage for us. Now, we have some special limited edition sneakers here. Show us what we have. So this is our number one selling shoe, the Adrenaline. And uh, we, we really deck it out with probably two of the best celebrities in investment. This shoe is the left-hand shoe, and we've got... We've got Charlie Munger in this one, and Warren's on the, the other shoe on the right, but the Adrenaline is one of our best-selling shoes of all time. It's a great running shoe, and we do a Berkshire Hathaway special edition just for this weekend. Now, I know you all just had your, a record quarter, your most profitable quarter. How were you able to find that success? You know, it's a really interesting time at retail in the consumer world because there's so much choice for everyone. And, you know, we decided when we stalled, running slowed down a little bit in 2015 and 16, we doubled down in performance. We reinvented our product line and we're distinguishing ourselves right now. You know, people have so many choices and right now our product is fantastic. All new technology, all new design, and, and I think uh, runners are choosing Brooks. So it's an exciting year for us right now. Well, you just mentioned a topic that everyone's talking about in retail, especially specialty retailers, sports apparel company, uh, stores closing. So where are you finding success in terms of selling your sneakers? Are you finding that it's online, in store? Retail in our category, I think, is stabilizing and settling out a little bit. In 2016, we lost over 800 stores globally to bankruptcy and closure, but it settled out in 17 and 18. And so right now, our best retailers are actually doing really well. And many of them have gone omni-channel. So the, the direct-to-consumer business continues to grow for us and many of our retail partners, and even the small specialty shops. They're testing home delivery. Many of them are very active in social media and creating running communities. So retailers are are evolving and, and we're trying to support and help evolve with them. But um, retail is good right now, I would say. It could be better, but it's good. You know, a lot of the major shoemakers have partnered with celebrities. And when I think of Brooks Running, what I'm recently thinking of is that Boston Marathon and Desi Linden's finish. Tell us how that's been helping your business. It's inspiring. Desi Linden has been focused on Boston for many, many years. She finished second a few years back. But that victory for her was epic, and, and it was a grind, and she earned it, and she raced it, and, and won it. So for us to be associated with her, I think she's going to inspire thousands of young runners, hopefully boys and girls. But it's just a great story, and, and, and a story like that, first American woman in, in maybe 33 years to win in Boston, it inspires a lot of people to get out and run. Thank you so much, Jim. All right, back to you guys. All right, are you running tomorrow morning? There's a race here. There's a 5K, Jen Rogers. I'm like a maybe in the entrance. I have my shirt and I brought my running clothes. Are you running? I am running. I signed up and it's a great thing. I mean, it's, you know, the party continues. All different kinds of people, people from around the world wearing different outfits. Actually, I heard the theme is rock and roll. And so I was Great in theme. line with an executive from the Oriental Trading, which is one of the Berkshire companies, and he said he had an Elvis suit. <laughs> and I said, well, then you got to wear it. If you got an Elvis suit and there's a rock and roll race, you got to put it on. But, you know, there's a lot of Brooks stuff down there. Yeah. $17 Brooks Berkshire Hathaway I, um, socks. I have to admit that I did buy <clears throat> the $17 uh, Brooks socks, the most expensive socks I've ever bought, and I can't wait to wear them. Have you gotten anything on the floor? I got those socks, and uh, I also did stop by at the Fruit of the Loom 
place to buy some intimates. <laughs> is that the right word? It is. I think you could, I mean, I just, I, you got the boxers, right? Yes, boxers. Yeah, Yeah, I got the boxers right. also. Okay. Uh, I got that. You got to get the C's candy, a couple things at Borsheim's, you know, right. it's all good. Right. So we are about 15 minutes away now for when we think the uh, afternoon session of the Q&A is going to start. I think it was interesting uh, listening to Whitney Tilson and Julia talk there uh, a lot more about Apple and also Google. I think that people were expecting that there would be more more conversation or more questions maybe around Apple. Will we get that this afternoon? I mean, I think so. You know, it's, it's a company that everyone cares so much about. And, you know, Berkshire is such a large shareholder now and they increase their position. The stock is up. The market capitalization is getting close to a trillion dollars, Jen. And, you know, it's a consumer facing company. Everyone has the iPhone. And of course, Buffett said he was never going to own a technology company. And it wasn't until Todd Combs and Ted Westerler came on board as his investment advisors that, you know, he was doing it and that he made that purchase. And of course, it was actually their decision. Yep, it's hard to believe that that uh, first purchase was made, what, Q1 2016, and how fast that's become so big for them. Uh, one question that seemed to get a lot of attention uh, from people was the question on guns uh, that uh, Andrew Ross Sorkin asked. Uh, let's take a listen to that. I should say this may be one of the most pointed questions I've ever received for you. But you've so. elected to give it, though, anyway. But, but I did. <laughs> The shareholder writes, I have watched the movie every year at this meeting when you testify in front of Congress on behalf of Solomon as the symbol of what it means to have a moral compass. Investors are increasingly looking to invest in companies that are socially and morally responsible. So I was disturbed when you were asked on CNBC about the role that business could play in sensible policies around the sales of guns. You said you didn't think business should have a role at all and you wouldn't impose your values on others. I was even more surprised when you said you'd be okay with Berkshire owning shares in gun manufacturers. At this meeting years ago, you said you wouldn't buy a tobacco company because of the social issues. The idea that Berkshire would associate with any company as long as it isn't illegal seems at odds with everything I think you stand for. Please tell us you misspoke. Well, <laughs> let's... Let's explore that a little. Uh, should, it, should it be just my view or should it be the view of the owners of the company? So if I decide to poll the owners of the company on a variety of political issues, and, and one of them being whether, you know, Berkshire Hathaway should support the NRA, you know, I know if a majority of the shareholders voted to do it or if a majority of the board of directors voted to do it, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't accept that. I don't, I don't think that the, my political views, I don't think I put them in a blind trust at all when I take the job. And I, in the election of 2016, I raised a lot of money. In my case, I raised it for Hillary, and I spoke out in various ways that were quite frank. But I don't think that I speak, when I do that, I don't think I'm speaking for Berkshire. I'm speaking as a private citizen, and I don't think I have any business speaking for Berkshire. We have never, at the parent company level, we have never made a political contribution. You know, uh, I may go, and I don't, I don't go to our suppliers. I don't do anything of that sort where I raise money either for the school I went to or for a political candidate I went to or anything else. Uh, and I don't think that we should have a question uh, on the Geico policyholder form. Are you an NRA member? You know, and if you are, you just aren't good enough for us or something. That I think I, I, I do not I, I do not believe in imposing my political opinions on the activities of our businesses. And if you get to what companies are pure and which ones aren't pure, I think it is very difficult to make that call. But, um, it's a very interesting conversation about mm -hmm. guns, and obviously it's something that's taking place at all levels of society. Companies, individuals, um, the regulatory process, lawmakers, et cetera. Interesting to hear those guys talk about that. Yeah, definitely. All right, shifting gears, Julia has now moved over to the Nebraska Furniture Mart, and she's with the chairman, Ron Blumkin. Julia. I'm here with Ron Blumkin, the chairman of the Nebraska Furniture Mart. Ron, welcome. Thanks, Julia. Now, your grandmother, Mrs. B, 
The founder of the Nebraska Furniture Mart, she did a handshake deal 35 years ago with Warren Buffett. So tell us a bit about who she was. Well, my grandmother, Mrs. B, immigrated from Russia. Uh, she actually tells a great story. She tried to, she had to get out of Russia. It was no choice. And she actually bribed a border guard with a bottle of vodka, said, I'm just going to go across the border, and when I come back, I'm going to bring you a bottle of vodka. And that was the only time I'm aware of my grandmother ever didn't tell 100% the truth. She never came back. Now, what kind of businesswoman was she? Well, when she was in Russia, believe it or not, as a late teen, she actually ran a small business for her boss. And she, she talked about it in terms of a big business. She actually had six people working for her. And remember, she's only a teen. And uh, even back then, she was, had great business instincts and was quite driven. But when she came to the United States, um, married, um, lived in Omaha, Nebraska, raised her family up until 1937. And then, of course, you might remember 1937 was the height of the Great Depression. And my grandmother, who spent her time prior to that raising the family, she got tired of the family, the neighbors, the country complaining about how tough times were. And uh, by then, her youngest child was high school, beyond high school age, actually a senior in high school. And she decided that she's going to show them. And she says, I'm going to uh, start a business, and I'm going to show you how to run a business. And with $500 of borrowed money in the basement of her husband's pawn shop, she started what is now Nebraska Furniture Mart. And it certainly caught the attention of Warren Buffett. What's been the benefit of being a Berkshire Hathaway-owned company? I can't begin to tell you all the benefits. Uh, first of all, having Mr. Buffett is not only a friend, but a business partner and a mentor has been incredible for me, my brothers, who are my business partners, uh, just the learning lessons and the simple philosophy of, uh, you know, integrity is, is what it's really all about. And you can lose money for the company, but not one shed of, uh, of honor or integrity. And just those simple kind of lessons. Um, plus, you know, having him there to bounce ideas off of, uh, which is very interesting because um, he'll never exactly tell you do this or do that, but he'll tell you stories based on what he's seen or what he's done kind of give you a clear path as to where, where you need to go. And by the way, speaking of Mr. Buffett, my grandmother, she adored him. She absolutely adored him. And um, when they did that famous handshake in uh, 1983, and, and again, uh, at the time, there were other offers at the, on the table that were higher. But uh, she was extraordinarily comfortable uh, with the idea that we could uh, sell the business to to Berkshire Hathaway, and she'd still be in charge, and she could still run it as she, she always wanted to. Well, Ron Bumpkin, chairman of the Nebraska Furniture Mart, thank you so much. May I also suggest that since it's still pretty early in the event, Nebraska Furniture Mart is offering special deals to our shareholders here in Omaha, Kansas City, Texas. Come on in. We want the business, and we love our customers. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we want the business. I, I got a couple candles there I'm just and some hand lotion. I'm it's just all, putting that out. in the name of capitalism. Good stuff. All right, you know, you never know who you're going to run into here at the Berkshire Hathaway Annual Meeting. Joining us now is award-winning actress and producer, Glenn Close. Glenn, great Hi, to see you. Hi, Andy. Nice to see you. I love Hi. your suit. It's a beautiful Thank you. blue is sort of the color here today, Same. right? Yep. We're all looking good like that. So... Uh, for people who don't know, you've been around here before. What brings yes. you to Berkshire Hathaway? Love of Warren, and um, who has become my friend, and and I just think, and Charlie, and you just want them to be here forever, and I want to be able to come here as much as I can to experience the phenomenon of those two men talking to this 40 thousand people silent yep everyone's I, paying attention it's amazing yeah i mean it's but amazing. you know it's interesting to me because you've been here a number how many years have you been coming uh, this here? is my third your third and yeah. and in a way you know it's sort of the same thing but it doesn't get old how is no. that 
Because, well, the world changes, and the, 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 they have very, very interesting questions. And even though I have to say I don't understand everything that they're talking about, uh, the fact that you, you, we, we've learned that Warren spends probably most of his time reading and thinking. So what, what his answers are worth you know, listening to. And, and um, I just find it remarkable. And then he'll defer to Charlie. And, and then we'll, we'll say three words. Right. <laughs> we'll get a joke. It's a great buddy we'll act, a, isn't it? It's a great buddy act. It We're really hoping is. for, uh, we had a guest earlier was, uh, saying he's hoping for some more Charlie action this afternoon. Yes, that right. we get some more zingers out of him. From this morning, uh, is there anything that stuck with you? Any like pearls of wisdom? Oh, well, I was interested in the, in the question that he said I can't, they basically said we can't answer it. And that was about um, investing in, in public. I mean, to me, it was like uh, infrastructure stuff, maybe. It is nice to see even they, I mean, they admit their mistakes and when they can't answer something. Yeah. And that's part of the whole teaching yeah. and learning from somebody that has flexible thinking, I think. Well, I think, I think the, the, the seeing Warren when he was working for Solomon Brothers and was so open and honest and inviting people to, to inspect every aspect of that company. And you know, expecting, he said, I don't, ex I don't, I don't uh, mind if people fail, but I, I do mind if they, if they don't um, treat this company with respect. You know? Well, so now you're talking about Solomon Brothers, Glenn, and then at first you said you don't really know anything about business. Uh -huh. You <laughs> sound like you follow business pretty closely, right? I mean, you're up I mean, on just, all this stuff. Just, no, I, mean, I wouldn't say I am, but I, I really care. I mean, the book I'm reading now is called Can Democracy Survive Global Capitalism? And I have to say to anybody who's watching, thinking that a book like that would be unreadable and boring, it is really, really interesting. And it's vital to understand where, why we are the way we are right now and what's pulling our democracy, you know, what, what forces, especially in the financial uh, side are, are pulling our democracy. So I'm, I'm learning a lot, and I, and I really care about it. Uh, before we let you go, besides reading uh, books, wh what are you up to these days? What do you got going on? Well, I just was checking. Um, I'm going to do a play in the fall in New York, which I cannot announce because they're announcing it this week. And then I shall do a, a movie in the beginning of next year. So, And I can't say what that is either. <laughs> but. Oh, you can't tell us what they're about. Whether they're good or bad? No, whether, the, <laughs> well, whether they're good or bad, I'm she assuming they're good. She hasn't done them yet. <laughs> right. But you can't talk about the nature of them, the title? Well, I'll, no, because to, um, to, to me, I feel like what I'm going to do in the fall um, is the kind of the fine, if for theater, it's um, what one must do, what, you know, where one must appear to be a truly hardcore New York actor. Oh. Mm. And you like so. to go back and forth between the stage and the screen. I do, yes. Right. And singing at Mets games. Are you going to be doing <laughs> that anymore? I really enjoyed that. It is baseball season, right. right? I would love to. Yeah, I love it. It's, it's again, I started it because it was so scary. And, you know, you think. Getting out there. It's yes. Shady Stadium at that point. Yes, right? be, yes it was. And then and because the echo was so huge that you start a sentence, it's, oh, say, can, oh, say, can. So you're a whole line ahead. <laughs> um, so the meeting's going to get going again. We've got more, if you can believe it, more questions. Uh, are you going to head back in? Yes. Yeah? I am. If you got to ask a question, what would you ask? Oh, my God, that's such an unfair thing to ask me. Uh, you know what you should do is go with Norma Desmond. No, I know what, what I'd ask that? him. Um, when can we sing again together? Because we've uh, sung again together. And I know he perfect. was worried about his voice. So, um, yeah, we, we have an act. You what was that tune that you sung? Do you remember? I, I'm trying to remember uh, what it was. We got, well, the first thing we sang together is got to laugh together. La, yes, da, da, da. yes. La, da, da. I'm not going to start singing. It's the story. Of, but what about, what about, I want to ask you about Norma Desmond uh, and Sunset mm -hmm. Boulevard, because that's the last time we saw each other. Actually, I saw Norma Desmond. I didn't see Glenn Close. We <laughs> sat down and talked. And what Norma Desmond coming here would just be oh my God. outrageous, right? It would be fun. I mean, have you considered that? Uh, <laughs> I don't, I would, it would be fun to do some sort of event with, with 
Warren. Right. Uh, you know, she could come back and visit the boy that she. That's right. Yes. But that story, that's that's fantastic. The boy who was washing the, win the windshield of her very yeah. dusty car. Right. Well, Glenn Close, <laughs> we look forward to actually finding out what that play in that movie is all about. When you can tell us, please come back well, and let us know. Thank you for having me. Thanks for stopping it's by. Wonderful to see you here. Great. All right, let's go over to Julia LaRoche. That's right. I'm, I'm here with uh, Guy Spear. He is the CEO of the Aquamarine Fund, and he also won one of those charity lunches with Warren Buffett several years ago and wrote a book about it. So, Guy, was the lunch worth it? It was absolutely worth it. It's the gift that keeps giving. I'm, it's paying dividends till today, I can tell you. And what did you take away from that lunch that was so valuable? You know, uh, just so much. I don't think I would have chosen to move to Zurich if I kind of hadn't gotten permission from Warren Buffett to do it. But perhaps an, the more important thing was the realization that wealth is, we all think of wealth and money as a leading indicator. It's actually a trailing indicator. What I noticed was how much Warren, even the billionaire that he was, gives to people around him. That included us at the lunch. But it also included, you know, he's got the, he had this reputation of, of being very stingy with money, with tips and things like that. He gave the staff at the restaurant, it must have been several hundred dollars. He's extraordinarily generous. He creates goodwill wherever he goes. All right, well, that's an important lesson. Back to you guys, Andy and Jen. Close and closer to the second half of the annual meeting. And Warren and Charlie are going to be making their way back onto the stage. Um, it's interesting, you know, it does seem like there was a lot of questions asked in the first half of the day. But believe me, there are plenty more questions to go. There are people from around the world. There are Wall Street analysts. There are journalists. All of them have tons more questions. So it's going to be an exciting, exciting afternoon. This isn't even uh, half over, right? Because we still have the business meeting. We're going to be back uh, as well in a, in after this uh, next section of Q&A uh, before the business uh, portion gets done as well. Uh, Andy, uh, we have uh, health cares come up. We had right. Elon Musk come up. We had guns come up. Right. We've had Trump come up. GE got mentioned. Yep. I'm trying to think of the first question of the second half. Well, we talked about Apple. That hasn't really been fleshed out. And I think there's definitely going to be something there. At least I would be surprised if there wasn't. And, you know, I think people will still ask more questions about trade. I, I do think that's a hot topic. And, and we haven't really gotten, you know, the real Trump question yet. And to my mind, you know, that's something that is right sitting there front and center, which is, Warren, you don't support Donald Trump at all, yet Donald Trump is the president. How do you operate a business in an environment where you don't see eye to eye with the president? Right, when we had that young kid get up um, and, and start off asking a Trump question, I thought maybe it was going there and then it, then it veered off into a uh, more substantial uh, question. But I do think that we could possibly get some of that and maybe people will get their uh, Charlie Munger moment right, in right, there. Right, exactly. Um, but you know, right now we have to you know, probably wait for uh, Glenn Close to get back into the uh, into the arena. <laughs> it was great to talk to her and have her stop by, and, and as well as all the different guests. I think it really gives you a flavor of all the different types of people, and we really could just go out into the crowd and, and get any number of people to come up, and they all have incredible stories. And as you can imagine, some of these people, Jen, bought shares of Berkshire Hathaway you know, 30 years ago, you know, they put in maybe $25,000, and that has amassed into and turned into a huge fortune. And they're all manner of millionaires out there. Um, and as we keep seeing, there's a lot of families. Uh, you know, I had said that I thought maybe the first question could be about GE, and we haven't gotten to talk about GE, but it did get mentioned, and that was in reference to 2008 and just some of the terms that they extracted from other companies during the financial crisis. And I thought it was really interesting, uh, Warren Buffett talking about, you know, they could have gotten better terms maybe, but in the end that could have been counterproductive. And sort of like the, his, his long-term thinking really comes to bear uh, in a lot of these questions. Right. Um, I, I do think there's a lot to talk about there. And also, you know, just getting back to this, the audience here and, and where all these people are from. And, you know, we... Yeah, do we Julia, have our map? I would yeah, love to Julia, see our map Julia again. Julia LaRoche was talking about the map earlier. And, and it's starting to really fin in, fill in because more and more people are checking in. That's the United States portion you can see there. Um, and you've really got people all over the place. 
and we're going to be able to show you different parts of the world. Let's pull back and maybe swing over to Europe. And there's Europe. We have people from, someone from the Middle East, someone from Africa, all over Europe. We get into India, you see that? And then there's Southeast Asia. It looks like a lot of people mm -hmm. from Indonesia and Thailand. And then, of course, um, China is there. Lots and lots of people from China. There are people from Japan. And you see the bottom right there? Whoop, we can pull back the other way. There's Guam. <laughs> it is. I asked did specifically. Did you meet the people? I didn't, but oh, I asked did. who was that? Is that a it mistake? A and they said, no, that's Guam. Very And that person or family may get the prize for biggest trip here because, you know, China may be farther, but you got a direct flight. Yeah. Right? Or at least a direct flight to the United States. Guam, you're definitely having well, Guam, more connections. Guam, you have a direct flight to the United States. Yeah. All right, we're going to head right back to the meeting. There, Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. Last year, for several years, I had a wonderful woman who carried this meeting off without a hitch, Carrie Soba, and she just had her third child here about a few weeks ago and decided that, that uh, she decided right after the last meeting that that, that was going to be her full-time occupation. Uh, and this year, uh, again, we've had everything carried off without me having to do anything without a hitch, and I would just like to have Melissa Shapiro stand up. We'll get a spotlight on her. Jay. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I can't believe it, how, how she does it. Uh, it, uh, it. It's just been, it's remarkable. I mean, we, uh, I just, tell her the date, and from that's all the help I am, and it goes on from there. So, Melissa, thank you. Okay, I think we next go to Station 10, and we will continue until 3.30, and we'll take a 15-minute break, and at 3.45, we'll convene the actual annual meeting. Station 10. Hi, I'm Teresa Ligiz Ligizinski. I'm from Omaha, Nebraska. And I have a question about Microsoft. You have gotten into the tech world with buying Apple. Um, you have Mr. Gates there. I'm just wondering why you've never bought Microsoft. Well, <laughs> in, the, in the earlier years, it's very clear it's, the answer is stupidity. But the, uh, <laughs> but it, uh, since Bill has, particularly since Bill has joined the board, but even, even earlier than that, because of our friendship, it would be, it just would be a mistake for Berkshire to buy Microsoft because if something happened a week later, a month later, in terms of them having better earnings than expected or making an acquisition, anything, both. Bill and I would incorrectly, but would be would be a target of suggestions and accusations, perhaps even that somehow he had told me something or vice versa. I stay away from. I try to stay away from a few things, just totally, because uh, the the inference would be drawn that that we might have talked. I might have talked to somebody about something. So I, I've, I've, told the, I've told the fellows that Ted and Todd, for example, that there are just a few things that are off the list uh, because they, there'd be a lot of people that wouldn't believe us if something good immediately happened after we bought it. And of course, we to buy a lot of stock, it can take six months to buy it or something of the sort. Uh, we just don't need it. Uh, but both that and my stupidity have cost us a lot of money. <laughs> uh, it's, a very, it's a good question, and, and uh, I, think, I think the answer makes sense. But Charlie? No, it's part of theology that a late conversion is better than ever, and you've greatly improved yourself. <laughs> Becky. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
All right, this question comes from Dave Shane. He says, Warren, you are a big believer in the U.S. political system, the financial system, and in every American. You've said that regardless of who is president, the economy and the U.S. consumer will continue to prosper over the long run. All that said, do you believe that people in this country are more divided today than 50 years ago, or is it just social media and media in general that blows this divide out of proportion? And if you do believe the divide has grown, what words of wisdom do you have to possibly help remedy it? Yeah, I would say this. Multiple times in my life, people have felt the country was more divided than ever, and I've gone through periods where people I knew and admired thought that because the other party was in, in uh, power, that the, that there never would be another election, that the Constitution would have. I've heard everything. Now, the interesting thing is, this paper from 1942, since then, there have been 14 American presidents. Just since my young venture into the stock market at 11, uh, I've lived under 14 of the 44 presidents the United States has had. Now, now, they call Trump 45, but they count Grover Cleveland twice. So there's really only been 44 presidents of the United States. And 14 of the 44 have been during this period when that $10,000 became 51 million. Seven have been Republicans, seven have been Democrats. One has been assassinated, one has resigned under pressure. Uh, it works, you know. It, 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 if you if you told me at the start, you know, that, that you'd have a Cuban Missile Crisis and you'd have you'd have nuclear weapons and you'd have a panic in 2000, financial panic and you'd have many recessions and you'd have war in the streets in the late 60s from a divided country, you'd say, why the hell are you buying stocks? And through it all, you know, America in fits and starts, but America really really moves ahead. And uh, uh, we are always, we survived the Civil War. I mean, I hate to think of having to do it that way. But this country, in only less than three of my lifetimes, if you go back three of my lifetimes, uh, you go back 263 years, I guess, and uh, Thomas Jefferson is 12 years old. And that's just three, and there was nothing here. It, you know, you've flown in from all over to Omaha today, and you flew over a country with more than 75 million owner-occupied homes and 260 million vehicles and the great universities and medical systems and, and everything. And it's all, it's all a net gain in less than three of my lifetime. So, and we've had these events uh, since, since I started buying my first stock. This country really, really works, and it, and it always will have lots of disagreements, and after every election, you'll have people feeling the world is coming to an end, and, you know, how could this happen? And I remember my future father-in-law in 1952, he wanted to have a talk with me before uh, his daughter and I got married. So kind of reluctantly, I sat down with him, and he, he said, Warren, he said, there's just one thing I want to tell you. He said, you're going to fail. Uh, he said, you know, the Democrats are going to get in, you know, they're going to take over the country, and you're going to fail, but don't feel responsible for it because it's not your fault. I mean, he wanted to absolve me from this feeling that when his daughter was starving to death, it was my fault. And, and I kept buying stocks and doing a little bit better all the time. And, but, and if the Republicans were in, it was okay, and it was because of them that I was doing well. And if it, they were out, forget it, it was all going to disappear. So I've, been, I've seen a lot of American public opinion over the years. I've seen a lot of media commentary. I've seen the headlines. And when you get all through with it, this country has six times the per capita GDP growth, uh, the GDP per capita that it had when I was born. One person's lifetime, six for one change. Everybody in this room essentially 
is living better in multiple ways than John D. Rockefeller Sr. was, who was the richest person, you know, in the world at the, uh, during my early years. And, and we're all living better than, than he could live. So this is a remarkable, remarkable uh, country, and we found something very special. <laughs> I would, love to be a, I would love to be a baby being born in the United States today. Charlie, okay, Charlie, you give the other side of this. Well, <laughs> <laughs> there's a tendency to think that our present politicians are much worse than any we had in the past. But we tend to forget how awful our politicians were in the past. I can, I can remember a prominent senator arguing with an absolute earnestness that mediocre people ought to have more representation on the United States Supreme Court. Yeah, he came from Nebraska. He, he, did, he came from Nebraska. <laughs> so uh, we're not quite as bad as that yet. Yeah. He, he succeeded my dad in the House of Representatives. One. Okay. <laughs> Gary. Yes, on reinsurance. Um, I know we've talked in the past about reinsurance not really being as attractive an industry in, say, the next 10 years as the last 10. But I don't think we've talked specifically about General Re. And I look this morning at the 10Q and I see General Re has grown nicely. I know there's been some changes in the, in the management. And I wondered if you could just give us a sense of what's going on at the company to bring about some of that growth and, and what looks like improvement. Yeah, well, the reinsurance business, I don't, I don't think I'd say that it's tougher than it was 10 years ago, but it, if you go back to 40 or 50 years ago, uh, it, was, it was not brutally competitive, I'll put it that way. Uh, um, and the Genry, uh, uh Tad Montrose, who did a fantastic job for us at Genry, retired, and, and uh, we have uh, under a jeet, and then Kara in addition, but under a jeet, the, uh, the focus of the place has changed somewhat, and it probably it probably is more growth oriented uh, than before. But I can assure you that anything associated with a jeet is also has underwriting discipline attached to it. But I, uh, there has, as you've correctly noticed. There's been some pickup, and uh, uh, I think I think actually we'll see the property casualty reinsurance business grow a fair amount, and the life business reinsurance business, and this is really the only place we do much in life, but that has grown very substantially ever since we took it over, uh, particularly and in, particularly internationally, and so that that part I like and and. Uh, uh, we will have a somewhat, I think we'll have a somewhat larger operation at Gen Re. But we have, we have various methods, as you know, of being in reinsurance. We do these huge bulk deals. That's why our net revenues are down this year. We did that $10 billion deal with AIG, which was the biggest deal in history uh, last year, and we don't have a repeat of it this year. We will be in the reinsurance business five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and 50 years from now, in my view, and we will have some unusual advantages that stem both from our capital position, our attitude toward the business, and the talent that we have. I, we have, we have an, a way better than average insurance business generally. We have some real gems that nobody really knows much about, and we have a very, very good reinsurance business that will be subject to more ups and downs than something like GEICO will be, which just moves ahead every year. Um, but it, it will be an important part of Berkshire. Charlie? Yeah, I, I would argue the part that any idiot financier can easily get into has gotten way tougher. And, and why wouldn't it? Charlie is my substitute for my father-in-law that was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, Station 11. Hey, Warren, Charlie. Thank you again for having us and, and having me. Uh, I just can't thank you guys enough and appreciate you guys enough for the body of work that you guys have delivered to us and the uh, exemplar example that you guys have set with your principles. Thank you. Charlie, you mentioned that Charlie, you've mentioned that if given the chance, or the same chance with a smaller capital base, you would still look for mispriced stock opportunities. Of course. Uh, <laughs> uh, and that would be determined through, obviously, what, what we call the, uh, the intrinsic value of the, or the, the company in question, an aggregate of the discounted future cash flows. Would you work the arithmetic using a fictional data set to illustrate the mathematical principia uh, to determine an intrinsic value um, and I'd hope you include the comprehensive metal, uh, mental model of the key metrics considered, any quali uh, qualitative assessments of the management, and any assumptions of its industry to determine the durability of its earning power. Uh, and Warren, uh, same, same to that effect, would you also demonstrate or illustrate a, uh, an arithmetic uh, problem set using with a significant capital base and provide the object lessons on how those have changed from a small to a large capital base? Well, I can't give you a formulaic approach because I don't use one. And I just mix all, I just mix all the factors and, and if the gap between value and, and price is not attractive, I go on to something else. And sometimes it's just quantitative. For instance, when Costco was selling at about 12 or 13 times earnings, I thought that was a ridiculously low value just because the competitive strength of the business was so great and it was so likely to keep doing better and better. But I can't reduce that to a formula for you. Uh, I like the cheap real estate. I like the competitive position. I liked the, the way the personnel system worked. I, I liked everything about it, and I thought, even though it's three times book or whatever it was then, uh, that it, it, it's worth more. But that's not a formula that anybody, if you want a formula, you should go back to graduate school. They'll, they'll give you lots of formulas that won't work. This is the longest we've ever gone in the Berkshire meeting without Charlie saying that getting to the point where he prefers Costco to Berkshire. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Andrew. We got a handful of questions relating to Apple. This is a, a bit of a mashup of a couple of them. Uh, Warren, you have bought in, in and sold out of IBM. You have praised Jeff Bezos but never bought Amazon. And you have doubled down on Apple. Can you tell us what it is about Apple? And given your sometimes critical views on buybacks, do you think Apple would do better spending $100 billion on buybacks or buying other productive businesses the way you have generally preferred? $100 billion is a lot of money. I used to think so. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, Apple has a incredible consumer product, which you understand a lot better than I do. Um, whether they should buy in their share, they shouldn't buy in their shares at all unless they think that they're selling for less than their, their worth. Uh, and if they are selling for less than their worth and they have the money and they don't see an acquisition that's even more attractive, they should buy in their shares. And I think that that's very because I think it's extremely hard to find acquisitions that would be accretive to Apple that would be in the 50 or 100 billion or $200 billion range. Uh, they do a lot of small acquisitions. Uh, and, you know, I'm delighted to see them repurchasing shares. We own, let's say we own 250 million or so shares. They have, I think, Four billion nine hundred and twenty-three million, or something like that. If you uh, and mentally, you can say we own five percent of it. But I figure, when you know, with the passage of a little time, we may own six or seven percent simply because they repurchase shares. And it, I find it 
we got an extraordinary product and ecosystem, and there's lots to be done. I th love the idea of having our 5% or whatever it may be grow to 6 or 7% without us laying out a dime. I mean, it, uh, it's worked for us in many other situations. Uh, but you have to have some very, very, very special product, and uh, uh, which has uh, an, an enormous wide, enormously widespread ecosystem, whom, and the product's extremely sticky, and all of that sort of thing. And they're not going to find 50 or 100 billion dollar acquisitions that they can make it remotely a sensible price that really uh, become additive to that. And they may, they may find it, who knows? But there certainly, as I look around the horizon, I don't see anything that would make a lot of sense for them uh, in terms of what they'd have to pay and what they would get. Whereas I do see a business that they know everything about and where they uh, uh, may or may not uh, be able to buy it at an attractive price when they repurchase their shares. That remains to be seen. Incidentally, that's one thing that I always enjoy. People, people say, well, you're talking your book or something if you talk. From our standpoint, we would love to see Apple go down in price. Uh, and, uh, if, it, they're going to, well, just put it this way. If Andrew and Charlie and I were partners in a business that was worth $3 million, so each of us had a million dollar interest in it. If Andrew offered to sell out his one third interest at 800,000 and we had the money around, we'd jump at the chance to buy him out. I mean, it's so simple, but people get all lost. And if he wanted a million two for it, we wouldn't pay it to him. <laughs> it's, it's very simple math, but it gets lost in all these discussions. And of course, uh, like I say, Tim Cook can do simple math, and he'd probably do very complicated math, too. So we, we very much approve of them repurchasing shares. Charlie? I think generally speaking in America, when companies go out hell-bent to buy other companies, they do, they're worth less after the transaction is made than they were before. So I don't think you have a general weight of wealth for American corporations to go out and buy other corporations. Averaged out, it's a way down, not up. And I think that a great many places have nothing better to do than to buy in their own stock, and nothing has advantageous to do as they can uh, as buying in their own stock. So I think we know pretty damn well what's going to happen to Apple. They'd be very lucky to, if there was something available at a low price that they could buy. It's I don't think the world's that easy. I think that. The, the reason these companies are buying their stock is that, is that they're smart enough to know that it's better for them than anything else. That, that does not mean we approve of every buyback at all, though. I mean, we've seen No, no, no. Yeah. I think some people just buy it to keep the stock up. And that, of course, is insane and immoral. But apart from that, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Greg. <laughs> Warren, if we look at the performance of your equity investment portfolio the last three to five years, some of the strongest performances come from Visa and MasterCard, which put up returns that were three to four times greater than American Express. Unfortunately, your holdings of the two names, which we assume were held by Todd or Ted, have accounted for less than 1% of stock holdings on a combined basis the past five years, while American Express has tended to be a top five holding, accounting for 10% of the portfolio on average and closer to 8% of late. Given that all three firms benefit from powerful network effects along with valuable brands, were there any particular reasons Berkshire did not ramp up its stakes in Visa and MasterCard to more meaningful levels, especially during those years when American Express was struggling? After all, you've shown a willingness to own several stocks from the same industry, holding shares in several competing banks, and buying stakes in all four domestic airlines in fairly equal amounts when you picked them up in late 2016. Yeah. When Ted and Todd, or either one of them, I won't get into which specifically, which one of them specifically uh, bought, or for that matter, they could both have bought Visa and Master Charge. Uh, they were significant portions of their portfolio, and there was no 
embargo or anything uh, on them owning those stocks because we had a big investment in American Express, and I could have bought them as well, and looking back, I should have. On the other hand, I think American Express uh, has done a fabulous <coughs> job, and now we own uh, 17 and a large fraction percent of a company that not that long ago we may have owned 12 percent. We've done it without spending a dime, and without, you know, it's, it's a company that, that, that has really done a fantastic job in a very competitive field where lots of people would love to take their customers away from them, but they have more customers than ever, and they're spending more money than ever. Uh, the customers are. And the foreign, the international growth has accelerated. The small business penetration is terrific. It's really quite a business. And, you know, we love the fact we own it. Like I say, it didn't preclude me from in any way from buying Master Charger and Visa, and if I'd been as smart as Ted and Todd, I would have. <laughs> Charlie? <coughs> well, we would have been a, little, a lot better in all of our stock banking if we could do it in retrospect. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but at the time, we have a big position in American Express, and there is one tiny cloud on the horizon of the payments processors, and and that is the system of WeChat in China. And so it isn't as though there isn't a little cloud somewhere off in the, and I don't have the faintest idea how important that cloud is, and I don't think Warren does either. No, no, payments, payments are a huge deal worldwide, and you've got all kinds of smart people working in various ways to change the payment arrangements. To and destroy the, what we have now. Sure, sure. And you've got some very smart people that, that you know, I am, the, the part, that are building a company, and American Express made a decision a few years ago uh, not to uh, bid as low as somebody else did to retain the Costco business. And I think Charlie and I disagree on this, but I think it was a smart decision. He doesn't think it was a smart decision, but one of us will be right. And, and one of us will remind you that they were right. <laughs> the, uh, but if you look at American Express, it is, it's a remarkable company. I mean, you know, they came after him with Sapphire last year. People want that business, and payments are changing. And you can see in different countries, different different ways things are going on in that. And, and there are a lot of people that will play the game of gaming the system and switch from one to another based on the rewards on this card or that and all of that sort of thing. But there also is a, I think there's a very substantial uh, group for which American Express does something very special. And, uh, and they keep capitalizing on that premier position with that group. Uh, and, they, and they're doing it successfully around the country, and you'll see in the first quarter, you've seen in the first quarter, you know, we're in, in Britain and Mexico and Japan, you're seeing gains of 15% or better in local currencies, and the base is not, it's not tiny, but it's not huge, so there's a lot of room left to go in that, and, and the small business penetration is good. The loan portfolios behave sensationally uh, compared to uh, really just about anybody. So I like very much our holdings of American Express. The first half, because of the accounting changes, they had to uh, suspend their repurchase program for six months, but I, I, they've announced that they expect to renew it, and someday we'll even, you know, we'll own a greater percentage of American Express, and it'll be a bigger company, in my opinion, and I think we'll do very well. But as Charlie says, nobody knows how payments is for sure comes out. And, and nobody knows how autos for sure come out. And that is true of a great many businesses we're in. And we faced it before. We used to buy things that were certain failures, like textiles and second-rate department stores and trading stamps in California. <clears throat> now we just face things that face real difficulty. So we're actually moving up the, the ladder. <laughs> OK, station one. Mr. Buffett. My name is Daphne Collier Starr. I'm eight years old and live in New York City. 
I've been a shareholder for two years, and this is my second annual shareholders meeting. Berkshire Hathaway's best investment on which the company built its reputation have been in very capital efficient businesses, such as Coke, Seas Candy, American Express, and Geico. But recently, Berkshire has made really big investments in a few businesses that require huge capital investments to maintain and that offer only a regulated low rate of return, such as Burlington Northern Railroad. My question to you, Mr. Buffett, is could you please explain why Berkshire's largest recent inv investments have been departed from your old capital efficient philosophy? And why specifically have you invested Burlington Northern instead of buying a capital efficient company like American Express? <laughs> You're killing me, Daphne. <laughs> yeah. I'm certainly glad she's not nine years old. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just sitting here thinking which of the six panelists we're going to bump next year and put you in. <laughs> uh, well, I thought I was doing well when I bought that city service at 11. <laughs> the, um, the answer is that we have, we'd love, we always prefer the businesses that earn terrific returns on capital, like a C's candy when we bought it or a good many of the businesses. And, and we've, and, we've, and uh, you know, American Express, you know, earns a, a, a terrific return on equity and has for a very long time. Uh, uh, the fact that, that we buy a Burlington, a BNSF, Burlington Northern, uh, uh, means that essentially we can't get more money deployed in capital light businesses, businesses uh, at prices that make sense to us. And so we have gone into more capital-intensive businesses that are good businesses, but wouldn't it be wonderful if we could run the, the railroad without, you know, without trains and track and tunnels and bridges and a few things? Uh, we get a decent return on the capital-intensive businesses. Uh, we, we bought most of them at, at, at very decent prices, and they've been run very well since we've, we bought them. Uh, we still love a business that takes very little capital and earns high returns and continues to grow and requires very little incremental capital. We can't deploy as much money as we have in doing that, and so is the second best choice still a good choice? The answer is yes. It's not as good as the best choice. Charlie? Well, yes, I, I like the aspiration of that young lady. She basically wants a royalty on the other fellow's sales. And of course, that's a very good model. And if everybody could do that, why well, nobody would do anything else. The, the reason we're satisfied with our utility returns and our railroad returns is they're quite satisfactory. And, we, and the, quite satisfactory. I wish we had two more just like them. Don't you, Warren? Yeah, so, yeah definitely. So the answer is they're good enough, and you're asking us to get perfection if you want us to have all our money in Coke and, say, 5 percent of what it's now selling for. Yeah. And a business like <clears throat> Apple really doesn't take much capital, but uh, uh, 
it's still, you've got to spend a lot of money to buy businesses like that. Very few are for sale. And, and uh, the answer is we have not foregone any opportunity to buy uh, businesses that earn high returns, very high returns on equity capital, or, or when we could buy them at a sensible price, to buy these other businesses. So they haven't shoved ever, anything else off the table. But you are, you definitely have a job in our capital allocation department. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Carol. This question is from Max Taylor of Chicago, and it concerns the newspapers that Berkshire owns. In your 2012 letter to shareholders, Mr. Buffett, you had a section devoted to Berkshire's buying 28 newspapers during the year just passed. Since then, you have not come back to the newspaper subject. But this year, at the end of the annual report, you published a list of the newspapers Berkshire owns today, along with their circulation. I compared that list with the one you published five years ago at the end of t uh, 2012. As you no doubt know better than anyone, the circulation of the 26 newspapers that Berkshire still owns, of the 28 originally bought, fell sharply, in many cases by big amounts, like 30 percent to almost 50 percent. I know that five years ago you acknowledged the risk in owning newspapers, but you still said, Charlie and I believe that papers delivering comprehensive and reliable information to tightly bound communities and having a sensible internet strategy will remain viable for a long time. Skip to today and imagine that you are writing about Berkshire's experience with newspapers. What would you be saying? Yeah, I would say that it, it, I forget the modifying word on internet strategy, but uh, uh, I guess I said sensible. Uh, the, the, the problem is, has been about 1,300 daily newspapers in the United States, there were 1,700 not that long ago, is that no one except the Wall Street Journal the New York Times, and now probably the Washington Post, has come up with a digital product that really, in any really significant way, will replace the, the revenue that is being lost as, as print newspapers lose both circulation and advertising. And if you look at the communities in which we operate or the communities in which you name it, uh, other, other newspapers operate. The, the community could be prospering. We're in a prosperous uh, economy presently, uh, and all are losing daily circulation. They're losing Sunday circulation. They're using street, what's called street, uh, street sales. They're losing home delivered. And it is, a, I've been surprised uh, that the rate of decline has not moderated uh, in the last five years. We, we bought all the papers at reasonable prices, so it's, it is not a great economic consequence to Berkshire. But I would like to see daily newspapers uh, actually, you know, be economically viable because of the importance to society, but I would say that the, the trends, which I put those circulation figures in there because I think uh, shareholders are entitled to look year to year uh, at, at what is happening. And it's not only, it's happening to 1,300 newspapers throughout the United States, and it happens in small towns where you would think that the alternative sources of information would not be that good. It happens. Uh, it happens every place. And uh, uh, the Journal, the Times, and probably the Post have a viable uh, economic model in, in the digital world and probably will continue to shrink. I'm almost certain will continue to shrink in the print world, but the digital world will be big enough that uh, and they'll be successful enough so that they have, in my view, a sustainable business model. But it is very difficult uh, 
to see with a lack of success in terms of important dollars arising from digital. It's, it's, it's difficult to see how the, how the print product uh, uh, survives over time, and that's, I'm afraid that's true of 1,300 papers in this country, and it, uh, we'll co keep looking to see if there is a way to do it, but, but you'd have to look at our experience and, and look at the experience of everyone else's. Uh, McClatchy newspapers came out the other day, you know, and I think the newspaper, uh, which is very good, you know, fine cities that they operate in, and advertising revenues down something like 17 or 18 percent in circulation. But it isn't that just them, it's, it's everybody in the business. And I, I wish I had a better answer for you, but, the, but I don't. I would say that the economic significance to Berkshire is, is, is almost negligible, but, but the significance to the society, I think, actually is, is enormous. And, uh, you know, I hope, uh, I hope that we find something, I hope others find something, because we'll copy it. But so far, we have not succeeded in that. Charlie? Well, the decline was faster than we thought it was going to be. So it was not our finest bit of economic prediction. And I think it's even worse. I think to the extent we miscalculated, we may have done it because we both love newspapers and, are, and have considered them so important in our country. These little local newspaper monopolies tended to be owned by people who behaved well and tended to control the politicians. And we're going to miss these newspapers if they disappear. We're going to miss them terribly, and and I think I you hope meant it doesn't happen. But the figures are not good, Warren. No, no, they aren't. And and it isn't just you know it isn't some town that has a particular problem with unemployment or anything of the sort. And it isn't due to general economic conditions. It's uh, uh, it's due to the fact that in this paper, if you wanted to know the baseball results from the present day and the box scores and everything else. They told you the following morning, and it was still news to you. And the financial material that I read from there in, in terms of looking at the stock prices and everything, they were news to you the following morning. And the what was developing in the Pacific in terms of the war was news to you when you read about it in the morning in the New York Times. And it's news is what you don't know that you want to know. And the and those help wanted ads, you know, segregated as they may have been, uh, still were the place to go to look to find a job. And you can go up and down the line, and one element after another, where the daily print newspaper was primary, uh, uh, they're no longer primary. And um, the, the business has changed in a very material way, and we've had and, been able to figure out any solutions to that, and we'll keep trying. And like I say, it's it's not of economic consequence, but but I think it is societal consequence, and and uh, we haven't been able to solve it. Okay, Jonathan. TTI has been a nice growth story since Berkshire acquired it 11 years ago, more than doubling its pre-tax earnings to about $400 million due to fine organic growth and at least two successful bolt-on acquisitions. Business momentum appeared to accelerate in the first quarter. Can you please talk about the competitive landscape in the electronic components distribution industry and what TTI's advantages are? It is, is it just a great industry to be in, or is TTI's business model and or management team special? Well, Do you expect it to be, continue to be one of Berkshire's faster growing non-insurance subsidiaries? TTI is run by a fellow named Paul Andrews, who's done an absolutely sensational job with us. He's a wonderful man. He's a wonderful manager. And in the last, he's, he's quadrupled the business, basically. But in the last year, and accelerating right to this point, uh, they distribute little electronic components. They actually, their average, they're a many billion dollar business, and their average item is less than less than the nickel that they sell. So it's kind of like being in the jelly bean business or something like that, except these things go into all kinds of fancy machines that I don't understand. And 
Uh, we, we, we have a worldwide operation based in, in the uh, Dallas-Fort Worth area and built by one man who left a division of General Dynamics I don't know, 45 or 50 years ago and step by step built up this business like we just bought within the last two months we bought an operation in South Korea that will uh, be another substantial addition we do business worldwide and electronic components have absolutely taken off in the last year and they use something called uh, the bill you know the, the well it's, it's essentially a measure of backlog and and book to build is the ratio they call it but it, it's just kind of a special term. Uh, the, but it's grow. I mean, it's just improved dramatically in, in the last year, and it continues month after month. So something is going on out there, because nobody buys these things to store them in their basement or anything of the sort. I mean, these get used, these electronic components. Some of them are on, on allocation. We have a great relationship with suppliers. We have a very good relationship with with our customers because we carry uh, we carry more inventory than most of our competitors. So particularly when when uh, the business is tight, we, we can deliver uh, and, and, and do a very first class job doing it. So I give great credit to Paul. He, and he, he, he increased his physical facility, started on that a few years ago. And, and it's a godsend that he did it because with the business going through there now, we, 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 we wouldn't have been able to handle it. Uh, but it's a competitive business. I mean, if you look at <clears throat> Aero, Aero Electronics or, you know, on the New York Stock Exchange, and, uh, we've got competitors. I think Paul is doing a better job by a considerable margin uh, than they are, and I'm delighted it's part of the Berkshire family. There will be times when that business slows down because their 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 customers uh, you know will will have their own cycles and when it does will go down but over time that business is going to grow charlie yeah it's a wonderful business because it's so difficult to do that competitors don't want to try it when i lived in omaha there was a man who lived in great prosperity and almost no work and his business was gathering up and rendering dead horses. And he never had any competitors. <laughs> he used to come up to the Omaha Club and start drinking about 11 in the morning. It was not a difficult business. But nobody ever crowded him with new competition. And very few people want to distribute zillions of electronic parts that are worth a nickel each. It's very complicated. And of course, that business is terribly good at it, and it keeps getting more and more of the same. So you're right, it's a huge growth business, which is sort of the electronic equivalent of gathering up and rendering dead horses. Imagine keeping track of close to a million different items, you know, with very small values attached to them, and getting them out to your customer fast, because they want them fast, all over the world, you know, and then, those and, things are not easy to manage. I mean, I, I, uh, and, and staying in stock yeah. on so many items, it's it's very complicated, and that business is very good at it. Yeah, we're lucky. and of course it'll grow. The horses went away, but these parts aren't going to go away. Charlie made a made a uh, profession of studying businesses where the owners could sit around and drink all day and have them. <laughs> You know, you know, that was where we ought to be competing but, uh, or buying. My theory, Warren, is if it, if it can't stand a little mismanagement, it's no business. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and we're testing that sometimes. <laughs> okay, station two. Hi, Ben Sherbert to Begit Kansas. Uh, just want to say, Warren and Charlie, thank you again for hosting us all. This is a great event. Thank you. 
Uh, my question is about the recent decision to sell shares back of Phillips 66. Not to put you on the hot seat, but right after that, share prices jumped up about $22 a share. You, you mentioned at the time that there's some regulatory requirements if you own over 10 percent of a company. Could you talk about the factors that go into how you decide whether to retain more than that or get under that threshold? And then what are your thoughts long term on Philip 66, like their business mid midstream refining? Yeah. Well, it was the city service preferred of last year. <laughs> the, uh, we sold the stock at around 93 or 4 and, and probably 115 now. But we, we own just under 10 percent of the company. And, and the more Ted and Todd and I uh, think about various problems connected with regulatory problems and trading problems and so on, overwhelmingly we will, we will stick below 10 percent on marketable security holdings. Uh, we've done it with the airlines. Uh, now, that does not mean we're going to reduce our holdings in American Express or anything of the sort. But, and Greg Garland has done a great job at Phillips 66. We've had, we've had very good relations with the company. They've, uh, they're very, he's a very, very, very experienced and sensible manager. But I did decide that I wanted to be below 10 percent in that holding, and we like I say, we will we'll stay just slightly under 10 percent of Wells Fargo. We've actually sold a few shares uh, just to stay below 10 percent in the case, I think, of both American Airlines and United Continental. We, we, unless there's something unusual, we're going to stay under 10. But we, we, have, uh, we have nine and a significant fraction percent of Phillips. And uh, I think they've been good at operations. I think they've been good at capital allocation. Uh, we traded them a business. We traded them stock for a business uh, some years ago, uh, which has been a very nice business that we've retained a, an operation. Uh, so uh, we've, got, we've got a lot of money still in Phillips, and I wish I'd made the deal at a higher price. And, uh, but we made money on what we sold, and we accomplished an objective. But Charlie? Well, we like the subsidiary we traded the stock for. I missed that, but I'm do we traded the stock for a subsidiary? Yeah, yeah. Well, we yeah. like the subsidiary. Oh yeah. Well, it it, it improved. Like the stock went away for nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, we've done pretty well with Phillips. Uh, Becky. Uh, this question comes from Vlad Koptev in Ukraine. He says. Capitalization of cryptocurrencies approached that of Berkshire and Apple last year. And clearly, the idea behind crypto will affect conventional banking groups, where Berkshire is a shareholder. You always say you didn't go into too much detail to obtain an understanding on cryptocurrencies. So what factors caused you to say that it's a bubble? Well, generally, non-productive assets <clears throat> remain the, you know, if you had bought gold at the time of Christ, and you figure the compound rate on it, you know, it's, it may be a couple tenths of one percent. Uh, the, it, it, it's, it essentially is not going to deliver anything other than supposed scarcity, you know, because they'll only, you can only mine so many. But so what? I mean, what is, what does it produce itself? Um, you know, the check is a wonderful idea. Just imagine how the world would be without being able to write checks or have wire transfer of funds. But it doesn't make the check intrinsically itself worth a lot of money. And if you said you can't use something called check with a little piece of paper, you'd do something else to transfer money. I, I think that any time you buy a non-productive asset, uh, you are counting on somebody else later on to buy a non-productive asset because they think they can sell it to somebody f for more money. And it's been tried with tulips, and it's been, it's been tried with various things over time, and it does come to a bad ending. I'm having, you have a hard time. You can, you can think of 
think of raw land. I mean, the Louisiana Purchase was, say, $15 million for 800,000 or so square miles of land. In fact, you're sitting on land that came with the Louisiana Purchase, and, and uh, so what we pay? We paid 20 bucks a square mile and, uh, you know, 640 acres in a square mile, and you're down to three cents a, or something. So that was a pretty good purchase of an, what was then a non-productive property, but it depend. But it's very hard. You can buy st stamps. Bill Gross got every, you know, collected a wonderful stamp collection, and it, it sold for more money in the end. But it's dependent on somebody else wanting to buy, hoping they will sell it for more money, and so on. And in the end, you make your money out of productive assets. If you buy a farm, you, you try to estimate what the crops, what amount per acre of soybeans or corn or whatever may be raised and how much you have to pay the farmer that farms it for you and what your taxes will be and various things. And you make a conclusion based on what the asset itself will produce over time. And that's an investment. When you buy something because you're hoping tomorrow morning you're going to wake up, you know, and the price will be higher, the only reason, you know, you need more people coming into it than are leaving. And, and, they, uh, and you can get that, and it will feed on itself for a while, and sometimes for a long while, and sometimes to extraordinary numbers. But, in the end, but they come to bad endings, and cryptocurrencies will come to bad endings, and it, along with the fact that there's nothing being produced in the way of value from the asset, that, that uh, you also have the problem that it draws in a lot of charlatans and that sort of thing who are trying to create various sorts of exchanges or whatever it may be. It, you know, it, it's something where, where people who are of less than stellar character see an opportunity to uh, clip people who are trying to get rich because their neighbors are getting rich buying this stuff that neither one of them understands. It will come to a bad ending. Charlie? Well, I like cryptocurrencies a lot less than you do. <laughs> <laughs> and so, to me, it's just dementia. And I think the people who are professional traders that go into trading cryptocurrencies, it, it's, it's just disgusting. It's like somebody else is trading turds and you decide I can't be left out. To the extent that this brought, we're being webcast around the world, I hope some of our stuff doesn't translate very well, actually. <laughs> okay, Gary. Yes, I had a question on the corporate tax rate, and we have a debate in my investment world about where the benefits of that cut fall. And it, I'd say the consensus is going to the consumer as it gets competed away over time, but perhaps it, some of it sticks to shareholders. And my, my question is, do you think over the long run some of the benefit sticks to shareholders? And maybe it's even beyond auto insurance. Maybe it's other businesses you have as well. I, well, what people do generally with that is they take what they want to be the answer for them and then they hire or they, or they just attach themselves to some economist that gives them a more complicated way of saying it's all going to be wonderful because it, it's happened. But the answer is that in the case of our regulated public utilities, the benefits are all supposed to go and will go to the utility customer because we're entitled to a return on equity if we perform well, and, and we're not entitled to get excess returns because uh, our tax rates change that. So, and, and similarly, if tax rates would go back up, we would expect to get compensated for that. It, uh, so in that area, and that was five or six billion dollars for us, but in that area, absolutely goes uh, to the, the user, the consumer, and it should. Uh, then the question is, with the remainder, does it get competed away or not? And the answer is sometimes it does. Sometimes it gets competed very quickly and substantially. Sometimes it may be slow, and other times I'd, it probably won't. The one thing you know is that the, the change in the corporate tax law was good 
uh, for shareholders generally and, and, and Berkshire shareholders. I mean, it, uh, and that's, that's what Congress passed. And, and the intent had to be that if you were going to cut taxes, that, that uh, shareholders would get a, a particularly large portion this time. And some of you will agree with that. Uh, politically, and some of you won't agree with it politically, but you'll all benefit. Equally. <laughs> and uh, uh, I think it's, I think it's, uh, it's human nature. Uh, if you're getting a break, to say it's going to work wonderfully for everybody else, and we'll find out whether it will or not. It's very, very, very difficult in economics to measure the impact of single variables. You cannot just do one thing in economics. People kind of learn that in physics and talk about butterflies in China and all that sort of thing. But the, in that, every question you get in economics, the next, you should, or any statement, you should say, and then what? And when you get into the and then what's, you start favoring people who give an answer to that in, in, in political life that happens to usually help you in some way or another, and including your pocketbook. And, and we've seen that with this, and it's helped the shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway. I would say that, that some will be competed away, some by law will go to utilities, and, and some will benefit uh, Berkshire shareholders. Charlie? I have nothing to add. <clears throat> OK. Station three. Hi, Mr. Buffett and uh, Mr. Munger. My name is Kevin, and I'm from Shenzhen, China, currently studying finance and philosophy at Boston College. I have a rather broad question. Uh, in this more and more globalized world, what do you think our younger generation can do to best leverage our background and experience of both China and U.S. to create values and for the benefit to countries, in co economy, and relationship? And what do you think, what do you see valuable in a person in a person with a, with a multicultural background. Thank you. Well, I think in answer to the last question, I think it's terrific to have a multicultural background. And if I, I never was any good at languages, but if, if I were in college today and in either country, I'd be learning the language of, of the other country because it, <clears throat> I think it'll be a great, great advantage over time. Um, the First part of the question, uh, uh, I'd like to have that stated again to me. I want to make sure I'm answering your specific aspect on the. I think it's, I think it's going to be good for your future. But I'm done. Can we have the microphone on up there again? So uh, my fir the first part of the question is. Like, what do you think our younger generation can do to best leverage our background and experience of both China and U.S.? Well, I'd start with being multilingual. I mean, certainly in terms of, you know, I mean, obviously you want to be able to express yourself in both. And the, the better you can understand, obviously, the culture of another society, uh, obviously that's a benefit. Uh, but... Uh, I think, I think the market system, modified as it may be, both in China and in the United States, the way it really does, there, there will be an invisible hand to some extent that does work to improve the lot of future generations by the fact that both China and the United States and, and, and the rest of the world is improving. I mean, it is much better, in my view, particularly in a nuclear world, but it's much better to have people prospering, prospering throughout the world, partly through their own efforts, but partly through their interactions with the rest of the world. And we've made a lot of progress in that respect, uh, particularly since World War II. I mean, it was a, a terrific idea to have the Marshall Plan, you know, instead of behaving like we did after World War I, and getting the result that we got, I think we may be much more intelligently after World War II. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm bullish on the future of the United States, but I'm bullish on the future of, of, 
China and, and, and to a significant extent, you know, the rest of the world. Uh, people are going to be living better 10, 20, 50 years from now. And uh, I don't think that's something that can be stopped even. Charlie, absent weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, well, the multicultural stuff, it wouldn't do you much good to be fluent in both English and Chinese if you were, say, a proctologist in China or a proctologist in Nebraska. You just, so if you're going to use your multicultural background, you've got to work at some interface between, between uh, the United States and China. And you can raise money in, China, in the United States and invest it in China like Li Lu does, or you can be some kind of an importer or, or uh, a, a, a trade specialist. But you've got to get near that interface to benefit from being bilingual and so on. But you would bet that the interface will be substantially greater. Huge. Yeah. Huge. And that's what you want to prepare for. Yes. And, and I think that, generally speaking, when you get multicultural, you can also be multidisciplinary. But generally, I think people make more money if they're, if they're very narrowly specialized, like the pro proctologist. And that, <laughs> and that it's much harder to make a, a lot of money for most people if you try and imitate Warren and me. I'm glad I didn't meet him earlier. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Andrew. OK, this question comes from someone who says, I am a Berkshire employee and shareholder. Mm -hmm. I read an investigative article from ProPublica and the Washington Post that many of Berkshire's various units only offer 401k plans with high fees that are actively managed rather than the low-cost indexes you have advocated as the best path for savings for retirement. The article's author said he contacted the company and nobody would comment. Will you do something to improve our 401k offerings to match your investment philosophy? And from an operational perspective, how did this happen, given your strong views on the topic? Well, I've absolutely said what many, many times through annual reports, and our managers know what I think about the attractiveness of having an, uh, a index fund option, but they all have different plans, different histories, and they run their businesses. And who knows, you know, which particular, if you go back to the older businesses, they have defined benefit pension plans generally. Nobody puts them in any anymore. And then the question is, you know, do you transition to something else? In the end, we overwhelmingly let our managers make those kind of decisions and others. And my guess is that a very high significant percentage of people who have work at a company that has a 401k plan will have an index fund option, but they may not in some cases. The only thing we, I think we have asked the companies uh, to have a limit on the percentage, I think, that they might put in Berkshire's stock through the 401k. But we don't, we don't want people whose jobs are tied to, to Berkshire. To, uh, we certainly don't want to be in a position of encouraging them to put 100 percent or something of their, their savings in, in, in Berkshire itself. I don't want to be in that, in that position. But I don't think even there we've insisted on any company doing that. I think we've probably made that when we've been asked about it once or twice. I think we've given that suggestion. But the managers will run the companies, the employees, if they feel and some of our companies have human relations departments, if they feel that, that uh, they'd like different options or something like that, uh, you know, they, they should make those views known to the managers. And in some cases, the managers, I think, will pay attention to them, and others, they probably won't. We've got a wide variety of managers that run our businesses, and, and we're not going to start trying to run them from Omaha. Charlie? Well, I think you're right. That, that has happened, that business of the high fee choices because we've delegated the whole subject to the managers of the subsidiaries. And so no attention at all is being given to the employee choices at headquarters. And what you're pointing out is that a lot of the employees in the subsidiaries would do better if they indexed instead of choosing what they did choose. And my guess is you're absolutely right about that. Yeah. 
Yeah. And if there are any people, managers in the business today, I hope we'll do a little better at encouraging better choices. Yeah, although I would, we, we wouldn't want them, to, we don't want them to interfere too much in, no. in directing what they, uh, the people, it's, you know, we, we could take over human relations. No, it's up to the managers, yeah. but, but we wouldn't object to a little different viewpoint. Hmm. And we have made it very clear what we think. I mean, the, they just, some of them don't listen to us. <laughs> okay, Greg. Warren, you've noted time and again that there is a strong common culture shared across Berkshire subsidiaries, built on a commitment to honesty and integrity, a focus on the long term, and an emphasis on customer care. And that it's also critical to find cultures that mesh well with Berkshires when acquiring operating companies. In most cases, the managers that are currently running these subsidiaries are the same individuals or members of the families that originally sold their firms to Berkshire, leaving them with a vested interest in the businesses they are running and a strong connection to the culture they tend to share in common with Berkshire. It seems to me that the greater challenge is in ensuring that the large publicly traded firms that have been acquired and account for a meaningful and growing amount of Berkshire's overall value stay the course. Could you comment on whether or not this is the case and what the greatest challenge is for you and Charlie when it comes to not only maintaining Berkshire's culture, but in finding firms that would fit in well with what you've built? Yeah, I think the culture is very, very strong. Uh, and I think it gets reinforced. Uh, frankly, I think it gets reinforced by the shareholders we have. I mean, we have a different body of shareholders and we, and we look at those shareholders, I think, in, in a somewhat different way than a good many other companies do. I mean, they, they, uh, I think there are a fair number of public companies that wish they didn't have, you know, public shareholders. We're happy to have public shareholders. <laughs> the, uh, and we like having individual shareholders, and we don't favor institutions, and we're not going to, you know, give guidance and talk especially to them on investor calls and all that sort of thing. But we, we, want, our con we want it to be directly with with. with with uh, we want shareholders who are partners basically, and th that begins with that. It goes to the directors. We have directors who are not. Uh, well, I've been on 19 boards, and I've never seen another board like ours. And I think it, it's terrific that we've got the people who represent, in many cases, lots of shares themselves. They didn't get special deals. They, they. Uh, it's a a group of owner oriented. Berkshire conscious, business savvy owners, and we don't have anybody on the board because they're uh, a leading, you know, educator or whatever it may be. We we want people who who basically think about it, how to run a business well for themselves and for their partners, and we've got managers who fit into that culture or who have chosen that culture in coming with us, and sometimes we have the second or the third or fourth generation, and say, at the Nebraska Furniture Mart, that share that. Is it perfect? No, it's far from perfect. I mean, that, uh, you don't get everybody thinking the same way. We have people we, we have people that are very independently minded, running a lot of businesses, and some of them have, they have different political beliefs, they have different, they have different, they, they see through different lenses than we do to some degree. But in terms of having a common, strong, positive culture. I don't think there's any pub big public company that has it any better than uh, Berkshire, and I think that will continue because people opt into it to a great deal. Cultures get passed along. You do things that are consistent with the culture, so you, you do what you talk about is what you do, and you don't find, you don't find people saying, you know, we're a wonderful partnership, and then voting themselves, you know huge options and a whole bunch of other people will say options beneath them because it, they can't look like they're taking it all for themselves and arranging. Hmm, I read about some deal where it could pay off with many, 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 many billions of dollars the other day. We won't name names. But the, the uh, we've got as good a culture as you can get. And if it, I would say net, it grows stronger. We have a few people all of the time really don't buy into it entirely. I mean, it is not 100 percent, but it's as, as close to it. Uh, I, and I think it gets closer all the time as we go along. And we'll keep 
we will try, we will try to keep behaving in a way that reinforces it and doesn't dilute it. And I think that will go. I think that will not only work for Charlie and me, but it'll work for our successors uh, very well. It won't be perfect, Charlie. Every time I come to one of these meetings and sit in the manager's luncheon, I feel more strongly at the end of the luncheon that the culture and values of Berkshire Hathaway will go on and on for a long time after the present management is gone. In fact, I think it'll go on after all of the present managers are gone. I think we've started something here that will work well enough that it will, it will last. And one of the reasons it will last is it's not that damned easy to duplicate. So the, the one that is present is likely to just keep going and going. Think of how little direct copying of the Berkshire system there's been. And, but it won't, it won't produce the returns it's produced in the past either. That, hmm. No, I, I think it's going to, I think it's going to last a long time. For a very oh. simple reason, it's, it's it going to deserve to last a long time. It works. <laughs> and it's going to work. Okay. Station four. My name is Christian Marx. I'm a proud shareholder from Cologne, Germany. It is my pleasure to be here. My question relates to the Berkshire insurance operations. When I look at the quarterly balance sheets of the last two decades, I noticed a pattern that I kindly ask you to discuss. The sum of cash plus fixed income always hovers around 100% of the amount of insurance float. Therefore, my question is, is it fair to say that from the 128 billion of consolidated cash plus fixed income as of March, 116 billion are actually needed to support the insurance operations? No, I, I appreciate you. The, the answer is no, yes. Yeah, the, the answer is no. Yeah, but the he deserves an explanation of how this, maybe I haven't looked at it the way he's looked at it. Uh, but we have a hundred, we would much rather have uh, a number closer to 20 than to have 116. And uh, we do not correlate uh, or, or, or uh, um, in effect, uh, measure the float and then decide how much to put in or leave in cash and fixed income. It, it's uh, the, the fact our float keeps growing and lately our cat, which is by design and has been terrific for us, and our, our cash and cash equivalents has grown because uh, the competition for, for acquisitions has become um, much stronger as uh, both as money is piled up in uh, uh, with bu the buyers of businesses and because debt has been so cheap and a variety of factors. But I don't think those are necessarily permanent. In fact, I'd uh, be reasonably sure they aren't permanent. It's just a question of when they change. We are not tying, as Charlie said, we're not, we're not tying the uh, cash and cash equipment so all the float. The float has surprised me. The float went up $2 billion in the first quarter, and, and uh, there is no way uh, that that float can shrink a lot in any short period. It, it just it structurally has been set up in such a way that it, 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 it will not, it cannot shrink. And actually, I think it will grow a little bit for a while. I mean, I've always been amazed by how much it has grown. We've got so much more float than any property casualty company. That, in the world, and it, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing that it all came from that little building that Jack Ringwald built and picked it, the location because it was near the tennis courts. <laughs> okay, Carol? Well, oh, uh, Charlie. there are encouraging recent developments. The Some of the cash has gone out recently for securities we vastly prefer over the cash, and we have a 
a lot of cash that could be remaining that could be deployed in securities we, we might like a lot better than Treasury notes. So stay tuned. Yeah, to make it very simple, in the first quarter, we earned five and a, from operations, we earned a little over $5 billion. Now, we only spent about our depreciation. Normally, we would spend somewhat more than that, but that's five and a fraction billion. Two billion came in net from float, so that's seven billion dollars that uh, basically in the first quarter that would have been added to our cash uh, if we hadn't done something with it. And, and, and uh, instead, our cash and equivalents went down because we, we net invested more in equities by some margin than the seven that came in. But we do have this position where even absent a change in float, about 400 million comes into Berkshire every week, which is very comfortable. And we will, we want to get it so that more than 400 million is going out into productive assets, and we succeeded in doing that in the first quarter. So net, net, we improved our position in the first quarter. Carol? Um, in your 1999 article in Fortune magazine, you stated your belief that after-tax corporate profits were unlikely to hold much above 6% for any sustained period, due not only to competition but also to public policy. You stated in the article, if corporate investors in aggregate are going to eat an ever-growing portion of the economic pie, some other group will have to settle for a smaller portion that would justifiably raise political problems. Since 2008, after-tax corporate profits have been 8 to 10 percent of GDP. Do you believe that is a permanent shift in the U.S. economy? And, of course, we have to think about the, the latest tax bill. Or will corporate profits revert back to the 4 percent to 6 percent of GDP range that was normal in the 20th century? Well, it's been an interesting development during that period. It goes back a little bit before that period, but, but you now have the four largest companies by market value uh, in the United States, the $30 trillion market, you have four companies that essentially don't need any net tangible assets. Uh, and if you go back many years, I mean, if you looked at the largest companies, Carol used to put out the Fortune 500 list, and, uh, you know, it would be AT&T or General Motors, and it was companies that, Exxon Mobil, it was companies that just required lots of capital in order to produce earnings. So uh, American industry has gotten incredibly more profitable in aggregate in the last 20 or 30 years. You look at the return on the S&P 500, the earnings as a percent of net tangible assets, and the rest is just, you know, if you buy a company that has a million dollars worth of net worth and you pay a billion for it, it still only had the million dollars of net worth. I mean, you just paid more for it. So in the, the basic profitability of the company is huge, even though you, you, your investment may be at a significantly higher price. And so that what has happened is that uh, I think if you look at the earnings on tangible net worth of the S&P 500 and compare it to 20 years ago, it is amazing. And that is really due to the fact that this has become somewhat, you could call it an asset light economy. And, uh, you know, those four companies that earn 10 percent of, of the, of the, uh, uh, they comprise close to 10 percent of the, the market value of the entire uh, publicly traded corporate America, they don't, and they don't take any money, basically. And that, that is a changing world, and, and uh, they will earn even more money with the uh, tax rate going down. And, and I don't think people have quite processed all that information in, in terms of what has gone on in, in the market. You don't, you know, Carnegie, built a steel mill, and then he paid it off, or he, he borrowed a little money, and then he built another steel mill, and all of that sort of thing. But it was enormously capital-intensive. And uh, 
one industry after another. AT&T was enormously capital intensive. Uh, and now the money is in the asset light. I mean, huge money is in the not only asset light business, but the, the negative asset. You know, IBM uh, even, you know, it has no tangible, there's a net minus tangible net worth. There's nothing wrong with that. It's terrific. But uh, it, is, it is not the world we lived in uh, 30 years ago. And in that sense, I didn't see that coming in 1999 when I wrote whatever I wrote there. It hasn't changed the profitability of the asset-heavy companies particularly. I mean, it isn't like oil. If you take the five most capital-intensive industries in the 90s, I don't think you'll find that their, their earnings on tangible assets have increased a lot. But you will find that this group has moved in that, that really doesn't, they don't need any, they don't need any net tangible assets uh, at all, or they need very minor amounts. Charlie? There's also a lot of financial engineering that's raised leverage, even in the capital intense businesses. And, you know, while Warren may have predicted a little wrong when he wrote that very scholarly article, he didn't invest wrong. <laughs> and so it just shows it's hard to make these economic predictions. Okay, John. You are very right on that one, Warren. Yeah, actually, the, the performance of the stock market since then has been pretty accurate. <laughs> yes, but <laughs> and, that's true. Yeah, being right for the wrong reason or something, <laughs> or wrong for the right reason. Anyway, Jonathan. <laughs> Berkshire received a $10.2 billion retroactive premium from AIG early last year. If the upper, upperly revised estimate of $18.2 billion of ultimate claims proves to be correct, will the cost of float adjusted for favorable tax attributes, likely be lower or higher than what Berkshire would have paid to borrow $10 billion for a similar duration? Well, we certainly go in with the idea that it will be, the cost will be lower. And it's an interesting situation. We, essentially AIG, which is one of the largest property casualty, particularly commercial property casualty companies in the world, uh, said, we want to give you all of the losses that we incurred in a very big percentage of our domestic business before December 31st of 2015, and we will pay the first $25 billion, and then after we pay $25 billion, AIG pays $25 billion, then you pay 80% of the next $25 billion. So the, and they gave us $10 billion for doing that. And that's, if we are correct about our estimates of how much money will be paid and when it will be made, paid, uh, we should come out being better off than if we had borrowed a similar amount. Uh, we have a history of doing 10 or so, maybe 12, big deals like that. Uh, we hold the record. We did it for Lloyds of London 10 or more years ago, and we did it now with AIG. And sometimes we've been on the low side in our estimate, and sometimes we've been on the high side so far. AIG just said that they, I think they paid 15 and a fraction billion on these pre-1231-2015 losses. They paid 15 a fraction billion, but the payment tend to trickle down over years as you get further away from when the losses occurred. So I would say that we still feel okay about it, and uh, uh, we'll be wrong one way or the other. Everybody is when you estimate losses that may not get settled for 20 or 30 years. Uh, but so far, on the group as a whole of these deals we've done, we've been okay. And I think on the AIG thing, we think we'll be okay. And I think AIG thinks we'll be okay. I mean, they entered into it for good reasons of their own. So it, it, uh, it looks okay. I'm sorry to get into this technical stuff, but, but Jonathan always asks me questions like that, so I have to be <laughs> ready to, I, I want to answer them. <laughs> okay, station five. 
Good afternoon. My name is Adam Bergman with Sterling Capital in Virgir Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm here with my daughter, Michelle, from Cape Henry Collegiate in Virginia Beach. Hi, Warren. Hi, Charlie. Our question for you is how you go about attempting to forecast the degree of future su success of one specific product in a good business versus another, such that you invest in American Express and Coca-Cola rather than Diners Club or RC Cola, for example. Thanks. Well, with American Express, <laughs> it, was, it was an interesting situation because Diners Club got there first. I think American Express, in a certain sense, I mean, they did it for a lot of reasons, but they went into the credit card business uh, uh, because they were worried about what was going to happen to traveler's checks. Uh, and although traveler's checks are still exist in a significant way, but the interesting thing when American Express went into competition with Diners Club and with carte blanche, as I remember, that was also existed at the time, was that instead of charging less than Diners Club and going in, figuring they were going against the established guy and they'd come in at a lower price, they went in at a higher price, as I remember. And the American Express Centurion was on that card. I've got one that I got in 1964, but they were in it before that. It, uh, it, it had more value in time. I mean, it, it, it got better representation. And frankly, if you were a salesperson out with somebody and you could pull out that American Express card with that Centurion, you look like you were J.P. Morgan. And if you pull out the Diners Club, it had a whole bunch of flashy signals. You look like a guy that was kiting his checks from one month to the next. And a fellow, a fellow named Ralph Schneider, and Ralph Schneider and Al Bloomingdale developed the Diners Club, and they were very smart about getting there first, but they weren't smart about how they merchandised it subsequently. Uh, RC Cola, you know, it, uh, it, it did, there were all kinds of colas that came after Coke. I mean, you know, you, you go back to 1886 and come up with something at Jacob's Pharmacy that's incredibly successful, you know, fairly soon, you're going to get lots of imitators, but Coke really is the real thing. And, uh, you know, you, uh, you offer me RC Cola, and say, I'll give it to you at half the price of Coca-Cola in terms of drinking it. I mean, this, this is a product that's six and a, six and a half ounces, sold for a nickel in 1900, you know, and now if you buy it on the weekend and buy it in large quantities and everything, you're not paying that much more. This newspaper was three cents in 1942. You know, the, the, the amount of enjoyment per but real, in terms of the real, uh, of what you pay for this, has gone dramatically down in inflation-adjusted money. So it's, it is a bargain product. Uh, you, know, you, you have to look at, seize candy. You know, if, if you live in California and you were, you were a teenage boy and you went to your girlfriend's house and you gave the box of candy to her or to her mother or father, and she kissed you, you know, you lose price sensitivity at that point. No? <laughs> <laughs> That's um, yeah. So we really want products where people feel like kissing you, you know, <laughs> rather than slapping you. It's, it's, um, it, it's, it's an interesting thing. I mean, you know, in effect, we're, we're betting on the ecosystem of, of Apple products, but led by the iPhone, and and I see characteristics in that that make me think that that it's extraordinary. But I may be wrong, and you know, so far we've been, I would say we've been right on American Express and and Coca-Cola. American Express had this huge solid oil scandal in 1960, happened in 63 November, right around the time Kennedy was shot, and. Uh, uh, that was really worry about whether the company would survive, but nobody quit using the, the, the card. Nobody quit using the traveler's checks. 
and they charged a premium price for their traveler's checks. So there are things you can see around consumer products that sometimes can give you a pretty, pretty good insight into the future, and then sometimes we make mistakes. Charlie? I got nothing to add, except that if we'd been offered a chance to go into Coca-Cola right after it was invented, we, pr we probably would have said we no. We turn it down. Yeah. It would have looked kind of silly to us. Well, unless we drank it now, Charlie, listen. <laughs> no, he's right. I mean, we don't, we don't foresee things that we haven't got a lot of evidence in on. I mean, we... And, and no. We, 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 we want to see a lot of... If we're talking about a consumer product, we want to see how a consumer product behaves under a lot of different circumstances. And then uh, we want to use something... Actually, there was a book by Phil Fisher written around 1960 called Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits. It's one of the great books on investing. And uh, uh, it talks about the scuttlebutt method of investing, which was quite a ways from what Ben Graham taught me in terms of figures. But it's a very, very good book. And you can learn a lot, you know, just by, by going out and using some shoe leather. Now they they call them channel checks now or something like that. But it's, uh, you can get a feel for some products, and then there are others you can't. And then sometimes you're wrong. But, but it, is, it is a good technique. Uh, it's an important investing technique, I would say that. And, and Ted and Todd do a lot of that. Uh, and they have people, some people to help them out on doing it, too. Charlie's done it with Costco. I mean, he's... <laughs> He's, he is, I mean, all the time, he is finding new virtues in Costco, you know, and, and, uh, and, and he's right, incidentally. I mean, Costco has an enormous appeal to its constituency. It, uh, you know, they, they delight, they surprise and delight their customers, and there is nothing like that in business. You have delighted customers. You're a long way home. But, um, okay, Becky. Uh, this comes from John Hegarty at Bright Star Capital Partners, who writes, Warren, you're stepping down from the Kraft Heinz board at a time when the company is looking to do a large acquisition, Unilever, for example. Do you fundamentally disagree with the combative nature of hostile bids, activist investing, and competitive proxy contests? Well, we will not make hostile tenders ourselves. I do not believe that there, there's anything fundamentally wrong with the idea. I mean, if you take the Fortune 500 companies, I'm sure that all 500 are not managed by the best or, in some cases, even the friendliest to investor and managements in the world. So I, I, don't, think, I don't think it's evil or anything to uh, conduct a host, hostile offer for a company. It's just we won't do it, and, and uh, we don't want to get into that. We, we like... We like being liked by the managements that we join because we're counting on them to run the company, and we're not bringing in a whole bunch of people that know how to how to ch change businesses. Uh, the uh, uh, we seldom take a position uh, opposite to management, uh, very seldom on on anything involving a proxy, but. Uh, uh, contest of sorts, but we, we don't rule it out. We don't think every management is entitled to be, uh, you know, that they don't, they don't have a lifetime hold on their business, but it's not our style at all to, to uh, well, we won't do it in terms of initiating it ourselves, and we'd be very, very, very unlikely to support the contest, but we have, we have voted against a couple of propositions over 50 years that that managements have had uh, um, made in relation to stock options. We withheld a vote at Coca-Cola a few years ago uh, to express our opinion. Uh, but uh, we don't think it's evil for the shareholders uh, so in some cases, they have different different opinions about who should run the company or whether compensation is appropriate or, or matters of that sort. They, the stockholders still own the company. Charlie? I've got nothing to add to that. 
I don't envy these people that are in these unfriendly uproars all the time. Imagine doing that after you were already rich. It's insane. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we are definitely not looking for it. But we don't, uh, there, are, there are certainly companies that uh, deserve challenge. I mean, and, and they propose things that deserve challenge occasionally. But it, again, it's not, it's not our, our main activity. And this has, uh, the question was asked in reference to Kraft Heinz. The people of 3G are great, great managers. They've been wonderful partners. I had made a determination before we got involved there. I was going to be on no more public boards. I'd been on 19 of them, and, and it takes a lot of time. And they asked me if I'd go on for a while, and I did. But it really is like seven and a half days or something. And if you're on a, a bank board, it may be quite a bit more than that. I mean, they're, 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 they're just being on a public board and usually means quarterly meetings plus maybe an extra one. And, and uh, you know, at, at 87, I, I think I've now learned what, I've learned what happens and it's fine, but I don't want to spend seven and a half days a year when I'm maybe I can call up people that I trust and admire who are on the board in five minutes, you know, we find out what's going on or whatever it may be, any questions that come up. And so we are their partners and delighted to be their partners. Uh, and now we have two people on the board of Kraft Tynes and they can do the traveling and I can stay home. Charlie, how many public, you're on Costco, of course, but over the, your lifetime, how many public boards? Well, I, I, Costco, except for Kansas something like the Daily Journal where I own part of it, Costco is the only public board. Uh, you were on Kansas There wasn't Power Berkshire Light. or something I own personally. Yeah. yeah. I was on Kansas City Power and Light. Boy, that goes way back. <laughs> but, but basically it, has, it hasn't happened. I don't envy people who float around a lot of different board meetings. No, generally speaking, you have very little influence and spend a lot of time. And, yeah. the, and the trouble is, if you're going to a board meeting, particularly if you get to be international, and sometimes they feel they have to have one that's international, you know, they feel they have to take up a fair amount of your time or it wouldn't have been worth coming, you know, thousands of miles for it. So you get a lot of the show and tell stuff and that, that I've, I find my mind drifting. Okay. <laughs> Gary. Yes, you've said that you are looking for non-insurance large acquisitions to put that cash to work. And when you've said that, I've usually thought of the United States because you're a big fan of the U.S. business. And I just was wondering whether you're seeing more opportunities as the rest of the world opens up, grows, whether there's opportunities for some of those mega transactions in other parts of the world, say Asia or Europe. Yeah, Gary, I would say that uh, I've been disappointed in that because uh, we do see some outside the United States, and thank heavens we saw the one we saw in Israel some years ago when when Eitan wrote me a letter. But and you know we bought a business which is a very important part of Berkshire now. But we are still not. They're certainly aware of Berkshire Hathaway outside the United States but they don't sort of pick up the phone automatically. In the United States, I think any large, particularly private company that thinks, is thinking about doing something, they at least think about Berkshire. And, uh, but that, uh, in Europe or Asia, that we are not embedded in the minds the same way. They, they know about us, they know we got a lot of money, and they know we like to buy things, but, but we have really, we're on the radar screen big time in the United States, and we're not as, we're not as, we don't, the immediate desire to be sure that they've thought about the Berkshire option does not occur the same way outside the United States. And we've tried to encourage it a few ways, but I would say that the results have not been, been great at all. And, uh, uh, but I hope tomorrow, you know, I get a call from, Germany or Britain or Italy or you name it, 
and Australia, and wherever it may be, and I hope I get a call and, and, uh, and we get an opportunity to do it. We're, there's a good many countries we'd be quite happy to put substantial money into it. And like I say, our experience in Israel has been just terrific. Charlie? Yeah, but the, the corporate acquisition game now is so driven by the, by the leverage buyout and the so-called, uh, what do they call them? Strategic, yes, strategic. Uh, I, I usually translate that into barnyard language. And, <laughs> and we're, we're so, there's so much craziness in price from our viewpoint. Of course, it's very hard for us to do it. The people in the leverage buyout game who love massive leverage and don't mind high prices, even they are getting nosebleeds. It's hard. And it's not an environment that means that it allows Berkshire just to go out and buy a whole lot of companies. Have we, we have ever to, made a strategic we have, deal? We, that you, we have to wait. We made a strategic deal that you can remember. Hmm? Have we ever made a deal that we would have regarded as strategic? We've never had a strategic plan unless you've hidden it from me. <laughs> okay, that answers that. Station six. Hi, I'm Brady Ritchie from St. Louis, Missouri, shareholder since 1996. Terrific. Warren, you and Charlie have been critical of business schools in the past and what they teach. With respect to value investing in super investors of Graham and Doddsville, you featured the returns of many great investors with different backgrounds, work, and education, with the lesson being following the philosophy is the key. To be successful today, does it still just fall back to Chapter 8 of the Intelligent Investor? And what do you think of programs and designations such as CFA, CFP, et cetera, which purport high standards yet rooted heavily into academia? And I'd like to challenge you to a round of bridge tomorrow. <laughs> and what was the last part? <laughs> you, well, you, you start, what do we think about? Yeah, business schools and all that. You business schools yeah. and all that. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't catch the last one. They're better. Oh, he's challenging me to a round of bridge. Okay. The, uh, <laughs> I went to three business schools, and at each, uh, I found a teacher or two, I went to one specifically to get a, t a given teacher, but each one of them I found a teacher or two that I really got a lot out of. Um, the, so we're not anti-business school here at all. We, we do think that the priesthood, uh, say 30 years ago, for example, in terms of, or 40 years ago, in terms of efficient market theory, they, they, they strayed pretty far, in, in our view, from the reality of investing. And I would rather have a person, if I could hire somebody among the top five graduates of number one, two, or three of the business schools, and my choice was somebody that had, uh, was bright, but had chapter eight of the intelligent investor, absolutely, it just was natural to them. They had it in their bones, basically. Um, I, I, take, I take the person from chapter eight. It, it, this is not, what we do is not a complicated business. It's gotta be a disciplined business, but it, is, it does not require a super high Q or anything of the sort. Uh, and um, there are a few fundamentals that are incredibly important, and you do have to understand accounting, and it helps to get out and talk to consumers and start thinking like a consumer in many ways in certain industries and all of that. But it just doesn't require advanced learning. And uh, I, I, I certainly, you know, I didn't want to go to college, so I, I, I don't know whether I would have done better or worse if I'd uh, just quit after high school. Uh, 
you know, and read the books I read and all of that. Uh, I think that if you run into a, a few great teachers and they really change the way you see the world to some degree, you know, you're lucky and you can find them in, you can find them in academia and, and you can find them in ordinary life. And I, I, I've been extraordinarily lucky in having great teachers, in, including Charlie. I mean, Charlie's been a wonderful teacher. And, you know, the, any place you can find somebody that, that gives you insights into things you didn't understand before, maybe makes you a better person than you would have been before, you know, you get, that's very lucky and you want to make the most of it. If you, if you can find it in academia, make the most of it. And if you can find it in the rest of your life, make the most of it. Charlie? Well, when you found Ben Graham, he was unconventional, and he was very smart. And, of course, that was very attractive to you. And then when you found out it worked and you could make a lot of money while you sitting on your ass, of course, you were an instant convert. And, and, and so... It still the, appeals to me, actually, yeah. I mean. <laughs> but... The world changed before he died. Bill Graham, I mean, I mean Ben Graham, recognized that the exact way he sought undervalued companies wouldn't necessarily work for all times under all conditions, and and that's certainly the way it worked for us. We gradually morphed into trying to buy the better companies when they were underpriced instead of the lousy companies when they were underpriced, and and of course that worked pretty well for us, and and but. And Ben Graham, he, he outlived the, the game that he played personally most of the time. He lived to see most of it fade away. I mean, just to find some company that's selling for one third of its working capital and figure out it could easily be liquidated and distribute $3 for every dollar of market price. Lots of luck if you can find those in the present markets. And, and if you can find them, they're so small that Berkshire wouldn't find them of any use anyway. So we, we've had to learn a different game, and that's a lesson for all the young people in the room. If you're going to live a long time, you have to keep learning. Yeah. What you formerly knew is never enough. So if you don't learn to constantly revise your earlier conclusions and get better ones, why, you are, I always use the same metaphor, you're like a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. If anybody has suggestions for another metaphor, send them to me. <laughs> <laughs> Graham, incidentally, one, one point, important point, Graham was not scalable. I mean, you could not do with really big money. Uh, and when I worked for Graham Newman Corp, here he was, the, the dean of all analysts, and, you know, it, he was an intellect above all others around that time. But our, the investment fund was $6 million, and the, and the partnership that worked in tandem with, with the investment company also had about $6 million in it. So we had $12 million bucks we were, we were working with. Now you can make adjustments for inflation but and everything, but it was, it was just a tiny amount. It wasn't, it wasn't really scalable. And, and the, the truth is Graham didn't care because he really wasn't interested in making a lot of money for himself. Uh, so it had no reason to want to find something that could go on and on and become larger and larger. And, and uh, uh, so the utility of Chapter 8 in terms of looking at stocks as a business is of enormous value. The utility of Chapter 20 about a margin of safety is of enormous value. But that's not complicated stuff. Yeah. I finally figured out why the teachers of corporate finance often teach a lot of stuff that's wrong. When I had some eye, eye troubles very early in life, I consulted a very famous eye doctor. And I realized that his place of business was doing a totally obsolete cataract operation. They were still cutting with a knife after better procedures had been invented. And I said, why are you in a great medical school performing absolute obsolete operations? He said, Charlie, it's such a wonderful operation to teach. <laughs> well, that's what happens in corporate finance. They get these formulas, and it's a fine teaching experience. 
you give them a formula, you present the problem, they use the formula. It's, you get a real feeling of worthwhile activity. You know, there's only one trouble, it's all balderdash. Yeah, whenever you hear a theory described as elegant, watch out. You know, right. Okay, Andrew. This question, uh, we got a couple like this one. Uh, comes from Lauren Taylor Wolf, she's managing partner at Impactive Capital. Warren, you've recently said that one of the things that makes you optimistic about America is women entering the workforce and the, quote, doubling of the talent that's effectively employed in that workforce. When it comes to positions of leadership, however, women make up less than 21 percent of boards of S&P 500 companies and an even smaller 5 percent of the CEOs. What can Berkshire do and what is Berkshire specifically doing as a major investor in many of these large companies to advance gender equality both at the board level and among senior leadership? Yeah. Well, again, you know, as I've pointed out in the past, one of my sisters is here, and I have two sisters that are absolutely as smart as I am, and they have better personalities as anybody that knows both of us or all of us can attest. And, and they didn't they remotely have the same opportunities I had. And you have this 1942 or, uh, New York Times and, you know, women could be nurses or teachers or retail clerks or stenographers. And that actually worked enormously to my advantage when I was a kid in Omaha in the 30s because I had way better teachers uh, because they were on, that was a job open to women. I didn't have a single male teacher in grammar school, and Charlie didn't when he went to Dundee, I don't think either. And we had this huge talent pool that was being funneled into very few opportunities, and, and therefore we got better than we deserved in terms of a market system producing it. Uh, the, uh, you know, I, again, our managers run their companies, uh, but I've probably named, before we made this management change, uh, I probably named only six or seven CEOs in the last five or six years. We don't, we don't change that much, but, but uh, I would say that half of them that I've named have been women, which is about what you would, what should, turn out to be the case in terms of ability. Now, there is a certain pipeline problem, but that, that gets cured with time, and you can't use that forever as an excuse. And, uh, you know, I feel very good about the decisions we've made for CEOs. I, I prefer all our CEOs to live forever. And one woman almost did that, that we hired. Mrs. B lived to be 104. She retired at 103, and that's a lesson to our other managers that if you retire prematurely, you know, the, no telling, <laughs> no telling what will happen. Uh, but it is absolutely true that it does make me bullish. It makes me bullish on the human race, but it's certainly on our country, because if you look at what happened, you know, before the 19th Amendment and then after the 19th Amendment for a long time. Uh, and continuing to this day, but it's that 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 there's been significant improvement, and I'm, I do feel more optimistic about the future because I think uh, I think there will be more uh, selection by merit rather than by you know by gender or by race or by by inheritance. Uh, but, uh, I think that if you had a system where all businesses got passed on to the eldest son or something, I think it, I think that society would make a lot less progress than, than one that's merit-based. Charlie? Well, we did live in a different age. There's an old saying that the past is a very strange country. People behave quite differently there. And it was just totally different, and it was ridiculous that I cannot remember. I had one or two male teachers in my hmm. high school, but almost none. And the world has really changed. And it, within Berkshire, I've never seen any overt discrimination anywhere on the grounds of gender. 
There probably has been some, though. I mean, Don't you? Yeah, I'm sure yeah. that we have our oh, share of all the peculiarities yeah. of human nature. Sure. But, but it's, it's generally, not, it's everything is always improved. Yeah. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah. yeah. And and uh, I think it'll keep improving. Okay, Greg. Warren, in this year's annual report, it was noted, much as it is every year, that payments of dividends by the company's insurance subsidiaries are restricted by insurance statutes and other regulations. With Berkshire's insurance operations currently allowed to declare up to $16 billion as ordinary dividends during 2018. My question here is, should we view this annual regulatory threshold for dividends as a benchmark for allowable share repurchases as well? And in the event that Berkshire wanted to buy back more stock than that or pay out even more as dividends, would there be an issue with you using capital from operations that aren't held by the insurance operations to return additional capital? With the side question here being, would the annual cash distribution from BNSF, which is held on national indemnities books, be excluded? Yeah, the, we will obviously follow the rules of the states and the, which were domiciled and well, all the rules, of course, but, but basically it's the state of domestication uh, in the insurance companies, and, and they do restrict the amount of dividends in any given year, although you could, if you wanted to, uh, request uh, some additional amount, but we don't, we don't ever consider that. And, uh, but repurchases, uh, if repurchases were really attractive, we would do it in a very big way. And, you know, I wouldn't rule. There's all kinds of ways that we could arrange things to do either a very large acquisition, which is what I would prefer, or, or a very large repurchase, which I don't think is probably in the cards, uh, um, just because of the way our stock trades, not because we wouldn't like it. it was, at a large discount. So Charlie and I, uh, we've got the appetite, and we would have, we've got a lot of cash, but we could, we could have a lot more cash. We, we, we could make any deal of even one of a very large size. We could make anything that came along. Uh, we, could, we could work out how to get it done. We would, we would have, we're not going to be doing this, but we would have partners who would come in and give us a preferential uh, part of a partnership? Uh, uh, that's way. That's not like. That's not going to happen in all probability. But there's a lot of things that we could do. So don't don't rule out anything based on on statutory limitations of distributions from insurance companies. And that we could get special permissions to. Oh, we can get declare bigger dividends. We are not. You should not assume that we're constrained by the laws of nature to the amount that we can take out under the statutes now. Okay, Station 7. Hi, Warren, Charlie. Thank you for everything. I'm David from Kinga Global, an investment manager in Shanghai. I've been here for eight years. If investments are sport in the Olympics, you are our champion team. So my question is, facing the fast-growing machine intelligence, how would you see the new competition impact the capital allocation productivity in the future? For Charlie, what is the first principle of capital allocation from general economic interest point of view? Thank you. Well, two questions, machine intelligence. I'm afraid the only intelligence I have is, is being provided by something that's not a machine. And I don't think I'm going to learn machine intelligence. Yeah, if you ask me how to beat the game of Go with my own intelligence, I couldn't do it. And I think it's too old for me to learn computer science. Generally, I'm, I think that the machine intelligence has worked. After all, a machine now can beat the best human player of Go. But I think there's more hype in that field than there is probable achievement. Yeah, so 
I, I don't think the world is going to be changed that much by, by machine intelligence. Some, but not, not hugely. And, and what was the other question? Well, one was machine intelligence. I think he was getting a capital allocation. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's such a general question. Generally speaking, we're always trying to get the best, to get something that's worth buying. And the human mind rejects that if you're in academia because you could come in and make one declaratory sentence at the opening of the semester and you wouldn't have anything to do for the rest of, the, of your time. So people want to find some formula. It's what I call physics envy. These people want the world to be like physics. But the world isn't like physics outside of physics. And that false precision just does nothing but get you in trouble. So I would, I would say you've got to master the general ideas and you've got to work to improve your judgment slowly the way all the rest of us had. And I, I don't think most individuals have much hope of individual gain from machine intelligence. No, I don't. I don't think that, I'm impressed when machines beat Go or something of the sort, or, or even win the chess or whatever it may be. I don't really think they bring much to the table in terms of capital allocation or investing. And then I may be missing something entirely, you know, maybe I'm just blind to what's out there. You're missing a lot of very remunerative fee-earning twaddle. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> Well, that takes care of that, so we'll go on to Station 8. <laughs> um, dear Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger, thank you very much for hosting the meeting. It's truly been a remarkable. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yan, and I'm a partner at Tiger Brokers, a leading electronic brokerage firm from China. Uh, let me, uh, let me rephrase that. So uh, I and my colleagues flew half away from the globe with uh, Aichi and Fantox to be here. And then it's honored, just like everyone else in the stadium, we're honored to be here. My question is, uh, you mentioned earlier that investors don't really have to be struggling in picking the right stocks. They would do well in picking probably the right market on the right country. China is the second largest economy and probably has the biggest growth potential. Just by passively weighting a portfolio, by passively evaluating a portfolio, U.S. investors are significantly underweighting China. So in your opinion, what are stopping the investors from investing in China? Thank you. Well, I think the answer is that you're absolutely right, that we are, American investors are missing China, and they're missing it because it's a long way away. It looks different. They're not used to it. It's complicated. The headlines confuse them. In other words, it, it just looks too hard, sitting in Omaha, to, to outsmart the Chinese market. But I think you're absolutely right. It's where they should be looking. Okay, Dan. We've actually had a couple of investments in China. We actually, we've, we've done pretty well, but uh, there were, you know, there, there, well, if you go back a number of years, one of the better uh, In terms of getting a lot of money into something, you know, many billions, and we have to get billions into things to, to move any kind of a needle, that, that can be tougher in, in markets that, uh, that you've got, you're unfamiliar working in, and it's, it's difficult under any circumstances. But, but accumulating a six or eight or ten billion dollar position in in investments outside the United States can be very difficult. For example, in in UK and much of Europe. We have to report when we own 3% of a company. In fact, we can be asked to report if we even have less than 
that really gets very tough when we get a bunch of followers and a lot of publicity that probably isn't deserved in terms of what we're doing in the markets and everything. So it, uh, some of the problems are just by the nature of our size. It would be a lot, e it, it'd be a lot easier for running a smaller fund. PetroChina, we managed to get a very big position, but the government owned 90% of it, so we bought 14% of what the government didn't own, but it was still only 1.4% of the company. Uh, uh, but Charlie, Charlie actually keeps pushing me to do more in China, and we've tried a couple of times actually. And uh, there was there was one operation that we got involved in. Well, you did so partly the first time. You put in 200,000 and got about two billion. So yeah, yeah. No. It wasn't encouraging enough. <laughs> Okay, Station 9. <laughs> uh, my name is uh, Dr. Sherman Silver. I'm an infertility doctor from St. Louis, and uh, I've uh, been a, a shareholder in coming to this meeting for 23 years, and I want to thank you very much for making my grandchildren very rich. <laughs> <laughs> And they sometimes compare me in the medical world, to infertility uh, world, as the uh, uh, Berkshire Hathaway of infertility because I'm so old and I come from a relatively small community. But uh, I'm wondering about your interest in not just Apple, but all of the tech stocks like Amazon and Google, because you've avoided them, you stated in the past, because they're complicated, you should stick with something you understand. On the other hand, Amazon and Google have what you call a very durable competitive advantage. They really hardly have any competitor. And that's true in China, too, of Alibaba and Tencent. So it seems like it's a conflict, and I'm wondering if you're going to be turning the corner and going into these tech companies that seem to have no serious competition. Well, we certainly looked at them, and we, we, we don't think of whether we should be in tech companies or not or that sort of thing. We, we are looking for things where we, we do get into the durability of the competitive advantage and whether we think that our opinion is, might be better than other people's opinion in assessing the probability of the durability, in the, uh, so to speak. Uh, but the truth is that uh, I've watched Amazon from the start, and I, I think what Jeff Bezos has has done is something close to a miracle. And, and the problem is if I think something will be a miracle, I tend not to bet on it. Uh, the, uh, uh, it would have been better, far better, obviously, if, we, if I'd had some insights into certain businesses. But, you know, in fact, Bill told me early on, Bill Gates told me early on, you know, that that I think I was on all of this, and he suggested I turn to Google. But the trouble is, I I saw that Google was was uh, was skipping past all of this, and then I wondered if anybody could skip past Google. So, and I saw at Geico that we were paying a lot of money for something that cost them nothing incrementally. So we've looked at it, and you know, I made a mistake in in in, in not being able to come to a conclusion where I really felt that, that at the present prices that, that the prospects were far better than the prices indicated. And uh, uh, I didn't go into Apple because it was a tech stock in the least. I mean, that, I went into Apple because I made certain, came to certain conclusions about, about both the intelligence with, with the capital would be employed, but more important, about the value of an ecosystem and how permanent that ecosystem could be and what the threats were to it and a whole bunch of things. And uh, that didn't, I don't think that required me to, you know, take apart an iPhone or something and figure out what all the components were or anything. It, it, it was more, it's much more the nature of consumer behavior. And some things uh, strike me as having a lot more permits than others. But the answer is, We'll miss a lot of things that, or I'll miss a lot of things that, that I don't feel I understand well enough. And there's, there's, there is no penalty 
in investing if you don't swing a, a ball that's in the strike zone. As long as you swing at something at some point, and you know, eventually that you find the pitch, pitches you like. And that's the way we'll continue to do it. We'll try to stay within our circle of competence. And, and uh, Charlie and I generally agree on, on uh, sort of where that circle ends and uh, what, what kind of situations where we might have some kind of an edge in our reasoning or our experience or something that uh, where we might evaluate something differently than other people. But the answer is uh, we're going to miss a lot of things. Charlie? Yeah, we have a wonderful system. If one of us is stupid in some area, so is the other. <laughs> and of course, we were not ideally located to be high-tech wizards. You know, uh, how many people of our age quickly mastered Google? I've been to Google headquarters. They look to me like they're, it looks like a kindergarten. <laughs> <laughs> a very rich kindergarten. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's extraordinarily impressive what they've done. And uh, like I say, at the ICO, we were paying them a lot of money uh, at the time they went public. And, and, and all three of them, the main characters, Eric and Larry and Sergei, uh, they actually came and saw me, but they were more interested in talking about going public and the mechanics of it and various things along that line. But it wasn't like what they were doing was a mystery to me. The mystery was how much competition would come along and how effective they would be, uh, and whether it would be a game where four or five people were slugging it out without making as much money as they could if one company dominated. Those are, those are tough decisions to make. You can have industries where there's only two people in it, and they still aren't very, very good because they beat each other's brains out, and that's one of the questions in the airline business. It's, it's a better business now than it used to be, but, but it used to be suicide. So, uh, and you know that the competitive uh, the competitive factors are are extraordinary in in airlines. And how much better business is it with with uh, four people operating at 85 percent capacity than it was at with seven or eight operating in the mid 70s and with more planes around? Those are tough decisions, but. Uh, I made the wrong decision on, on Google and Amazon. I just, I really consider that a miracle that you could be doing Amazon web services and, and changing retail at the same time uh, with, you know, without enormous amounts of capital and do it with the speed and effectiveness of what Amazon has done. I just, I would, I underestimated uh, I had a very, very, very high opinion of Jeff's ability when I first met him, and I underestimated him. <laughs> Charlie? Well, my comment would be that the shareholders have one thing to be thankful for. Some of the age-related stupidity at headquarters has been ameliorated by Ted and Todd joining us. We are looking at the world with the aid of some younger eyes now, and they've had a contribution Significant. beyond their own investments. And so you're, you're very lucky to have them, you shareholders, because there's a lot of ignorance in the older generation that needs removal. OK, Station 10. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Warren. Good afternoon, Charlie. And my name is Yu Jun. I come from China, and I work for Hen Tian Cai Fu Family Office. And we are serving high worth individual clients in China. And you two will be my dream customer. Um, I know you, your shareholder Bill Gates has a family office which uh, helping his wealthy. So my question is, do you have a family office? And uh, 
uh, what can can we know what they do some anything for you and if not are you planning to have a family office in the future we already have a family uh, office it's sitting right here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we we would be the last guys in the world to have a family office actually <laughs> but there are a lot of them around and, and uh, but it's uh, it's not something that that fit the Munger family or the Muffet family. <laughs> Charlie, you have anything? Oh, it, no, okay. We, let's, we'll do one more. Station 11. Hi, Warren, Charlie. My name is Adam Mead, Mead Capital Management from Derry, New Hampshire. In the past, you have touched on certain compensation arrangements with key executives. Could you please provide some specific examples of compensation arrangements within Berkshire that speak to incentivizing good behavior while not penalizing the manager for size or the relative ease or difficulty of the business or industry? Thank you. Well, that is a very, very good question and a very, very tough question because uh, Some of our, he really doesn't want to answer. Well, some of our managers, <laughs> no, some of our, some of our managers are in businesses that are just much easier. I mean, we we bought into a variety of businesses. People are obviously influenced by what pay arrangements are elsewhere. It wouldn't be human if if they weren't. And uh, trying to trying to come to the right answer. When you have different degrees of capital intensity, different degree, very different degrees of of basic profitability, uh, and how much you scale up based on size, because there is an incentive incentive to grow businesses. If, usually, if businesses get much larger, everybody from the CEO down expects to earn more money for something that we where they really bring the same amount of amount of intensity and work and ability to it. It is really a tough question. I think that that uh, uh, if you engage compensation consultants at public companies, which they all do, they're going to they're going to recommend things that cause them to have CEOs recommend them to other companies. Uh, it's just you're working against human nature uh, uh, when you have an arrangement like that. I would say that we have obviously kept a very, very, very high percentage of the managers that we hope to have stay with us, in fact, just about 100 percent. It's, it's, uh, and I think people do like, they do like to make their own decisions. They do like recognition, you know. They, they, most people respond. They they like doing a good job, and they like they like the fact that we understand it. And compensation is part of it, that, but it's not the whole thing. Uh, and uh, I wish I could give you some precise formulas, but I there aren't you really any. don't, Warren. But we, we, it's an advantage at Berkshire to keep our individual deals private. There would be no advantage to just pub publishing them all. No, we're not going to do that. No, of course not. So what we're saying, he, he makes all those decisions personally. He's got every formula in the book, and he keeps them all private. That's our system. Well, we, we, we do. <laughs> we publish what the directors are paid. We publish what we have to, yes. Yeah. <laughs> OK. It's, it's 3.30 now. We're going to reconvene at 3.45. Charlie and I. We love the fact that our partners basically turn out for this. So we, we thank you for coming. I hope you've had a good time, both at the meeting and in Omaha, and we look forward to seeing you again next year. Thanks. All right, hello, and welcome back to Yahoo Finance's coverage of Berkshire Hathaway's annual meeting live from the CenturyLink Center 
in Omaha, Nebraska. I'm Andy Serwer here with my co-host, Jen Rogers. So as expected in the afternoon session, we had multiple questions about Apple. It came up a bunch, uh, Apple versus Microsoft, Apple and its cash. Uh, then just really in the last few minutes, uh, talking about Google, so many uh, companies coming up. Yeah, I also thought there was a tremendous amount of conversation about China and trade and tariffs. In fact, I've never heard so much talk about that at mm -hmm. this meeting. But you know, Glenn Close said it best. She said, it's always the same and it's always different. And it's always different because of the news yep. and the changes in Berkshire Hathaway in terms of their investments and the investment environment that changes as well. Yeah, definitely a lot on China there. Uh, let's bring in uh, Miles Udland. He is on the floor for us. He'd been in the press box. Miles, what's your big takeaway? Yeah, you know, Andy mentioned there talking about Apple, and I think uh, people who are watching the meeting, people who saw the beginning of the second half, they'll remember Daphne, the eight-year-old girl from New York City who brought up the question about Berkshire's investments in more asset light businesses. And then Buffett eventually, later in the meeting, in response to a different question, talked about the asset light nature of the U.S. economy. I think Apple plays into that theme quite a bit. So if I had to define a second half theme, it would be the asset light nature of sort of modern commerce. The beginning, to Andy's point, a lot of discussion about China and moat was a word that came up a number of times. Elon Musk got mentioned in that. And then, of course, Wells Fargo really didn't change their tune there. This is now the second year in a row that Buffett has essentially said, well, there was an incentive problem, but I'm not too worried about what happened at the bank. I think we need to track down Daphne. You know, we live in the same city as Daphne. Maybe we can get her to, to come on when we get back to New York. A lot uh, of smart <laughs> young people in New York. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, let's bring in value investor John Rogers right now, chairman and CEO of Aerial Investments with over 13 billion under management. Welcome. It's great to be here. So why do you come every year? What keeps bringing you back? Well, one, I have so much respect for Warren Buffett. It's just great to be here and, uh, you know, see him answer the questions every year. But it's also kind of a value investor's convention. You see great value investors everywhere. I spent a lot of time this weekend with Mario Gabelli, for example. My friend Tom Russo's here. It's just a great place to network, get great ideas, share ideas. John, you said that you founded your firm in 1986, the same year that Gabelli did. And, you know, I think it really speaks to your ability to create a sustainable business model as an investment firm. Not easy to do. To what do you owe your success? Well, I think, um, well, for Mario and I, you know, we both, there were six of us who started our mutual funds in 1986 that are still active today. And I think part of it is that we have the, maybe the intestinal fortitude to deal with the inevitable dramatic ups and downs in the market and the ability to be contrarians, um, to buy when others are selling and not chase the latest fad of the moment. And I think most importantly, like Warren talks about, have that long-term perspective to really keep looking out over the horizon and not get swept up in all the energy and passions of the moment. So uh, we all cover the market on a daily basis. 2018 has really seen a return to volatility. I'm interested on your outlook for the balance of the year. Well, I'm quite optimistic. I continue to think that the uh, tax reform has been a big deal, generating lots of cash for companies. And I think the regulatory reform sometimes is uh, underestimated how powerful and important that's going to be to the profitability of American businesses. And then finally, with these low interest rates, uh, valuations are not that high. And there's a lot of pessimism still out there. I'm involved with a lot of investment committees. And you know, people keep thinking the market's going to collapse because it's had this long bull market. And when everyone's worried about a market collapse, it usually doesn't happen. So John, you are one of the leading business lights of the city of Chicago, your town. Um, obviously Chicago has some issues and you know, a lot of other cities do as well. Do you feel like the political environment can improve so that we can start addressing problems like infrastructure um, and, and those types of issues? I think in Chicago we are well positioned. Um, we're getting better and better. We're getting stronger and stronger. Uh, we have experienced leaders, you know, in place. Um, and we have some great people who've come back actually from uh, the Obama administration to pitch in. You know, people like Valerie Jarrett and Arnie Duncan. You know, Arnie's working on this extraordinary work to uh, help young men of color uh, get great career paths and stay away from the gang life. And it's great to have all this talent coming back to our hometown to pitch in and help keep the company, keep, help keep the city going in the right direction. So you're sticking around tonight. Uh, as you said, it's a time to network and socialize and see people. What do you think everyone's going to be talking about from the Q&A sessions? 
Well, I think there's going to be a lot of conversation about the China. You know, I've already at the luncheon after uh, the morning session, people talked about how important China is going to be, uh, how important a country it's going to be as, as, the, as the world evolves over the next 30 to 40 and 50 years. And uh, I think that's going to be the thing that people are going to talk about. This trade war that we have will be temporary and that our two nations will be the ones that will really survive and thrive over the next 30 to 50 years. Um, so would you agree with Charlie Munger that Americans are underweight China? right now in their investment portfolios? Are we not giving it the, um, the attention that we should be? I think so. I think people have underestimated the power of the economic engine there and how they really are getting things going in the right direction. All right, John, not to harp on the longevity issue. We've both been around in this business for a while. Yeah. And my question is, so for young people starting out, I mean, you started in 86, started with your fund, I should say. Is it still the same type of business to get into? Is it still a good business for young people to get into today? I tell young people I think it is a great business. I spoke to a young, a group of uh, young African-American females here yesterday for lunch. Had about a dozen people and they were concerned about their children's uh, economic futures and how to build wealth in the African-American community and I told them get into the financial services world. Get your kids involved with financial services. There's going to be a lot of wealth created. And one place that I talked about that people often don't think about is go and work for your college endowment. You know, there are so many huge endowments now that are 10, 20, 30 billion dollars. They've got lots of jobs, lots of opportunities to learn about all the different sectors of this great industry. So I tell young people, think about working for your alma mater. You know, you can give back and actually do really well at the same time. And learn. And learn an awful lot. John Rogers, thanks so much for coming. I don't know, uh, we talked about you being from Chicago. Have you gone down and filled out our little map? downstairs on your way out. You can go and stop by and see Julia LaRoche, who we are going to toss it over to right now. She's been uh, keeping track of where everybody is coming from at this yeah, we meeting. We need to check in, John. Yeah, so we'll go check in. John, thank you so much. Thanks All right, coming. Julia, what do you got there? A family. Yes, definitely come check in. We've had 284 unique locations. Obviously, Omaha is number one in the states, followed by San Francisco. We have Kansas City and Minneapolis up there. And then internationally, the biggest uh, populations we're seeing are coming from Singapore and Beijing. And we are joined by the Rink family from San Francisco. We have Ray, Sarah, and their two kids, Kennedy and Benjamin. Now, Benjamin, what have you learned from Warren Buffett? Uh, a lasting takes time. And Kennedy, what have you learned from Warren Buffett? When he dies, he wants to be known as a teacher. And see, that's what it's all about. Thousands of people come here to learn from the Oracle of Omaha and Charlie Munger, and they want to learn about him being a teacher and, and sharing that with the next generation. And I know that you all, this is your first time bringing your children. Why did you decide to do that? Uh, this is something my dad used to do with me over 10 years ago. He finally decided he wanted to attend online, and so I said, well, I'll pass the baton on and, and start having my kids attend. That's great. Well, thank you for being here, and it's back to you guys. All right, thanks a lot, Julia. Joining us now, the governor of Nebraska, Pete Ricketts. Thank you so much, Governor, for stopping by. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. So how big a deal is this annual meeting for the state of Nebraska? Well, this is a, a huge deal. Uh, obviously, you know, they sold out a record number we of We're actually going to go back. Sorry to interrupt oh. you, Governor Ricketts, but they are starting the business oh, meeting I'm... right now, so we are going to go back Sorry. real quick. Oh, we are going to get <laughs> to talk to you. It's not often we tell a governor back to, to I really Buffett and Munger. No I'm the board of directors of the company, and I welcome you to this 2018 annual meeting of shareholders. This morning, I introduced the Berkshire out the way directors that are present, and also with us today are partners in the firm of Deloitte & Touche, our auditors. Jennifer Tondas is Assistant Secretary of Berkshire Hathaway. She will make a written record of the proceedings. Becky Hammock has been appointed Inspector of Elections at this meeting, and she will certify to the count of votes cast in the election for directors and the motion to be voted upon at the meeting. The name proxy holders for this meeting are Walter Scott, and Mark Hamburg. Does the Assistant Secretary have a report of the number of Berkshire shares outstanding entitled to vote and represented at the meeting? This is the important part. Hey, can you sit there? <laughs> We're building the suspense here. <laughs> Yes, I do. 
As indicated in the proxy statement that accompanied the notice of this meeting that was sent to all shareholders of record on March 7, 2018, the record date for this meeting, there were 748,347 shares of Class A Berkshire Hathaway common stock outstanding with each share entitled to one vote on motions considered at the meeting and 1,344,969,701 shares of Class B Berkshire Hathaway common stock outstanding with each share entitled to one ten thousandth of one vote on motions considered at the meeting. Of that number, 537,524 Class A shares and 823,145,874 Class B shares are represented at this meeting by proxies returned through Thursday evening, May 3rd. Thank you. That number represents a quorum, and we will therefore directly proceed with the meeting. First order of business will be a reading of the minutes of the last meeting of shareholders. I recognize Mr. Walter Scott, who will place a motion before the meeting. I move that the reading of the minutes of the last meeting of shareholders be dispensed with and the minutes be approved. Do I hear a second? I second the motion. Motion has been moved and seconded. We will vote on this motion by voice vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion is carried. The next item of business is to elect directors. If a shareholder is present who did not send in a proxy or wishes to withdraw a proxy previously sent in, you may vote in person on the election of directors and other matters to be considered at this meeting. Please identify yourself to one of the uh, meeting officials in the aisles so that you can receive a ballot. I recognize Mr. Walter Scott to place a motion before the meeting with respect to the election of directors. I move that Warren Buffett, Charles Munger, Greg Abel, Howard Buffett, Stephen Burke, Susan Decker, William Gates, David Gottesman, Charlotte Guyman, Ajit Jain, Thomas Murphy, Ron Olson, Walter Scott, and Merle Whitmer be elected as directors. Is there a second? I second the motion. It has been moved and seconded that Warren Buffett, Charles Munger, Gregory Abel, Howard Buffett, Stephen Burke, Susan Decker, <clears throat> William Gates, David Gottesman, Charlotte Guyman, Ajit Jain, Thomas Murphy, Ronald Olson, Walter Scott, and Merrill Whitmer be elected as directors. Are there any other nominations or any discussion? The nominations are ready to be acted upon. If there are any shareholders voting in person, they should not. Now mark their ballots on the election of directors and deliver their ballots to one of the meeting officials in the aisles. Ms. Amick, when you are ready, may I give you your report? My report is ready. The ballot of the proxy holders in response to proxies that were received through last Thursday evening cast not less than 605,906 votes for each nominee. That number exceeds a majority of the number of the total votes of all Class A and Class B shares outstanding. The certification required by Delaware law of the precise count of the votes will be given to the Secretary to be placed with the minutes of this meeting. Thank you, Ms. Amick. Warren Buffett, Charles Munger, Greg Abel, Howard Buffett, Steve Burke, Susan Decker, William Gates, David Gottesman, Charlotte Guyman, Ajit Jain, Thomas Murphy, Ronald Wilson, Walter Scott, and Merrill Whitner have been elected as directors. The next item of business is a motion put forth by Frida Cathcart on behalf of shareholder Marcia Sage. The motion is set forth in the proxy statement. The motion requests that the company provide a report reviewing the company's policies, actions, plans, and reduction targets related to methane emissions from all operations. The, director, the directors have recommended that the shareholders vote against the proposal. I will now recognize Ms. Cathcart to present the motion. To allow, allow all interested shareholders to present their views, I ask that the representative of Baldwin Brothers limit the present presentation of the motion to five minutes. Good morning, Chairman <coughs> Buffett, Mr. Munger, members of the board, and fellow shareholders. I am presenting this proposal on behalf of Baldwin Brothers on the issue of methane asset risk. This is the second year for this methane-focused proposal. Last year, 10% of shareholders approved of it. 
Methane asset risk is a serious financial safety and environmental issue across the entire natural gas supply chain. The failure of a gas injection well at Southern California Gas Aliso Canyon Storage Facility in Los Angeles revealed major vulnerabilities in the maintenance and safety of natural gas facilities. In that situation, cleanup and containment costs have soared to close to $1 billion. Governor Jerry Brown of California has threatened to shut down the facility. Berkshire Hathaway owns the largest interstate natural gas pipeline system in the, Uni in the United States. It has natural gas storage, distribution, and transportation facilities that may face similar safety risks through the Northern Natural Gas Company, Kern River Gas, and Mid-American Energy Corporations. On an environmental front, research indicates methane leaks could erase the climate benefits of reducing coal use to meet internationally agreed upon climate change targets. Methane emissions have an impact on global temperature of roughly 84 times that of CO2 over a 20-year period. <clears throat> Berkshire is a voluntary member of the EPA's Methane Challenge and One Future Emissions Intensity Commitment Framework and should be applauded for reducing its leakage rates to below the 1% target along its value chain. Since this framework is a cost-effective versus prescriptive approach, shareholders would like to understand if this cost-effective approach employed at Berkshire is sufficient maintenance and enhanced disclosure should help mitigate the potential for these financial and regulatory risks. In closing, we think it prudent that Berkshire Hathaway issue a report reviewing and disclosing the company's specific best practices, policies, and safety standards for methane assets and required upgrade costs to facilities to mitigate potential business risks. The report would make it easier for investors, customers, and regulators to understand Berkshire's overall approach to managing methane emissions and risks. Thank you for your consideration. Um, Ms. Cathcart, Car could you help me out? Are there some other people there to speak? I can't quite see from here. No, there are no other shareholders who wish to speak on this issue. There, there's nobody behind me to speak. Did you get that, John? No. The, uh, Greg, could we put up slide one, and then if somebody will give Greg a uh, microphone, I'd be helpful. Uh, he could elaborate some on this chart and okay. what else we're doing. Thanks, uh, thanks, Warren, and uh, appreciate the comments there. What we've uh, prepared here is in response to the proposal. It demonstrates the One Future Initiative goal as it was highlighted. They'd like to see our pipelines operating by 2025 at a 1 percent throughput or, or loss of throughput at 1 percent. I'm happy to report, as the slide shows, that in 2017, our throughput loss was 0.046 percent, 20 times better than the request in 2025. <clears throat> Thank you. It's a great compliment to our operating team, obviously. They take the issue that it's been highlighted very seriously. I would also add, as it was noted, we're part of the EPA program where we report on a voluntary basis. Our practices are disclosed and reviewed by the EPA and additionally added on our, our website. Accordingly, I, th I strongly feel we're getting the results in, in disclosing the appropriate information. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and thanks, Greg. And uh, Ms. Cathcar, we, we are on the same uh, we're on the same side you are on this, basically. Uh, we, just, we just are not, we're not looking for ways to conduct more studies and prepare re uh, reports that may 
cost us money and generate more reports and all of that. But I, I can tell you two things. Uh, this is something that is reported to the board directors of Berkshire Hathaway Energy uh, quarterly, and I'm on that, I'm on that board, and, and uh, uh, we believe in achieving the same ends, and we think Berkshire Hathaway Energy is, is both, both sensitive and effective, sensitive to and effective in, 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 in reducing methane emissions. Uh, uh, so if uh, I think we are now ready, the motion is now ready to be acted upon. If there are any shareholders voting in person, they should now mark their ballots on the motion and deliver their ballot to one of the meeting officials in the aisles. Ms. Amick, when you're ready, you may give your report. My report is ready. The ballot of the proxy holders in response to proxies that were received through last Thursday evening cast 48,040 votes for the motion and 558,640 votes against the motion. As the number of votes against the motion exceeds a majority of the number of votes of all Class A and Class B shares properly cast on the matter, as well as all votes outstanding, the motion has failed. The certification required by Delaware law of the precise count of the votes will be given to the secretary to be placed with the minutes of this meeting. Thank you, Ms. Amick. The proposal fails. The next item of business is a motion put forth by shareholder Frieda Cathcart. The motion is set forth in the proxy statement. The motion requests that Berkshire adopt a policy to encourage more Berkshire subsidiary companies to issue issue annual sustainability reports. Um, I will now recognize Frieda Cathcart to present the motion and to all interested shareholders to present their views, I ask um, her to limit her remarks to five minutes. You have the floor, Ms. Cathcart. Thank you so much. It is a privilege to be here and a privilege I can give thanks to my grandfather, James Cathcart, who started out in the mailroom of Jen Ree and worked himself up through the company to become the chair of Genry. During that time, he accumulated a lot of Genry stock, which he bestowed generously upon his family. And when he did so, he encouraged the members of his family to do good and to pay it forward, to do something that would make a difference in the world and in our communities. For my father, he did so by being philanthropic with educational institutions, with the theory that if you f give a person a fish, you feed them for a day, but if you teach them to fish, you feed them for a lifetime. My focus has been on the environment, with the thought that when people fish, it would be nice if they were able to eat the fish. I want to take this opportunity to clarify my proposal about the sustainability reports and put the emphasis on the word encourage. It is evident that Berkshire Hathaway's ma management of allowing the subsidiaries to work um, without getting guide well, mandates from you is being very successful. And I wouldn't recommend changing it. You're doing a great job. Please keep it up. Um, but I do think that there's something to be said to encourage them and support them in many ways you already are. There is a high level of interest from investors and the public in corporate social responsibility. One-fifth of investments are based on socially responsible investment strategies. And back in 2012, I found an article by Planet Earth Herald where they wrote, when Warren Buffett talks, people listen. He is now talking about the environment. He believes that companies need to have a triple bottom line, and respecting the environment is absolutely critical to a company's economic performance. In times, then this is a direct quote from you, Mr. Buffett. In times such as these, a company must invest in the key ingredients of profitability. It's people, communities, and the environment. One third of Berkshire Hathaway sub subsidiaries already have a sustainability presence on the web. Um, and one of them is Berkshire Energy that has the acronym 
RESPECT, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, which stands for Responsibility, Efficiency, Stewardship, Performance, Communication, and Training. And Berkshire Hathaway provides an annual sustainability summit to help bring the subsidiaries together so they can learn how to be more sustainable, how to share tips, and how to be profitable. And that's excellent. But when I tried to find a web presence about the Sustainability Summit, I wasn't able to find it. And that's where I think that we can do a better job in Berkshire half the way when it comes to communication with our shareholders and with the outside world about the good work that we're doing. A simple solution to that would be to create a link on the Berkshire Hathaway website to sustainability that people could click on and go and find out about initiatives like the Sustainability Summit. And from there, perhaps, they could click on to go to the subsidiaries that have a web presence about sustainability to see what they're doing. And doing so, we give a window to the world where they can see what we're doing to make a difference that might inspire other corporations to follow the example. Or perhaps a college student working on a paper would read about it and think that that is a good business model, that that's something that he wants to bring forward when he goes into his career. There is a Facebook page called Berkshire Hathaway Sustainability that will be available for shareholders in the outside world to look at, to see research, and to encourage each other to learn how we can support sustainability practices. And that is available now. I greatly appreciate this opportunity to speak with you today and to clarify what my proposal is. And I do greatly applaud and appreciate all the work that you're doing on behalf of our corporation and the world. Thank you so much. And thank you. Uh, many of the managers, a great many of the managers of Berkshire are here and, and are listening to you. Uh, uh, and I suspect that uh, a very high percentage of them agree with what you're saying, uh, whether they, what they do in terms of web pages and so on, uh, in our view, is basically up to them. But I can tell you that one leading proponent, as you mentioned, uh, uh, was Greg Abel, who until recently was running Berkshire Hathaway Energy and now is vice chairman. And Greg may want to say a few words on this, too. And, uh, but I can assure you our managers are listening to you. Thanks, Warren. Yeah, we do uh, everything that was touched on. I'll just maybe add a few points for our, for our shareholders. Obviously, sustainability is a priority for Berkshire and each of our operating subsidiaries. It was highlighted that a number of them have sustainability reports, but I would go beyond that. If you go to our various companies' websites, you'll see specific actions they're taking relative to sustainability. So it may not be summarized in a specific report, but that type of information is available. I can also add that when you think of the Berkshire Hathaway Energy uh, Corporation, we're trying to lead by example with support from Warren Charlie, Walter Scott. I'm happy to report if you look at where our energy production is right now at the end of 2017, 50% of our energy that is produced and consumed by our customers comes from renewable energy. That's something we're strongly communicating across the, the U.S. and globally as an example of what can be done in our industry. And I'm happy to report by the end of 2021, 100% of the energy utilized by our customers can be met through renewable energy in Iowa. So I understand uh, the concept of sustainability. We're working across that, across our organizations to share best practices, but as Warren highlighted, it really resides in each of our companies, but they'll be, it will be encouraged, and uh, you'll continue to see great results. Thank you. Thank you. The motion is now ready to be acted upon. If there are any shareholders voting in person, they should now mark their ballot on the motion and deliver their ballot to one of the meeting officials in the aisles. 
Zamek, when you're ready, you may give your report. My report is ready. The ballot of the proxy holders in response to proxies that were received through last Thursday evening cast 67,282 votes for the motion and 544,256 votes against the motion. As the number of votes against the motion exceeds a majority of the number of votes of all Class A and Class B shares properly cast on the matter, as well as all votes outstanding, the motion has failed. The certification required by Delaware law of the precise count of the votes will be given to the secretary to be placed with the minutes of this meeting. Uh, thank you, Ms. Hamigan. I would say, Ms. Cashcart, our managers have heard you. I mean, you have, you have had an impact, and I'm, I appreciate what you've done. Uh, Walter, and I guess we're now ready for motion. I move this meeting be adjourned. Is there a second? I second the motion. A motion to adjourn has been made and seconded. We will vote by voice. Is there any discussion? If not, all. If not, all in favor say aye. All opposed, no. The meeting is adjourned, and thank you again for coming. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance's live coverage of the 2018 Berkshire Hathaway Annual Shareholders Meeting. The business of the day has wrapped up, but we still have a little bit more here from the CenturyLink Center, Jen. Yeah, we want to start with Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts. We had just begun our interview with the governor when the Berkshire Hathaway business meeting began. So we got to talk with him a little bit while some of the uh, business was going on. Uh, here's a look. Joining us now is Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts. Governor Ricketts, great to see you. Great to be here, thank you very much. So let me ask you about this meeting. How big a deal is the Berkshire Hathaway meeting to the state of Nebraska? Well, this is a huge deal. As you know, they sold a record number of tickets, uh, over 42,000, and this is something that allows us at the state to be able to showcase the state and really show off all the wonderful things. Omaha is just a brilliant community. Uh, we've got so many great, hardworking people here, so it really is a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to tell the world our story. Uh, one part of that story that we have learned uh, this week being here is how low your unemployment rate is. It's below 3%. Yeah, 2.8. That's gonna, it's got to be a challenge, though. We've been talking to you know, business leaders just about hiring. How do you uh, stay competitive with that? Yeah, we've got uh, like the fifth lowest unemployment rate in the country, 2.8%, the lowest we've had since 1999. But one of the things we do to uh, really kind of be innovative about how we connect companies with people is we've changed our unemployment system into a reemployment system. And by that I mean we're requiring everybody seeking those benefits to sit down with a jobs coach first, create a resume, get job, pointing to job training, how to find that, you know, tips on finding the next best thing. So we've actually reduced the amount of time people are spending unemployed, reduced the amount of claims being paid out, and that's allowed us to reduce our unemployment insurance tax as well, saving Nebraska businesses last year about $20 million. So, uh, by the way, I like your Nebraska red tie thanks, there. Thanks, It's looking good. So, obviously, Nebraska, huge agricultural state, and you export a tremendous amount of those products to China. And my question, of course, is where do things stand right now with the trade friction that we're seeing? Well, actually, the president invited us out to the White House, when I say us, and a number of lawmakers from the Midwest uh, about three weeks ago to talk about agriculture and trade. And I would say, you know, farmers and ranchers in Nebraska are nervous about the potential for retaliatory tariffs from China. And we want to see how this all works out, but we also have time. Uh, we're just now getting to planting season, for example, for soybeans. So we won't be in harvest for several months. Uh, obviously, China has still got some time before they would actually implement some of these tariffs. So what we're really just looking for is, you know, we know China has to be held accountable. Our farmers and ranchers get that. Uh, with regard to things like intellectual property, but we want to see this trade deal get worked out and make sure that there aren't any tariffs put on our agricultural products because we don't want to have our farmers and ranchers impacted. And it's not just China. Uh, Japan is a big trading partner for Nebraska Absolutely. as well. Uh, so talk to us about TPP and also NAFTA and what those mean and what you for Nebraska and what you think is going to happen on both those fronts. Yeah, so I actually had a chance to talk to the president when he was still a candidate about TPP, and as you know, he's not a fan of TPP. Uh, at the same meeting we had a few weeks ago, he did express an openness to taking a look at TPP, which is certainly quite different from where he's been in the past, though he was very clear he prefers bilateral trade agreements. So I don't have a big preference either as long as we get that trade agreement with, with Japan. So again, we just encourage him to get that trade deal done. 
Uh, Japan is a huge market for us for our, our beef, our pork. Uh, we've had, just uh, this week, we had a delegation from Keidanren, which is a, one of the most prestigious Japanese business federations in here. The vice chairman of Toyota, uh, uh, Hayao Kawasan, is the uh, vice chair of Toyota, who also runs this uh, federation. So it's a big deal. They were here because Japan is the largest foreign direct investor in Nebraska, so we've got strong relationships and we want to don't want to see that trade relationship disrupted and we don't want to see the NAFTA trade relationship disrupted either. That's been a very successful uh, relationship, not only for Nebraska, but for Canada, Mexico, and the United States. So certainly opportunities to really make all these trade agreements better, just we also want to remember we don't want to disrupt these very important relationships too. Talk to us about this concept of the digital prairie. Tech firms Silicon Valley, in. absolutely. Yeah, right, come in here. Absolutely, so one of the things that we do is we've got the Rake School, which is, Jeff Rakes was a former Microsoft executive to really help train our young people. And we have seen a lot of companies, Facebook for example, just mentioned their, or just announced they're tripling their investment in Nebraska. That'll take it up to about a billion dollars for their data center. In fact, we've really got an expertise around data centers with other companies like Yahoo and Travelers and Fidelity all having their data centers here in Nebraska. Uh, we've got inexpensive public power. We were able to promise, for example, Facebook 100% renewable energy. So for their data center, which is increasingly becoming important for our corporate partners here in the state. So we really have a great community to help grow those tech jobs. Uh, I want to ask you about guns because you sure. just came from the NRA convention yes. in Texas and Warren Buffett was actually asked about guns uh, earlier today and it was really interesting just going by the applause lines in the crowd. It was really divided. Mm -hmm. And I want to know what you think can be done on this issue to bring people together and make some progress on it. Well, I think that the key thing we want to look at right now is school safety. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things I've done is organized uh, a group of educators, a group of mental health care professionals, and a group of law enforcement to start talking about different ideas that we could do to help improve school safety, and then bring them together with what are some of the ideas that we can do. You know, one of the things I've thrown out there, for example, is allow off-duty police officers to be able to carry guns onto a school campus or something like that, but that's just an idea. What we really want to do is see how can we get to folks ahead of time and that's where, again, I think the mental health care aspect is so important. Uh, actually, Nebraska won an award from Mental Health America this past year for the work we're doing around our system of care to improve our mental health care services for children, trying to really organize all the resources in the community to get to them sooner, to make sure they don't get pulled out of school, pulled away from their families, not disrupt that child's life. And so I think that's really what we have to look at is how do we address the underlying causes for why these things are happening and look at it from that education side, mental health care side, law enforcement side. And regulatory side, there's a lot. It's a bigger conversation yeah. and obviously we could talk about it for quite some a time. Long time. But anyway, we appreciate you coming by. Governor Pete Ricketts of Nebraska, thanks very much. Great, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. So the team's all back together here, joining Andy Surer and myself. We've got Miles Edlin and Julia LaRoche, who've been super busy all and day. I feel like I'm returning home after a yeah. long journey <laughs> out to the out. wilderness. It feels like yes. way more than a day that we last saw you. Yes. But uh, what, Julia, let's start with you. Your big takeaway from today. This was my first Berkshire Hathaway meeting, so I was so excited to be here. And I spoke to Buffett in that scrum earlier in the morning. I asked him, what are you going to buy or what has to happen for you to buy the next company? He said, I'm waiting for the phone call. And I also spent the day talking to executives from various Berkshire Hathaway portfolio companies. And I asked them, what's the benefit of being a Berkshire backed company? And they said, you know, it's the hands off management style. That was something I heard constantly, but they also felt that they had the full support of Buffett for the long term. And Buffett also said during our uh, time in the scrum that that's what the, the culture, that hands off style, that is the moat at Berkshire Hathaway. So that's my big takeaway. Waiting for the call. That came up a lot during the meeting as well. Like we're, we're you know, yes. know we're the, when the phone rings and who's calling and where people are calling from. Miles, what about you? Well, I think if you look at kind of the fundamental way that Warren Buffett likes to talk about investing in the U.S. economy is he says the S&P 500 is essentially most of the economy and you get all the benefits of that. And today he used Apple as an example of a company right now that best, I think, exemplifies where we're at in the U.S. economy. Ultimately, yes, they sell iPhones, but it's an asset like business. This is a theme that I think dominated the second half of the meeting. The U.S. economy, Buffett said himself, is kind of asset light. And if you look at you know, the way that companies make money, Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, the 
companies that are defining our modern moment are not companies that are like what we see behind us here. It's not BNSF, it's not really Duracell, it's not really Coca-Cola, and I think that direction, that shift, and I, that, that's kind of a big theme for him, for Charlie, and I think something everyone who was here today and heard them uh, talk should think about. You know, the future of the economy, I think, looks a lot different uh, than the past did, and I think that, that Apple, to Buffett, is a, is a perfect example of that. All right, Andy, you're up. So I actually had a good takeaway, I thought, from Glenn Close, of all people. Of all and people, award-winning actress. Yeah, and, and I thought it was really interesting. You know, she's come here a number of years, and we asked her, you know, why do you come? And she had a really great answer, which is, it's always the same, and it's always different. And I think that is so true. And it's the continuity of the wisdom that is the sameness. And then, frankly, it's the news and investing decisions mm -hmm. and the new investments that's different. And so. Between those two things, you get a really pretty exciting package. And you know, for instance, what was new this year, a bunch of things, but what resonated with me was the discussions about China and trade. And you know, that's obviously very top of mind. And the interest uh, amongst Chinese investors about Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway, and Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett in China continues to rise. And they address that, and I just think that you know, it's, it's really interesting and really topical, and you, you can't predict what it's going to be year to year. What's it going to be in 2019? We don't know. Uh, this goes a little bit to what you and Miles were talking about, but I just think it's, it's fun, and I love it when he's talking about the companies that we talk about all the time. Uh, he talked about Amazon. He said, you know, I have watched Amazon from the beginning, and I, I missed it, but I, I wouldn't bet on a miracle. I never would have. Uh, talking about uh, Google just a little bit ago, saying I looked at Google, and then I thought, how did Google get there so fast? Is somebody going to get ahead of them that quickly? And I think that really also is Todd and Ted's influence, and to see that playing out, and that really goes to the Apple news that really started this meeting, them upping that investment, and the trends there, uh, I, I don't think are stopping. You know, it's so interesting, there's so much to talk about, and you know, people may not realize this, but the conversation continues, because yeah. there are all manner of gatherings and parties that go on after the meeting, at hotels all around the city, and even beyond that, and all these, this community of Berkshire Hathaway investors will be talking the whole year. And you know, Charlie said that during the meeting. He said that I think when there's a new management team, when the current management teams have long moved on, he thinks there'll still be a Berkshire Hathaway meeting because we can talk about how people connect digitally, you follow someone on Twitter, you can Slack them, but really there is nothing like talking to someone in person. And this is such a great event for doing that. And yeah, we live in New York, but it just doesn't feel like people get together as much as you would like. You come here, everyone's nice, everyone talks, and you make a lot of new relationships. It was yeah. Julia's I first think, time, thumbs I up. Think, for, thumbs up for a first time, but also just that reconnecting. I connected with people that I hadn't spoken to since college who were here, who saw me, and they said, oh, you're here at Berkshire, me too, and, and via social media, whether it was Facebook messaging or Instagram messaging, and then also meeting new people, and then seeing people you see in New York as well. So this was a great event to reconnect. Well, the conversation could go on for a long time, but we <laughs> are going to have to wrap this up. Um, it's just been a great full day of coverage here from Omaha at the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. Thanks to everyone around the world who uh, watched this, and we hope you really enjoyed it. And thanks to all the people who pitched in doing a tremendous amount of work today on the team. Yeah, a lot of people here on the ground in Omaha, people in New York. Uh, thank you all so much. You have been watching Yahoo Finance's live stream of the Berkshire Hathaway 2018 annual meeting live from Omaha, Nebraska. We'll see you later. Sorry. <laughs>